Section One of Italian Hours by Henry James. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Venice. It is a great pleasure to write the word, but I'm not sure it is not a certain impudence in pretending to add anything to it. Venice has been painted and described many thousands of times, and of all the cities in the world it is the easiest to visit without going there. Open the first book, and you will find a rhapsody about it. Step into the first picture dealers, and you will find three or four high-coloured views of it. There is notoriously nothing more to be said on the subject. Everyone has been there, and everyone has brought back a collection of photographs. There is as little mystery about the Grand Canal as about our local thoroughfare, and the name of St. Mark is as familiar as the postman's ring. It is not forbidden, however, to speak of familiar things, and I hold that for the true Venice lover, Venice is always in order. There is nothing new to be said about her, certainly, but the old is better than any novelty. It will be a sad day indeed when there should be something new to say. I write these lines with the full consciousness of having no information whatever to offer. I do not pretend to enlighten the reader. I pretend only to give a fillip to his memory. And I hold any writer sufficiently justified who is himself in love with his theme. 1. Mr. Ruskin has given it up. That is very true, but only after extracting half a lifetime of pleasure and an immeasurable quantity of fame from it. We all may do the same after it has served our turn, which it probably will not cease to do for many a year to come. Meantime, it is Mr. Ruskin who, beyond anyone, helps us to enjoy it. He has indeed lately produced several aids to depression in the shape of certain little humorous, ill humorous pamphlets, the series of St. Mark's Rest, which embody his latest reflections on the subject of our city and describe the latest atrocities perpetrated there. These latter are numerous and deeply to be deplored, but to admit that they have spoiled Venice would be to admit that Venice may be spoiled, and a mission pregnant, as it seems to us, with disloyalty. Fortunately, one reacts against the Ruskinian contagion, and one hour of the lagoon is worth a hundred pages of demoralised prose. This queer late-coming prose of Mr. Ruskin including the revised and condensed issue of the Stones of Venice, only one little volume of which has been published, or perhaps ever will be, is all to be read, though much of it appears addressed to children of a tender age. It is pitched in the nursery key, and might be supposed to emanate from an angry governess. It is, however, all suggestive, and much of it is delightfully just. There is an inconceivable want of form in it. That the author has spent his life in laying down the principles of form and scolding people for departing from them. But it throbs and flashes with the love of his subject, a love disconcerted and abjured, but which has still much of the force of inspiration. Among the many strange things that have befallen Venice, she has had the good fortune to become the object of passion to a man of splendid genius who has made her his own, and in doing so has made her the world's. There is no better reading at Venice, therefore, as I say, than Ruskin, for every true Venice lover can separate the wheat from the chaff. The narrow theological spirit, the moralism a tout propos, the queer provincialities and pruderies, a mere wild weeds in a mountain of flowers. One may doubtless be very happy in Venice without reading at all, without criticising or 
analysing or thinking a strenuous thought. It is a city in which I suspect there is very little strenuous thinking. And yet it is a city in which there must be almost as much happiness as misery. The misery of Venice stands there for all the world to see. It is part of the spectacle. A thoroughgoing devotee of local colour might consistently say it is part of the pleasure. The Venetian people have little to call their own, little more than the bare privilege of living their lives in the most beautiful of towns. Their habitations are decayed, their taxes heavy, their pockets light, their opportunities few. One receives an impression, however, that life presents itself to them with attractions not accounted for in this meagre train of advantages, and that they are on better terms with it than many people who have made a better bargain. They lie in the sunshine, they dabble in the sea, they wear bright rags, they fall into attitudes and harmonies, they assist at an eternal conversazione. It is not easy to say that one would have them other than they are, and it certainly would make an immense difference, should they be better fed. The number of persons in Venice who evidently never have enough to eat is painfully large, but it will be more painful if we did not equally perceive that the rich Venetian temperament may bloom upon a dog's allowance. Nature has been kind to it and sunshine and leisure and conversation and beautiful views form the greater part of its sustenance. It takes a great deal to make a successful American, but to make a happy Venetian takes only a handful of quick sensibility. The Italian people have at once the good and the evil fortune to be conscious of few wants, so that if the civilization of a society is measured by the number of its needs, as seems to be the common opinion today, it is to be feared that the children of the lagoon would make but a poor figure in a set of comparative tables. Not their misery, doubtless, but the way they allude their misery is what pleases the sentimental tourist, who is gratified by the sight of a beautiful race that lives by the aid of its imagination. The way to enjoy Venice is to follow the example of these people and make the most of simple pleasures. Almost all the pleasures of the place are simple. This may be maintained even under the imputation of ingenious paradox. There is no simpler pleasure than looking at a fine Titian, unless it be looking at a fine Tintoret or strolling into St. Mark's. Abominable the way one falls into the habit, and resting one's light worried eyes upon the windowless gloom, or then floating in a gondola, or then hanging over a balcony, or then taking one's coffee at Florian's. It is of such superficial pastimes that a Venetian day is composed, and the pleasure of the matter is in the emotions to which they minister. These are fortunately of the finest. Otherwise, Venice would be insufferably dull. Reading Ruskin is good. Reading the old records is perhaps better. But the best thing of all is simply staying on. The only way to care for Venice as she deserves it is to give her a chance to touch you often, to linger and remain and return. 2. The danger is that you will not linger enough, a danger of which the author of these lines had known something. It is possible to dislike Venice and to entertain the sentiment in a responsible and intelligent manner. There are travellers who think the place odious, and those who are not of this opinion often find themselves wishing that the others were only more numerous. The sentimental tourist's sole quarrel with his Venice is that he has too many competitors there. He likes to be alone, to be original, to have to himself at least the air of making discoveries. The Venice of today is a vast museum with a little wicket that admits you is perpetually turning and creaking, 
and you march through the institution with a herd of fellow-gazers. There is nothing left to discover or describe, and originality of attitude is completely impossible. This is often very annoying. You can only turn your back on your impertinent playfellow and curse his want of delicacy. But this is not the fault of Venice. It is the fault of the rest of the world. The fault of Venice is that, though she is easy to admire, she is not so easy to live with, as you count living in other places. After you have stayed a week and the bloom of novelty has rubbed off, you wonder if you can accommodate yourself to the peculiar conditions. Your old habits become impracticable, and you find yourself obliged to form new ones of an undesirable and unprofitable character. You are tired of your gondola, or you think you are, and you have seen all the principal pictures and heard the names of the palaces announced a dozen times by your gondolier, who brings them out almost as impressively as if he were an English butler bawling titles into a drawing-room. You have walked several hundred times round the piazza and bought several bushels of photographs. You have visited the antiquity mongers whose horrible signboards dishonour some of the grandest vistas in the Grand Canal. You have tried the opera and found it very bad. You have bathed at the Lido and found the water flat. You have begun to have a shipboard feeling, to regard the piazza as an enormous saloon, and the Riva degli Schiavoni as a promenade deck. You are obstructed and encaged. Your desire for space is unsatisfied. You miss your usual exercise. You try to take a walk and you fail. And meantime, as I say, you have come to regard your gondola as a sort of magnified baby's cradle. You have no desire to be rocked to sleep, though you are sufficiently kept awake by the irritation produced as you gaze across the shallow lagoon by the attitude of the perpetual gondolier with his turned-out toes, his protruded chin, his absurdly unscientific stroke. The canals have a horrible smell, and the everlasting piazza, where you have looked repeatedly at every article in every shop window and found them all rubbish, where the young Venetians who sell bead bracelets and panoramas are perpetually thrusting their wares at you, where the same tightly buttoned officers are forever sucking the same black weeds at the same empty tables in front of the same cafes. The piazza, as I say, has resolved itself into a magnificent treadmill. This is the state of mind of those shallow inquirers who find Venice all very well for a week. And if in such a state of mind you take your departure, you act with fatal rashness. The loss is your own, moreover, it is not, with all deference to your personal attractions, that of your companions who remain behind. For though there are some disagreeable things in Venice, there is nothing so disagreeable as the visitors. The conditions are peculiar, but your intolerance of them evaporates before it has had time to become a prejudice. When you have called for the bill to go, pay it and remain, and you will find on the morrow that you are deeply attached to Venice. It is by living there from day to day that you feel the fullness of her charm, that you invite her exquisite influence to sink into your spirit. The creature varies like a nervous woman whom you know only when you know all the aspects of her beauty. She has high spirits or low, she is pale or red, grey or pink, cold or warm, fresh or wan, according to the weather or the hour. She is always interesting, and almost always sad. But she has a thousand occasional graces, and is always liable to happy accidents. You become extraordinarily fond of these things. You count upon them. They make part of your life. Tenderly fond you become. There is something indefinable in those depths of personal acquaintance that gradually establish themselves. 
the place seems to personify itself to become human and sentient and conscious of your affection you desire to embrace it to caress it to possess it and finally a soft sense of possession grows up and your visit becomes a perpetual love affair it is very true that if you go as the author of these lines on a certain occasion went about the middle of march a certain amount of disappointment is possible he had paid no visit for several years and in the interval the beautiful and helpless city had suffered an increase of injury the barbarians are in full possession and you tremble for what they may do you are reminded from the moment of your arrival that venice scarcely exists any more as a city at all that she exists only as a battered peep-show and bazaar there was a horde of savage germans encamped in the piazza and they filled the ducal palace and the academy with their uproar the english and americans came a little later they came in good time with a great many french who were discreet enough to make very long repasts at the cafe quadri during which they were out of the way the months of april and may of the year eighteen eighty one were not as a general thing a favourable season for visiting the ducal palace and the academy the valet de place had marked them for his own and held triumphant possession of them he celebrates his triumphs in a terrible brassy voice which resounds all over the place and has whatever language he be speaking the accent of some other idiom during all the spring months in venice these gentry abound in the great resorts and they lead the helpless captives through churches and galleries and dense irresponsible groups they infest the piazza they pursue you along the river they hang about the bridges and the doors of the cafes in saying just now that i was disappointed at first i had chiefly in mind the impression that assails me today in the whole precinct of st mark's the condition of this ancient sanctuary is surely a great scandal the peddlers and commissioners ply their trade often a very unclean one at the very door of the temple they follow you across the threshold into the sacred dusk and pull your sleeve and hiss into your ear scuffling each other for customers there is a great deal of dishonour about st mark's altogether and if venice as i say has become a great bazaar this exquisite edifice is now the biggest booth three it is treated as a booth in all ways and if it had not somehow a great spirit of solemnity within it the traveller would soon have little warrant for regarding it as a religious affair the restoration of the outer walls which has lately been so much attacked and defended is certainly a great shock of the necessity of the work only an expert is i suppose in a position to judge but there is no doubt that if a necessity it be it is one that is deeply to be regretted to no more distressing necessity have people of taste lately had to resign themselves wherever the hand of the restorer has been laid all semblance of beauty has vanished which is a sad fact considering the external loveliness of st mark's has been for ages less impressive only than that of its still comparatively uninjured interior i know not what is the measure of necessity in such a case and it appears indeed to be a very delicate question Today, at any rate that admirable harmony of faded mosaic and marble which to the eye of the traveller are emerging from the narrow streets that lead to the piazza fill all the further end of it with a sort of dazzling silver presence Today, this lovely vision is in a way to be completely reformed and indeed well nigh abolished the old softness and mellowness of colour the work of the quiet centuries and of the breath of the salt sea is giving way to large crude patches of new material which have the effect of a monstrous malady rather than that of a restoration to health they look like blotches of red and white paint 
and dishonourable smears of chalk on the cheeks of a noble matron. The face towards the piazzetta is an especial and newest-looking thing conceivable, as new as a new pair of boots, or as the morning's paper. We do not profess, however, to undertake a scientific quarrel with these changes. We admit that our complaint is a purely sentimental one. The march of industry in United Italy must doubtless be looked at as a whole, and one must endeavour to believe that it is through innumerable lapses of taste that this deeply interesting country is groping her way to her place among the nations. For the present, it is not to be denied, certain odd phases of the process are more visible than the result, to arrive at which it seems necessary that, as she was of old, a passionate votary of the beautiful, she should today burn everything that she has adored. It is doubtless too soon to judge her, and there are moments when one is willing to forgive her even the restoration of St. Mark's. Inside as well, there has been a considerable attempt to make the place more tidy, but the general effect as yet has not seriously suffered. What I chiefly remember is the straightening out of that dark and rugged old pavement, those deep undulations of primitive mosaic in which the fond spectator was thought to perceive an intended resemblance to the waves of the ocean. Whether intended or not, the analogy was an image the more in a treasure house of images. But from a considerable portion of the church it has now disappeared. Throughout the greater part, indeed, the pavement remains as recent generations have known it, dark, rich, cracked, uneven, spotted with porphyry and time-blackened malachite, polished by the knees of innumerable worshippers. But in other large stretches, the idea imitated by the restorers is that of the ocean in a dead calm, and the model they have taken the floor of a London clubhouse or of a New York hotel. I think no Venetian and scarcely any Italian cares much for such differences, and when a year ago people in England were writing to the Times about the whole business and holding meetings to protest against it, the dear children of the lagoon so far as they heard or heeded the rumour, thought them partly busybodies and partly asses. Busybodies they doubtless were, but they took a good deal of disinterested trouble. It never occurs to the Venetian mind of today that such trouble may be worth taking. The Venetian mind vainly endeavours to conceive a state of existence in which personal questions are so insipid the people have to look for grievances in the wrongs of brick and marble. I must not, however, speak of St. Mark's as if I had the pretension of giving a description of it, or as if the reader desired one. The reader has been too well served already. It is surely the best described building in the world. Open the stones of Venice, open Teofil Gautier's Italia, and you will see... These writers take it very seriously, and it is only because there is another way of taking it that I venture to speak of it, the way that offers itself after you've been in Venice a couple of months, and the light is hot in the great square, and you pass in under the pictured porticos with a feeling of habit and friendliness, and a desire for something cool and dark. There are moments, after all, when the church is comparatively quiet and empty, and when you may sit there with an easy consciousness of its beauty, from the moment, of course, that you go into any Italian church for any purpose but to say your prayers or look at the ladies, you rank yourself among the trooping barbarians I just spoke of. You treat the place as an orifice in the peep show. Still, it is almost a spiritual function, or at the worst an amorous one, to feed one's eyes on the molten colour that drops from the hollow vaults and thickens the air with its richness. It is also quiet and sad and faded, and yet also brilliant and living. 
the strange figures in the mosaic pictures bending with the curve of niche and vault stare down through the glowing dimness the burnished gold that stands behind them catches the light on its little uneven cubes st mark's owes nothing of its character to the beauty of proportional perspective there is nothing grandly balanced or far-arching there are no long lines nor triumphs of the perpendicular the church arches indeed but arches like a dusky cavern beauty of surface of tone of detail of things near enough to touch and kneel upon and lean against it is from this the effect proceeds in this sort of beauty the place is incredibly rich and you may go there every day and find afresh some lurking pictorial nook it is a treasury of bits as the painters say and there are usually three or four of the fraternity with their easels set up in uncertain equilibrium on the undulating floor it is not easy to catch the real complexion of st mark's and these laudable attempts at portraiture are apt to look either lurid or livid but if you cannot paint the old loose-looking marble slabs the great panels of basalt and jasper the crucifixes of which the lonely anguish looks deeper in the vertical light the tabernacles whose open doors disclose a dark byzantine image spotted with dull crooked gems if you cannot paint these things you can at least grow fond of them you grow fond even of the old benches of red marble partly worn away by the breaches of many generations and attached to the base of those wide pilasters of which the precious plating delightful in its faded brownness with a faint grey bloom on it bulges and yawns a little with honourable age end of section one section two of italian hours by henry james this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain venice four even at first when the vexatious sense of the city of the doges reduced to earning its living as a curiosity shop was in its keenness there was a great deal of entertainment to be got from lodging on riva schiavoni and looking out at the far shimmering lagoon there was entertainment indeed in simply getting into the place and observing the queer incidents of a venetian installation a great many persons contribute indirectly to this undertaking and it is surprising how they spring out at you during your novitiate to remind you that they are bound up in some mysterious manner with the constitution of your little establishment it was an interesting problem for instance to trace the subtle connection existing between the niece of the landlady and the occupancy of the fourth floor superficially it was none too visible as the young lady in question was a dancer at the fenice theatre or when that was closed at the rossini and might have been supposed absorbed by her professional duties it proved necessary however that she should hover about the premises in a velvet jacket and a pair of black kid gloves with one little white button as also that she should apply a thick coating of powder to her face which had a charming oval and a sweet weak expression like that of most of the venetian maidens who was a general thing it was not a peculiarity of the landlady's niece how fond of besmearing themselves with flour you soon recognise that it is not only the many twinkling lagoon you behold from a habitation on the river you see a little of everything venetian straight across before my windows rose the great pink mass of san giorgio maggiore which has for an ugly palladian church a success beyond all reason it is a success of position of colour of the immense detached campanile tipped with a tall gold angel i know not whether it is because san giorgio is so grandly conspicuous with a great deal of worn 
faded-looking brickwork, but for many persons the whole place has a kind of suffusion of rosiness. Asked what may be the leading colour in the Venetian concert, we should inveterately say pink. And yet without remembering, after all, that this elegant hue occurs very often. It is a faint, shimmering, airy, watery pink. The bright sea light seems to flush with it, and the pale whitish green of lagoon and canal to drink it in. There is indeed a great deal of very evident brickwork, which is never fresh or loud in colour, but always burnt out, as it were, always exquisitely mild. Certain little mental pictures rise before the collector of memories of the simple mention, written or spoken, of the places he has loved. When I hear, when I see, the magical name I have written above these pages, it is not to the great square that I think with its strange basilica and its high arcades, nor of the wide mouth of the Grand Canal with the stately steps and the well-poised dome of the Salute. It is not of the low lagoon, nor the sweet piazzetta, nor of the dark chambers of St. Mark's. I simply see a narrow canal in the heart of the city, a patch of green water and a surface of pink wool. The gondola moves slowly. It gives a great smooth swerve, passes under a bridge, and the gondolier's cry carried over the quiet water makes a kind of splash in the stillness. A girl crosses the little bridge, which has an arch like a camel's back, with an old shawl on her head which makes her characteristic and charming. You see her against the sky as you float beneath. The pink of the old wall seems to fill the whole place. It sinks even into the opaque water. Behind the wall is a garden, out of which the long arm of a white June rose, the roses of Venice are splendid, has flung itself by way of spontaneous ornament. On the other side of this small waterway is a great shabby façade of Gothic windows and balconies, balconies on which dirty clothes are hung, and under which a cavernous-looking doorway opens from a low flight of slimy water steps. It is very hot and still, the canal has a queer smell, and the whole place is enchanting. It is poor work, however, talking about the colour of things in Venice. The fond spectator is perpetually looking at it from his window, when he's not floating about with that delightful sense of being for the moment a part of it, which any gentleman in a gondola is free to entertain. Venetian windows and balconies are a dreadful lure, and while you rest your elbows on these cushioned ledges, the precious hours fly away. But in truth, Venice isn't in fair weather, a place for concentration of mind. The effort required for sitting down to a writing table is heroic, and the brightest page of manuscript looks dull beside the brilliancy of your milieu. All nature beckons you forth and murmurs to you sophistically, that such hours should be devoted to collecting impressions. Afterwards, in ugly places, at unprivileged times, you can convert your impressions into prose. Fortunately for the present proser, the weather wasn't always fine. The first month was wet and windy, and it was better to judge of the matter from an open casement than to respond to the advances of persuasive gondoliers. Even then, however, there was a constant entertainment in the view. It was all cold colour, and the steel grey floor of the lagoon was stroked the wrong way by the wind. Then there were charming cool intervals, when the churches, the houses, the anchored fishing boats, the whole gently curving line of the river, seemed to be washed with a pearly white. Later it all turned warm warm to the eye as well as to the other senses. After the middle of May, the whole place was in a glow. The sea took on a thousand shades, but there were only infinite variations of blue, and those rosy walls I just spoke of began to flush in the thick sunshine. Every patch of colour, 
every yard of weather-stained stucco, every glimpse of nestling garden or daub of sky above a calais, began to shine and sparkle, began, as the painters say, to compose. The lagoon was streaked with odd currents, which played across it like huge smooth finger marks. The gondolas multiplied and spotted it all over. Every gondola and gondolier looking at a distance, precisely like every other. There is something strange and fascinating in this mysterious impersonality of the gondola. It has an identity when you are in it, but thanks to their all being of the same size, shape and colour, and the same deportment and gait, it has none, or as little as possible, as you see it pass before you. From my windows on the river there was always the same silhouette, the long, black, slender skiff, lifting its head and throwing it back a little, moving yet seeming not to move, with the grotesquely graceful figure on the poop. This figure inclines as may be more to the graceful or to the grotesque, standing in the second position of the dancing master, but indulging from the waist upward in a freedom of movement which that functionary would deprecate. One may say, as a general thing, that there is something rather awkward in the movement of even the most graceful gondolier, and something graceful in the movement of the most awkward. In the graceful men, of course, the grace predominates, and nothing can be finer than the large, firm way in which, from their point of vantage, they throw themselves over their tremendous oar. It has the boldness of a plunging bird and the regularity of a pendulum. Sometimes, as you see this movement in profile, in a gondola that passes you, see as you recline on your own low cushions the arching body of the gondolier lifted up against the sky, it has a kind of nobleness which suggests an image on a Greek frieze. The gondolier at Venice is your very good friend, if you choose him happily, and on the quality of the personage depends a good deal that of your impressions. He is a part of your daily life, your double, your shadow, your complement. Most people, I think, either like their gondolier or hate him. And if they like him, like him very much. In this case, they take an interest in him after his departure. Wish him to be sure of employment. Speak of him as the gem of gondoliers, and tell their friends to be certain to secure him. There is usually no difficulty in securing him. There is nothing elusive or reluctant about a gondolier. Nothing would induce me not to believe them for the most part excellent fellows, and the sentimental tourist must always have a kindness for them. More than the rest of the population, of course, they are the children of Venice. They are associated with its idiosyncrasy, with its essence, with its silence, with its melancholy. When I say they are associated with its silence, I should immediately add that they are associated also with its sound. Among themselves, they are an extraordinarily talkative company. They chatter at the traghetti, where they always have some sharp point under discussion. They bawl across the canals. They bespeak your commands as you approach. They defy each other from afar. If you happen to have a traghetto under your window, you are well aware that they are a vocal race. I should go even further than I went just now, and to say that the voice of the gondolier is in fact, for audibility, the dominant, or rather the only, note of Venice. There is scarcely another heard sound, and that, indeed, is part of the interest of the place. There is no noise there save distinctly human noise. No rumbling, no vague uproar, nor rattle of wheels and hoofs. It is all articulate and vocal and personal. One may say indeed that Venice is emphatically the city of conversation. People talk all over the place because there is nothing to interfere with its being caught by the ear. Among the populace it is a general family party. The still water carries the voice, 
and good Venetians exchange confidences at a distance of half a mile. It saves a world of trouble, and they don't like trouble. Their delightful, garrulous language helps them to make Venetian life a long conversazione. This language, with its soft allusions, its odd transpositions, its kindly contempt for consonants and other disagreeables, has in it something peculiarly human and accommodating. If your gondolier had no other merit, he would have the merit that he speaks Venetian. This may rank as a merit even, some people perhaps would say especially, when you don't understand what he says, but he adds to it other graces which make him an agreeable feature in your life. The price he sets on his services is touchingly small, and he has a happy art of being obsequious without being, or at least without seeming, abject. For occasional liberalities he evinces an almost lyrical gratitude. In short, he has delightfully good manners, a merit which he shares for the most part with the Venetians at large. One grows very fond of these people, and the reason of one's fondness is the frankness and sweetness of their address. That of the Italian family at large has much to recommend it, but in the Venetian manner there is something peculiarly ingratiating. One feels that the race is old, that it has a long and rich civilization in its blood, that if it hasn't been blessed by fortune, it has at least been polished by time. It hasn't a genius for stiff morality, and indeed makes few pretensions in that direction. It scruples but scantly to represent the false as the true, and has been accused of cultivating the occasion to grasp and to overreach, and of steering a crooked course, not to your and my advantage, amid the sanctities of property. It has been accused further of loving, if not too well, at least too often, of being, in fine, as little austere as possible. I am not sure it is very brave, nor struck with its being very industrious, but it has an unfailing sense of the amenities of life. The poorest Venetian is a natural man of the world. He is better company than persons of his class are apt to be among the nations of industry and virtue, where people are also sometimes perceived to lie and steal and otherwise misconduct themselves. He has a great desire to please and be pleased. 5. In that matter, at least, the cold-blooded stranger begins at last to imitate him, begins to lead a life that shall be before all things easy, unless, indeed, he allow himself, like Mr. Ruskin, to be put out of humour by Titian and Tiepolo. The hours he spends among the pictures are his best hours in Venice, and I am ashamed to have written so much of common things when I might have been making festoons of the names of the masters. Only when we have covered our pages with such festoons, what more is left to say? When one has said Carpaccio and Bellini, the Tintoret and the Veronese, one has struck a note that must be left to resound at will. Everything has been said about the mighty painters, and it is of little importance that a pilgrim the more has found them to his taste. Quote, Went this morning to the academy, was very much pleased with Titian's assumption. Unquote. That honest phrase has doubtless been written in many a traveller's diary, and was not indiscreet on the part of its author, but it appeals little to the general reader, and we must, moreover, notoriously not expose our deepest feelings. Since I have mentioned Titian's assumption, I must say that there are some people who have been less pleased with it than the observer we have just imagined. It is one of the possible disappointments of Venice, and you may, if you like, take advantage of your privilege of not caring for it. It imparts a look of great richness to the side of the beautiful room of the academy on which it hangs. But the same room, 
contains two or three works less known to fame which are equally capable of inspiring a passion Quote, the enunciation struck me as coarse and superficial Unquote. that note was once made in a simple-minded tourist's book at Venice, strange to say, Titian is altogether a disappointment. The city of his adoption is far from containing the best of him. Madrid, Paris, London, Florence, Dresden, Munich. These are the homes of his greatness. There are other painters who have but a single home, and the greatest of these is Tintoret. Close beside him sit Carpaccio and Benini who make with him the dazzling Venetian trio. The Veronese may be seen and measured in other places. He is most splendid in Venice, but he shines in Paris and in Dresden. You may walk out of the noonday dusk of Trafalgar Square in November and in one of the chambers of the National Gallery see the family of Darius rustling and pleading and weeping at the feet of Alexander. Alexander is a beautiful young Venetian, in crimson pantaloons and the picture sends a glow into the cold london twilight you may sit before it for an hour and dream you are floating to the water gate of the ducal palace where a certain old beggar who has one of the handsomest heads in the world he has sat to a hundred painters for doges and for personages more sacred has a prescriptive right to pretend to pull your gondola to the steps and hold out a greasy immemorial cap. But you must go to Venice in very fact to see the other masters who form part of your life while you are there, who illuminate your view of the universe. It is difficult to express one's relation to them. The whole Venetian art world is so near, so familiar, so much an extension and adjunct of the spreading actual that it seems almost invidious to say one owes more to one of them than to the other. Nowhere, not even in Holland, where the correspondence between the real aspects and the little polished canvases is so constant and so exquisite, do art and life seem so interfused and, as it were, so consanguineous. All the splendour of light and colour, all the Venetian air and the Venetian history, are on the walls and ceilings of the palaces and all the genius of the masters all the images and visions they have left upon canvas seem to tremble in the sunbeams and dance upon the waves that is the perpetual interest of the place that you live in a certain sort of knowledge as in a rosy cloud you don't go into the churches and galleries by way of a change from the streets you go into them because they offer you an exquisite reproduction of the things that surround you. All Venice was both model and painter, and life was so pictorial that art couldn't help becoming so. With all diminutions, life is pictorial still, and this fact gives an extraordinary freshness to one's perception of the great Venetian works. You judge of them not as a connoisseur, but as a man of the world, and you enjoy them because they are so social and so true. Perhaps of all works of art that are equally great, they demand least reflection on the part of the spectator. They make least of a mystery of being enjoyed. Reflection only confirms your admiration. It is almost a shame to show its head. These things speak so frankly and benignantly to the sense that even when they arrive at the highest style, as in the Tintoret's presentation of the little virgin at the temple, they are still more familiar. But it is hard, as I say, to express all this, and it is painful as well to attempt it. Painful because in the memory of vanished hours so filled with beauty, the consciousness of present loss oppresses. Exquisite hours enveloped in light and silence, to have known them once is to have always a terrible standard of enjoyment. 
certain lovely mornings of may and june come back with an ineffaceable fairness venice isn't smothered in flowers at this season in the manner of florence and rome but the sea and sky themselves seem to blossom and rustle the gondola waits at the wave-washed steps and if you are wise you will take your place behind a discriminating companion such a companion in venice should of course be of the sex that discriminates most finely an intelligent woman who knows her venice seems doubly intelligent and it makes no woman's perceptions less keen to be aware that she can't help looking graceful as she is borne over the waves the handsome pasquale with uplifted oar awaits your command knowing in a general way from observation of your habits that your intention is to go and see a picture or two it perhaps doesn't immensely matter what picture you choose the whole affair is so charming it is charming to wander through the light and shade of intricate canals with perpetual architecture above you and perpetual fluidity beneath it is charming to disembark at the polished steps of a little empty campo a sunny shabby square with an old well in the middle an old church on one side and tall venetian windows looking down sometimes the windows are tenantless sometimes a lady in a faded dressing gown leans vaguely on the sill there is always an old man holding out his hat for coppers there are always three or four small boys dodging possible umbrella pokes while they precede you in the manner of custodians to the door of the church end of section two Section three of Italian Hours by Henry James. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Six. The churches of Venice are rich in pictures, and many a masterpiece lurks in the unaccommodating gloom of side chapels and sacristies. Many a noble work is perched behind the dusty candles and muslin roses of a scantily visited altar some of them indeed hidden behind the altar suffer in a darkness that can never be explored the facilities offered you for approaching the picture in such cases are a mockery of your irritated wish you stand at tiptoe on a three-legged stool you climb a rickety ladder you almost mount upon the shoulders of the custode you do everything but see the picture you see just enough to be sure it's beautiful you catch a glimpse of a divine head of a fig tree against a mellow sky but the rest is impenetrable mystery you renounce all hope for instance of approaching the magnificent cima da conneliano in san giovanni in bragora and be thinking yourself of the immaculate purity that shines in the spirit of this master you renounce it with chagrin and pain. Behind the high altar in that church hangs the baptism of Christ by Chima, which I believe has been more or less repainted. You can make the thing out in spots. You see it has a fullness of perfection, but you turn away from it with a stiff neck and promise yourself consolation in the academy and at the Madonna dell'Orto, where two noble works by the same hand, pictures as clear as a summer twilight, present themselves in better circumstances. It may be said as a general thing that you never see the Tintoret. You admire him, you adore him, you think him the greatest of painters. But in the great majority of cases, your eyes fail to deal with him. This is partly his own fault. So many of his works have turned to blackness, and are positively rotting in their frames. At the Scuola di San Rocco, where there are acres of him, there is scarcely anything at all adequately visible, save the immense crucifixion in the upper story. It is true that in looking at this huge composition, you look at many pictures. It has not only a multitude of figures, but a wealth of episodes. 
and you pass from one of these to the other as if you were doing a gallery. Surely no single picture in the world contains more of human life. There is everything in it, including the most exquisite beauty. It is one of the greatest things of art. It is always interesting. There are works of the artist which contain touches more exquisite, revelations of beauty more radiant, but there is no other vision of so intense a reality, an execution so splendid. The interest, the impressiveness of that whole corner of Venice, however melancholy the effect of its gorgeous and ill-lighted chambers, gives a strange importance to a visit to the Scuola. Nothing that all travellers go to see seems to suffer less from the occasions of travellers. It is one of the loneliest booths of the bazaar, and the author of these lines has always had the good fortune, which he wishes to every other traveller, of having it to himself. I think most visitors find the place rather alarming and wicked-looking. They walk about a while among the fitful figures that gleam here and there out of the great tapestry, as it were, with which the painter has hung on the walls, and then, depressed and bewildered by the portentous solemnity of these objects, by strange glimpses of unnatural scenes, by the echo of their lonely footsteps on the vast stone floors, they take a hasty departure, finding themselves again with a sense of release from danger, a sense that the genius Loza was a sort of mad whitewasher who worked with a bad mixture in the bright light of the campo among the beggars, the orange vendors, and the passing gondolas. Solemn indeed is the place, solemn and strangely suggestive, for the simple reason that we shall scarcely find four walls elsewhere that enclose within a like area an equal quantity of genius. The air is thick with it, and dense and difficult to breathe, for it was genius that was not happy, inasmuch as it lacked the art to fix itself forever. It is not immortality that we breathe at the Scuola di San Rocco, but a conscious, reluctant mortality. Fortunately, however, we can turn to the Ducal Palace, where everything is so brilliant and splendid that the poor dusky Tintoret is lifted in spite of himself into the concert. This deeply original building is, of course, the loveliest thing in Venice, and a morning stroll there is a wonderful illumination. Cunningly select your hour. Half the enjoyment of Venice is a question of dodging, and enter at about one o'clock when the tourists have flocked off to lunch, and the echoes of the charming chambers have gone to sleep among the sunbeams. There is no brighter place in Venice by which I mean that on the whole there is none half so bright. The reflected sunshine plays up through the great windows from the glittering lagoon and shimmers and twinkles over gilded walls and ceilings. All the history of Venice, all its splendid stately past, glows around you in the strong sea light. Everyone here is magnificent, but the great Veronese is the most magnificent of all. He swims before you in a silver cloud. He thrones in an eternal morning. The deep blue sky burns behind him, streaked across with milky bars. The white colonnades sustain the richest canopies, under which the first gentlemen and ladies in the world both render homage and receive it. Their glorious garments rustle in the air of the sea, and their sunlighted faces are the very complexion of Venice. The mixture of pride and piety, of politics and religion, of art and patriotism, gives a splendid dignity to every scene. Never was a painter more nobly joyous. Never did an artist take a greater delight in life, seeing it all as a kind of breezy festival and feeling it through the medium of perpetual success. He revels in the gold-framed ovals of the ceilings, 
multiplies himself there with the fluttering movement of an embroidered banner that tosses itself into the blue. He was the happiest of painters and produced the happiest picture in the world. The Rape of Europa surely deserves this title. It is impossible to look at it without aching with envy. Nowhere else in art is such a temperament revealed. Never did inclination and opportunity combine to express such enjoyment. The mixture of flowers and gems and brocade, of blooming flesh and shining sea and waving groves, of youth, health, movement, desire, all this is the brightest vision that ever descended upon the soul of a painter. Happy the artist who could entertain such a vision, happy the artist who could paint it, as the masterpiece I here recall is painted. The Tintoret's visions were not so bright as that, but he had several that were radiant enough. In the room that contains the work just cited are several smaller canvases by the greatly more complex genius of the Scuola di San Rocco, which are almost simple in their loveliness, almost happy in their simplicity. They have kept their brightness through the centuries, and they shine with their neighbours in these golden rooms. There is a piece of painting in one of them which is one of the sweetest things in Venice, and which reminds one afresh of those wild flowers of execution that bloom so profusely and so unheeded in the dark corners of all of the Tintoret's work. Pallas Chasing Away Mars is, I believe, the name that is given to the picture, and it represents, in fact, a young woman of noble appearance administering a gentle push to a fine young man in armour, as if to tell him to keep his distance. It is of the gentleness of this push that I speak, the charming way in which she puts out her arm with a single bracelet on it and rests her young hand, its rosy fingers parted, on his dark breastplate. She bends her enchanting head with the effort, a head which has all the strange fairness that the Tintoret always sees in women, and the soft, living, flesh-like glow of all these members, over which the brush has scarcely paused in its course, is as pretty an example of genius as all Venice can show. But why speak of the Tintoret, when I can say nothing of the great paradise which unfolds its somewhat smoky splendour and the wonder of its multitudinous circles in one of the other chambers. If it were not one of the first pictures in the world, it would be about the biggest, and we must confess that the spectator gets from it at first chiefly an impression of quantity. Then he sees that this quantity is really wealth, that the dim confusion of faces is a magnificent composition and that some of the details of this composition are extremely beautiful. It is impossible, however, in a retrospect of Venice to specify one's happiest hours, though as one looks backward, certain ineffaceable moments start here and there into vividness. How is it possible to forget one's visits to the sacristy of the Frari, however frequent they may have been, and the great work of John Bellini, which forms the treasure of that apartment. 7. Nothing in Venice is more perfect than this, and we know of no work of art more complete. The picture is in three compartments. The Virgin sits in the central division with her child. Two venerable saints, standing close together, occupy each of the others. It is impossible to imagine anything more finished or more ripe. It is one of those things that sum up the genius of a painter, the experience of a life, the teaching of a school. It seems painted with molten gems which have only been clarified by time, and is as solemn as it is gorgeous, and as simple as it is deep. Giovanni Benini is more or less everywhere in Venice, and wherever he is, almost certain to be the first. First, I mean, in his own line, paints little else than the Madonna and the Saints, he has not Carpaccio's care for human life at large, nor the Tintoret's, nor that of the Veronese. Some of his greater pictures, however, where several figures are clustered together, 
have a richness of sanctity that is almost profane. There is one of them on the dark side of the room at the academy that contains Titian's assumption, which if we could only see it, its position is an inconceivable scandal, would evidently be one of the mightiest of so-called sacred pictures. So too is the Madonna of San Zaccaria, hung in a cold, dim, dreary place, ever so much too high, but so mild and serene and so grandly disposed and accompanied that the proper attitude for even the most critical amateur as he looks at it strikes one as the bended knee. There is another noble Giombonini, one of the very few in which there is no virgin, at San Giovanni Crisostomo, a Saint Jerome, in a red dress sitting aloft upon the rocks and with a landscape of extraordinary purity behind him. The absence of the peculiarly erect Madonna makes it an interesting surprise among the works of the painter and gives it a somewhat less strenuous air. But it has brilliant beauty, and the Saint Jerome is a delightful old personage. The same church contains another great picture for which the haunter of these places must find a shrine apart in his memory. One of the most interesting things he will have seen, if not the most brilliant, nothing appeals more to him than the three figures of Venetian ladies which occupy the foreground of a smallish canvas of Sebastian del Piombo, placed above the high altar of San Giovanni Crisostomo. Sebastian was a Venetian by birth, but few of his productions are to be seen in his native place. Few indeed are to be seen anywhere. The picture represents the patron saint of the church, accompanied by other saints and by the worldly votaries I have mentioned. These ladies stand together on the left, holding in their hands little white caskets. Two of them are in profile, but the foremost turns her face to the spectator. This face and figure are almost unique among the beautiful things of Venice, and they leave the susceptible observer with the impression of having made, or rather having missed, a strange, a dangerous, but a most valuable acquaintance. The lady, who is superbly handsome, is the typical Venetian of the 16th century, and she remains for the mind the perfect flower of that society. Never was there a greater air of breeding, a deeper expression of tranquil superiority. She walks a goddess, as if she trod without the sinking the waves of the Adriatic. It is impossible to conceive a more perfect expression of the aristocratic spirit, either in its pride or in its benignity. The magnificent creature is so strong and secure that she is gentle and so quiet that, in comparison, all minor assumptions of calmness suggest only a vulgar alarm. But for all this, there are depths of possible disorder in her light-coloured eye. I had meant, however, to say nothing about her, for it is not right to speak of Sebastian, when one hasn't found room for Carpaccio. These visions come to one, and one can neither hold them nor brush them aside. Memories of Carpaccio the Magnificent, the Delightful, it's not for want of such visitations, but only for want of space, that I haven't said of him what I would. There is little enough need of it for Carpaccio's sake, his fame being brighter today, thanks to the generous lamp Mr. Ruskin has held up to it, than it has ever been. Yet there is something ridiculous in talking of Venice, without making him almost the refrain. He and the Tintoret are the two great realists, and it is hard to say which is the more human, the more various. The Tintoret had the mightier temperament, but Carpaccio, who had the advantage of more newness and more responsibility, sailed nearer to perfection. Here and there he quite touches it, as in the enchanting picture at the Academy of St. Ursula asleep in her little white bed in her high, clean room, where the angel visits her at dawn, or in the noble St. Jerome in his study at St. Giorgio Schiavone, 
this latter work is a pearl of sentiment and i may add without being fantastic a ruby of colour it unites the most masterly finish with a kind of universal largeness of feeling and he who has it well in his memory will never hear the name of carpaccio without a throb of almost personal affection such indeed is the feeling that descends upon you in that wonderful little chapel of st george of the slaves where this most personal and sociable of artists has expressed all the sweetness of his imagination the place is small and incommodious the pictures are out of sight and ill-lighted the custodian is rapacious the visitors are mutually intolerable but the shabby little chapel is a palace of art mr ruskin has written a pamphlet about it which is a real aid to enjoyment though i can't but think that the generous artist with his keen senses and his just feeling would have suffered to hear his eulogist declare that one of his other productions in the museo civico of palazzo correa a delightful portrait of two venetian ladies with pet animals is the quote, finest picture in the world end quote. It has no need of that to be thought admirable. And what more can a painter desire? 8. May in Venice is better than April, but June is best of all. Then the days are hot, but not too hot, and the nights are more beautiful than the days. Then Venice is rosier than ever in the morning and more golden than ever as the day descends. She seems to expand and evaporate, to multiply all her reflections and iridescences. Then the life of her people and the strangeness of her constitution become a perpetual comedy, or at least a perpetual drama. Then the gondola is your sole habitation and you spend days between sea and sky. You go to the Lido, though the Lido has been spoiled. When I first saw it in 1869, it was a very natural place, and there was but a rough lane across the little island from the landing place to the beach. There was a bathing place in those days, and a restaurant, which was very bad, but where, in the warm evenings, your dinner didn't much matter as you sat, letting it cool, on the wooden terrace that stretched out into the sea. Today, the Lido is part of a united Italy and has been made the victim of villainous improvements. A little cockney village has sprung up on its rural bosom, and a third-rate boulevard leads from Santa Elisabetta to the Adriatic. There are bitumen walks and gas lamps, lodging houses, shops, and a teatro di urno. The bathing establishment is bigger than before, and the restaurant as well, but it is a compensation, perhaps, that the cuisine is no better such as it is however you won't scorn occasionally to partake of it on the breezy platform under which the bathers dart and splash and which looks out to where the fishing boats with sails of orange and crimson wander along the darkening horizon the beach at the lido is still lonely and beautiful and you can easily walk away from the cockney village the return to Venice in the sunset is classical and indispensable. And those who at that glowing hour have floated towards the towers that rise out of the lagoon will not easily part with the impression. But you indulge in larger excursions. You go to Burano and Torcello, to Malamocco and Chioggia. Torcello, like the Lido, has been improved. The deeply interesting little cathedral of the 8th century, which stood there on the edge of the sea, as touching in its ruin with its grassy threshold and its primitive mosaics as the bleached bones of a human skeleton washed ashore by the tide, has now been restored and made cheerful. And the charm of the place, its strange and suggestive desolation, has well nigh departed. It will still serve you as a pretext, however, for a day on the lagoon, especially as you will disembark at Burano and admire the wonderful fisher folk 
whose good looks and bad manners, I'm sorry to say, can scarcely be exaggerated. Burano is celebrated by the beauty of its women and the rapacity of its children, and it is a fact that though some of the ladies are rather bold about it, every one of them shows you a handsome face. The children are sailing for coppers, and in their desire to be satisfied, pursue your gondola into the sea. Chioggia is a larger Burano, and you carry away from either place a half sad, half cynical, but altogether pictorial impression, the impression of bright-coloured hovels, of bathing in stagnant canals, of young girls with faces of a delicate shape and a susceptible expression, with splendid heads of hair and complexions smeared with powder, faded yellow shawls that hang like old Greek draperies, and little wooden shoes that click as they go up and down the steps of the convex bridges of brown cheeked matrons with lustrous tresses and high tempers massive throats encased with gold beads and eyes that meet your own with a certain traditional defiance the men throughout the islands of venice are almost as handsome as the women i have never seen so many good-looking rascals at burano and chioggia they sit mending their nets or lounge at the street corners the conversation is always high-pitched, or clamour to you to take a boat. And everywhere they decorate the scene with their splendid colour, cheeks and throats as richly brown as the sails of their fishing smacks, their sea-faded tatters, which are always a, quote, costume, their soft Venetian jargon, and the gallantry with which they wear their hats, an article that nowhere sits so well as on a mass of dense Venetian curls. If you are happy, you will find yourself after a June day in Venice, about ten o'clock, on a balcony that overhangs the Grand Canal, with your elbows on the broad ledge, a cigarette in your teeth, and a little good company beside you. The gondolas pass beneath, the watery surface gleams here and there from their lamps, some of which are coloured lanterns that move mysteriously in the darkness. There are some evenings in June when there are too many gondolas, too many lanterns, too many serenades in front of the hotels. The serenading in particular is overdone, but on such a balcony as I speak of you needn't suffer from it, for in the apartment behind you, an accessible refuge, there is more good company, there are more cigarettes. If you are wise, you will step back there presently. 1882 End of section 3section 4 of Italian Hours by Henry James. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. The Grand Canal, Part One. The honour of representing the plan and the place at their best might perhaps appear in the city of St. Mark, properly to belong to the splendid square which bears the patron's name, and which is the centre of Venetian life. So far this is pretty well all the way indeed, as Venetian life is a matter of strolling and chaffering, of gossiping and gaping, of circulating without a purpose and of staring, too often with a foolish one, through the shop windows of dealers whose hospitality makes their doorsteps dramatic, at the very vulgarest rubbish in all the modern market. If the Grand Canal, however, is not quite technically a street, the perverted piazza is perhaps even less normal. And I hasten to add that I am glad not to find myself studying my subject under the international arcades, or yet I'll go the length of saying in the solemn presence of the church. For indeed in that case I foresee I should become still more confoundingly conscious of the stumbling block that inevitably, even with his first few words, crops up in the path of the lover of Venice who rashly addresses himself to expression. Venetian life 
is a mere literary convention, though it be an indispensable figure. The words have played an effective part in the literature of sensibility. They constituted thirty years ago the title of Mr. Howell's delightful volume of impressions. But in using them today, one owes some frank amends to one's own lucidity. Let me carefully premise, therefore, that so often as they shall again drop from my pen, so often shall I beg to be regarded as systematically superficial. Venetian life in the large old sense has long since come to an end, and the essential present character of the most melancholy of cities resides simply in its being the most beautiful of tombs. Nowhere else has the past been laid to rest with such tenderness, such a sadness of resignation and remembrance. Nowhere else is the present so alien, so discontinuous, so like a crowd in a cemetery without garlands for the graves. It has no flowers in its hands, but as a compensation perhaps, and the thing is doubtless more to the point, it has money and little red books. The everlasting shuffle of these irresponsible visitors in the piazza is contemporary Venetian life. Everything else is only a reverberation of that. The vast mausoleum has a turnstile at the door, and a functionary in a shabby uniform lets you in as per tariff to see how dead it is. From this constatation, this cold curiosity, proceed all the industry, the prosperity, the vitality of the place. The shopkeepers and gondoliers, the beggars and the models, depend upon it for a living. They are the custodians and the ushers of the great museum. They are even themselves, to a certain extent, the objects of exhibition. It is in the wide vestibule of the square that the polyglot pilgrims gather most densely. Piazza San Marco is the lobby of the opera in the intervals of the performance. The present fortune of Venice, the lamentable difference, is most easily measured there, and that is why in the effort to resist our pessimism we must turn away both from the purchasers and from the vendors of Ricordi. The Ricordi that we prefer are gathered best where the gondola glides. Best of all, on the noble waterway that begins in its glory at the Salute, and ends in its abasement at the railway station. It is, however, the cognified piazzetta, who give me shade of St. Theodore, has not a brand new cafe begun to glare there electrically this very year, that introduces us most directly to the great picture by which the Grand Canal works its first spell, and to which a thousand artists, not always with a town unto peace, have paid their tribute. We pass into the piazzetta to look down the great throat, as it were, of Venice, and the vision must console us for turning our back on St. Mark's. We have been treated to it again and again, of course, even if we have never stirred from home. But that is only a reason the more for catching at any freshness that may be left in the world of photography. It is in Venice, above all, that we hear the small buzz of this vulgarising voice of the familiar. Yet perhaps it is in Venice, too, that the picturesque fact has best mastered the pious secret of how to wait for us. Even the classic Salute waits like some great lady on the threshold of her saloon. She is more ample and serene, more seated at her door, than all the copyists have told us, with her domes and scrolls, her scalloped buttresses and statues forming a pompous crown, and her wide steps disposed on the ground like the train of a rope. This fine air of the woman of the world is carried out by the well-bred assurance with which she looks in the direction of her old-fashioned Byzantine neighbour, 
and the juxtaposition of the two churches, so distinguished and so different, each splendid in its sort, is a sufficient mark of the scale and range of Venice. However, we ourselves are looking away from St. Mark's. We must blind our eyes to that dazzle. Without it, indeed, there are brightnesses and fascinations enough. We see them in abundance even while we look away from the shady steps of the Salute. These steps are cool in the morning, yet I don't know that I can justify my excessive fondness for them any better than I explain a hundred of the other vague infatuations with which Venice sophisticates the spirit. Under such an influence, fortunately, one needn't explain. It keeps account of nothing but perceptions and affections. It is from the Salute steps, perhaps of a summer morning, that this view of the open mouth of the city is most brilliantly amusing. The whole thing composes as if composition were the chief end of human institutions. The charming architectural promontory of the Logana stretches out the most graceful of arms, balancing in its hand the gilded globe on which revolves the delightful satirical figure of the little weather clock of a woman. This fortune, this navigation, or whatever she is called, she surely needs no name, catches the wind in the bit of drapery of which she has divested her rotary bronze loveliness. On the other side of the canal twinkles and glitters the long row of the happy palaces, which are mainly expensive hotels. There is a little of everything everywhere in the bright Venetian air, but to these houses belongs especially the appearance of sitting across the water at the receipt of custom of watching in their hypocritical loveliness for the stranger and the victim. I call them happy because even their sordid uses and their vulgar signs melt somehow with their vague sea-stained pinks and drabs into that strange gaiety of light and colour which is made up of the reflection of superannuated things. The atmosphere plays over them like a laugh, they are of the essence of the sad old joke. They are almost as charming from other places as they are from their own balconies, and share fully in that universal privilege of Venetian objects, which consists of being both the picture and the point of view. This double character, which is particularly strong in the Grand Canal, adds a difficulty to any control of one's notes. The Grand Canal may be practically, as in impression, the cushioned balcony of a high and well-loved palace, the memory of irresistible evenings, of the sociable elbow, of the endless lingering and looking, or it may evoke the restlessness of a fresh curiosity, of methodical inquiry in a gondola piled with references. There are no references I ought to mention in the present remarks which sacrifice to accident, not to completeness. A rhapsody of Venice is always in order, but I think the catalogues are finished. I should not attempt to write here the names of all the palaces, even if the number of those I find myself able to remember in the immense array were less insignificant. There are many I delight in that I don't know, or at least don't keep apart. Then there are the bad reasons for preference that are better than the good, and all the sweet bribery of association and recollection. These things, as one stands on the salute steps, have so many delicate fingers to pick straight out of the row, a dear little featureless house, which with its pale green shutters looks straight across at the great door and through the very keyhole, as it were, of the church, and which I needn't call by a name, a pleasant American name, that everyone in Venice these many years has had on grateful lips. It is the very friendliest house in all the wide world, and it has, as it deserves to have, the most beautiful position. It is a real Porto di Mare, as the gondoliers say, a port within a port. 
It sees everything that comes and goes, and takes it all in with practised eyes. Not a tint or a hint of the immense iridescence is lost upon it, and there are days of exquisite colour on which it may fancy itself the heart of the wonderful prism. We wave to it from the salute steps, which we must decidedly leave, if we wish to get on, a grateful hand across the water, and turn into the big white church of Longana, an empty shaft, beneath a perfunctory dome, where an American family and a German party huddled in a corner upon a pair of benches, are gazing with a conscientiousness worthy of a better cause, at nothing in particular. For there is nothing particular in this cold and conventional temple to gaze at, save the great Tintoretto of the sacristy, to which we quickly pay our respects, and which we are glad to have for ten minutes to ourselves. The picture, though full of beauty, is not the finest of the masters, but it serves again as well as another to transport. There is no other word those of his lovers for whom in faraway days when Venice was an early rapture, this strange and mystifying painter was almost the supreme revelation. The plastic arts may have less to say to us than in the hungry years of youth, and the celebrated picture in general to be more of a blank. But more than the others, any fine tintoret still carries us back calling up not only the rich particular vision, but the freshness of the old wonder. Many things come and go, but this great artist remains for us in Venice a part of the company of the mind. The others are there in their obvious glory, but he is the only one for whom the imagination, in our expressive modern phrase, sits up. The marriage in Cana at the Salute has all his characteristic and fascinating unexpectedness the sacrifice of the figure of our lord who is reduced to the mere final point of a clever perspective and the free joyous presentation of all the other elements of the feast why in spite of this queer one-sidedness does the picture give us no impression of a lack of what the critics call reverence for of no other reason that i can think of than because it happens to be the work of its author, in whose very mistakes there is a singular wisdom. Mr. Ruskin has spoken with sufficient eloquence of the serious loveliness of the row of heads of the women on the right, who talk to each other as they sit at the foreshortened banquet. There could be no better example of the roving independence of the painter's vision, a real spirit of adventure for which his subject was always a cluster of accidents, not an obvious order, but a sort of peopled and agitated chapter of life, in which the figures are submissive pictorial notes. These notes are all there in their beauty and heterogeneity, and if the abundance is of a kind to make the principle of selection seem in comparison timid, yet the sense of composition in the spectator, if it happened to exist, reaches out to the painter in peculiar sympathy. Dull must be the spirit of the worker tormented in any field of art with that particular question who is not moved to recognise in the eternal problem the high fellowship of Tintoretto. If the long reach from this point to the deplorable iron bridge which discharges the pedestrian at the academy, or more comprehensively, to the painted and gilded Gothic of the noble Palazzo Foscari is too much of a curve to be seen at any one point as a whole. It represents the better the arched neck, as it were, of the undulating serpent, of which the Canalazzo has the likeness. We pass a dozen historic houses. We note in our passage a hundred component bits with the baffled sketches sense and with what would doubtless be, save for our intensely Venetian fatalism, the baffled sketcher's temper. It is the early palaces, of course, and also, to be fair, some of the late, if we could take them one by one, that give the canal the best of its grand air. 
the fairest are often cheek by jowl with the foulest, and there are few, alas, so fair as to have been completely protected by their beauty. The ages and the generations have worked their will on them, and the wind and the weather have had much to say. But disfigured and dishonoured as they are, with the bruises of their marbles and the patience of their ruin, there is nothing like them in the world. And the long succession of their faded, conscious faces makes of the quiet waterway they overhang a promenade historique, of which the lesson, however often we read it, gives in the depth of its interest an incomparable dignity to Venice. We read it in the Romanesque arches, crooked today in their very curves of the early Middle Age, in the exquisite individual Gothic of the splendid time, and in the cornices and columns of a decadence almost as proud. These things at present are almost equally touching in their good faith. They have each, in their degree, so effectually parted with their pride. They have lived on as they could, and lasted as they might. And we hold them to no account of their infirmities, for even those of them whose blank eyes today meet criticism with most submission are far less vulgar than the uses we have managed to put them to. We have botched them and patched them and covered them with sordid signs. We have restored and improved them with a merciless taste. And the best of them we have made over to the peddlers. Some of the most striking objects in the finest vistas at present are the huge advertisements of the curiosity shops. The antiquity mongers in Venice have all the courage of their opinion, and it is easy to see how well they know they can confound you with an unanswerable question. What is the whole place but a curiosity shop? And what are you here for yourself but to pick up odds and ends? We pick them up for you say these honest Jews whose prices are marked in dollars, and who shall blame us if the flowers being pretty well plucked, we add an artificial rose or two to the composition of the bouquet. They take care, in a word, that there be plenty of relics, and their establishments are huge and active. They administer the antidote to pedantry, and you can complain of them only if you never cross their thresholds. If you take this step, you are lost, for you have parted with the correctness of your attitude. Venice becomes, frankly, from such a moment, the big, depressing, dazzling joke, in which, after all, our sense of her contradiction sinks to rest. The grimace of an overstrained philosophy. It is rather a comfort, for the curiosity shops are amusing. You've had bad moments, indeed, as you stand in their halls of humbug and, in the intervals of haggling, hear through the high windows the soft splash of the sea on the old water steps. For you think with anger of the noble homes that are laid waste in such scenes, of the delicate lives that must have been, that might still be, led there. You reconstruct the admirable house according to your own needs. Leaning on a back balcony, you drop your eyes into one of the little green gardens with which, for the most part, such establishments are exasperatingly blessed, and end by feeling it a shame that you yourself are not in possession. I take it for granted, of course, that as you go and come, you are in imagination perpetually lodging yourself and setting up your gods, for if this innocent pastime, this borrowing of the mind, be not your favourite sport, there is a flaw in the appeal that Venice makes to you. There may be happy cases in which your envy is tempered, or perhaps I should rather say intensified, by real participation. If you have had the good fortune to enjoy the hospitality of an old Venetian home, and to lead your life a little in the painted chambers that still echo with one of the historic names, you have entered by the shortest step into the inner spirit of the place. If it didn't savour of treachery to private kindness, 
I should like to speak frankly of one of these delightful, even though alienated, structures. To refer to it as a splendid example of the old palatial type. But I can only do so in passing with a hundred precautions, and lifting the curtain at the edge, drop a commemorative word on the success with which in this particularly happy instance the cosmopolite habit, the modern sympathy, the intelligent, flexible attitude, the latest fruit of time, adjust themselves to the great gilded, relinquished shell and try to fill it out. A Venetian palace that has not too grossly suffered and that is not overwhelming by its mass makes almost any life graceful that may be led in it. With cultivated and generous contemporary ways, it reveals a pre-established harmony. As you live in it day after day, its beauty and its interest sink more deeply into your spirit. It has its moods and its hours and its mystic voices and its shifting expressions. If in the absence of its masters you have happened to have it to yourself for twenty-four hours, you will never forget the charm of its haunted stillness. Late on the summer afternoon, for instance, when the call of playing children comes in behind from the campo, nor in the way the old ghosts seem to pass on tiptoe on the marble floors. It gives you practically the essence of the matter that we are considering. For beneath the high balconies, Venice comes and goes, and the particular stretch you command contains all the characteristics. Everything has its turn, from the heavy barges of merchandise pushed by long poles and the patient shoulder, to the floating pavilions of the great serenades. And you may study at your leisure the admirable Venetian arts of managing a boat and organising a spectacle, of the beautiful free stroke with which the gondola, especially when there are two oars, is impelled. You never in the Venetian scene grow weary. It is always in the picture, and the large profiled action that lets the standing rowers throw themselves forward to a constant recovery has the double value of being at the fag end of greatness, the only energetic note. The people from the hotels are always afloat, and at the hotel pace, the solitary gondolier, like the solitary horseman of the old-fashioned novel, is, I confess, a somewhat melancholy figure. Perched on his poop without a mate, he reenacts perpetually in high relief with his toes turned out the comedy of his odd and charming movement. He always has a little the look of an absent-minded nursery maid, pushing her small charges in a perambulator. But why should I risk too free a comparison with this picturesque and amiable class are concerned. I delight in their sunburnt complexions and their childish dialect. I know them only by their merits, and I am grossly prejudiced in their favour. They are interesting and touching, and alike in their virtues and their defects, human nature is simplified as with a big effect of brush. Affecting above all is their dependence on the stranger, the whimsical stranger who swims out of their ken, yet whom providence sometimes restores. The best of them, at any rate, are, in their line, great artists. On the swarming feast days, on the strange feast night of the Redentore, their steering is a miracle of ease. The master hands, the celebrities and winners of prizes, you may see them on the private gondolas in spotless white with brilliant sashes and ribbons, and often with very handsome persons, take the right-of-way with pardonable insolence. They penetrate the crush of boats with an authority of their own. The crush of boats, the universal sociable bumping and squeezing is great, when on the summer nights the ladies shriek with alarm, the city pays the fiddlers, and the illuminated barges scattering music and song lead a long train down the canal. The barges used to be rowed in rhythmic strokes, but now they are towed by a steamer. The coloured lamps, the vocalists before the hotels, 
are not to my sense the greatest seduction of venice but it would be an uncandid sketch of the canalazzo that shouldn't touch them with indulgence taking one nuisance with another they are probably the prettiest in the world and if they have in general more magic for the new arrival than for the old venice lover they in any case at their best keep up the immemorial tradition the venetians have had from the beginning of time the pride of their processions and spectacles and it is a wonder how with empty pockets they still make a clever show the carnival is dead but these are the scraps of its inheritance Vauxhall on the water is of course more Vauxhall than ever with the good fortune of homemade music and of a mirror that reduplicates and multiplies the feast of the redeemer the great popular feast of the year is a wonderful venetian Vauxhall. all venice on this occasion takes to the boats for the night and loads them with lamps and provisions wedged together in a mass it sups and sings Every boat is a floating arbour, a private café concert. Of all Christian commemorations, it is the most ingenuously and harmlessly pagan. Toward morning, the passengers repair to the Lido, where as the sun rises, they plunge still sociably into the sea. The night of the Redentori has been described, but it will be interesting to have an account from the domestic point of view of its usual morrow. It is mainly an affair of the Judecca, however, which is bridged over from that Saturday to the great church. The pontoons are laid together during the day. It is all done with extraordinary celerity and art, and the bridge is prolonged across the Canalazzo to Santa Maria Zobenigo which is my only warrant for glancing at the occasion. We glance at it from our palace windows, lengthening our necks a little. As we look up toward the Salute, we see all Venice on the July afternoon, so serried as to move slowly, pour across the temporary footway. It is a flock of very good children, and the bridged canal is their toy. All Venice on such occasions is gentle and friendly. Not even all Venice pushes anyone into the water. End of section four. Section five of Italian Hours by Henry James. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. The Grand Canal, part two. But from the same high windows we catch, without any stretching of the neck, a still more indispensable note in the picture, a famous pretender eating the bread of bitterness. This repast is served in the open air on a neat little terrace by attendants in livery, and there is no indiscretion in our seeing that the pretender dines ever since the table d'hote in Candide. Venice has been the refuge of monarchs in want of thrones. She wouldn't know herself without her roi en exil. The exile is agreeable and soothing. The gondola lets them down gently. Its movement is an anodyne, its silence a filter. And little by little it rocks all ambitions to sleep. The proscript has plenty of leisure to write his proclamations and even his memoirs. And I believe he has organs in which they are published. But the only noise he makes in the world is the harmless splash of his oars. He comes and goes along the canalazzo, and he might be much worse employed. He is but one of the interesting objects it presents, however, and I am by no means sure that he is the most striking. He has a rival, if not in the iron bridge, which, alas, is within our range, at least to take an immediate example in the Montecuccoli Palace. Far descended and weary, but beautiful in its crooked old age, with its lovely proportions, its delicate round arches, its carvings and its discs of marble, is the haunted Montecuccoli. 
Those who have a kindness for Venetian gossip like to remember that it was once for a few months the property of Robert Browning, who, however, never lived in it, and who died in the splendid Rezzonico, the residence of his son, and a wonderful cosmopolite document, which, as it presents itself in an admirable position but a short way farther down the canal, we can almost see, in spite of the curve from the window at which we stand. This great 17th century pile, throwing itself upon the water with a peculiar florid assurance, a certain upward toss of its corners, which gives it an air of the rearing seahorse, decorates immensely, and within as well as without the whole wide angle that it commands. There is a more formal greatness in the high square Gothic Foscari just below it, one of the noblest creations of the 15th century, a masterpiece of symmetry and majesty. Dedicated today to official uses, it is the property of the state. It looks conscious of the consideration it enjoys, and is one of the few great houses within our range whose old age strikes us as robust and painless. It is visibly kept up. Perhaps it is kept up too much. Perhaps I am wrong in thinking so well of it. These doubts and fears course rapidly through my mind. I am easily their victim when it is a question of architecture, as they are apt to do today in Italy, almost anywhere in the presence of the beautiful, of the desecrated or the neglected. We feel at such moments as if the eye of Mr. Ruskin were upon us. We grow nervous and lose our confidence. This makes me, inevitably, in talking of Venice, seek a pusillanimous safety in the trivial and the obvious. I am on firm ground in rejoicing in the little garden directly opposite our windows. It is another proof that they really show us everything, and in feeling that the gardens of Venice would deserve a page to themselves. They are infinitely more numerous than the arriving stranger can suppose. They nestle with a charm all their own in the complications of most back views. Some of them are exquisite, many are large, and even the scrappiest have an artful understanding in the interests of colour with the waterways that edge their foundations. Of the small canals in the hunt for amusement, they are the prettiest surprises of all. The tangle of plants and flowers crowds over the battered walls. The greenness makes an arrangement with the rosy, sordid brick. Of all the reflected and liquefied things in Venice, and the number of these is countless, I think the lapping water loves them most. They are numerous on the Canalazzo, but wherever they occur they give a brush to the picture, and in particular, it is easy to guess, give a sweetness to the house. Then the elements are complete, the trio of air and water and of things that grow. Venice without them would be too much a matter of the tides and the stones. Even the little trellises of the traghetti count charmingly as reminders amid so much artifice of the woodland nature of man. The vine leaves, trained on horizontal poles, make a roof of chequered shade for the gondoliers and ferrymen who doze there, according to opportunity, or chatter or hail the approaching fair. There is no hum in Venice, so that their voices travel far. They enter your windows and mingle even with your dreams. I beg the reader to believe that if I had time to go into everything, I would go into the traghetti which have their manners and their morals, and which used to have their piety. This piety was always a madonina, the protectress of the passage, a quaint figure of the Virgin with the red spark of a lamp at her feet. The lamps appear for the most part to have gone out, and the images, doubtless, have been sold for bric-a-brac. The ferrymen, for aught I know, are converted to nihilism, a faith consistent, happily, with a good stroke of business. One of the figures has been left, however, the Madonetta, which gives its name to a traghetto near the Rialto. 
but this sweet survivor is a carven stone inserted ages ago in the corner of an old palace and doubtless difficult of removal pazienza the day will come when so marketable a relic will also be extracted from its socket and purchased by the devouring american i leave that expression on second thoughts standing but i repent of it when i remember that it is a devouring american a lady long resident in venice and whose kindnesses all venetians as well as her country people know who has rekindled some of the extinguished tapers setting up especially the big brave gothic shrine of painted and gilded wood which on the top of its stout palo sheds its influence on the place of passage opposite the salute if i may not go into those of the palaces this devious discourse has left behind much less may i enter the great galleries of the academy which wears its blank walls surmounted by the lion of st mark well within sight of the windows at which we are still lingering this wondrous temple of venetian art for all it promises little from without overhangs in a manner the grand canal but if we were so much as to cross its threshold we should soon wander beyond recall it contains in some of the most magnificent halls where the ceilings have all the glory with which the imagination of venice alone could overarch a room some of the noblest pictures in the world and whether or not we go back to them on any particular occasion for another look it is always a comfort to know that they are there as the sense of them on the spot is a part of the furniture of the mind the sense of them close at hand behind every wall and under every cover like the inevitable reverse of a medal of the side exposed to the air that reflects intensifies completes the scene in other words as it was the inevitable destiny of venice to be painted and painted with passion so the wide world of picture becomes as we live here and however much we go about our affairs the constant habitation of our thoughts the truth is we are in it so uninterruptedly at home and abroad that there is scarcely a pressure upon us to seek it in one place more than in another choose your standpoint at random and trust the picture to come to you this is manifestly why i have not i find myself conscious said more about the features of the canalazzo which occupied the reach between the salute and the position we have so obstinately taken up it is still there before us however and the delightful little palazzo dario intimately familiar to english and american travellers picks itself out in the foreshortened brightness the dario is covered with the loveliest little marble plates and sculptured circles it is made up of exquisite pieces as if there had been only enough to make it small so that it looks in its extreme antiquity a good deal like a house of cards that hold together by a tenure it would be fatal to touch an old venetian house dies hard indeed and i should add that this delicate thing with submission in every feature continues to resist the contact of generations of lodgers it is let out in floors it used to be let as a whole and in how many eager hands for it is a great requisition under how many fleeting dispensations have we not known and loved it people are always writing in advance to secure it as they are to secure the jenkins's gondolier and as the gondola passes we see strange faces at the window though it's ten to one we recognize them and the millionth artist coming forth with his traps at the water gate the poor little patient dario is one of the most flourishing booths at the fair the faces in the window look out at the great san sovino the splendid pile that is now occupied by the prefect i feel decidedly that i don't object as i ought to the palaces of the sixteenth and seventeenth centuries 
their pretensions impose upon me, and the imagination peoples them more freely than it can people the interiors of the prime. Was not, moreover, this masterpiece of Sansovino once occupied by the Venetian post office, and thereby intimately connected with an ineffaceable first impression of the author of these remarks? He had arrived wandering, palpitating, twenty-three years ago after nightfall, and the first thing on the morrow had repaired to the post office for his letters. They had been waiting a long time and were full of delayed interest, and he returned with them to the gondola and floated slowly down the canal. The mixture, the rapture, the wonderful temple of the post restant, the beautiful strangeness, all humanised by good news. The memory of this abides with him still, so that it always proceeds from the splendid waterfront I speak of, a certain secret appeal, something that seems to have been uttered first in the sonorous chambers of youth. Of course, this association falls to the ground, or rather splashes into the water if I am the victim of a confusion. Was the edifice in question twenty-three years ago the post office, which has occupied since for many a day very much humbler quarters? I am afraid to take the proper steps for finding out, lest I should learn that during these years I have misdirected my emotion. A better reason for the sentiment, at any rate, is that such a great house has surely in the high beauty of its tears a refinement of its own. They make one think of colosseums and aqueducts and bridges, and they constitute doubtless in Venice the most pardonable specimen of the imitative. I have even a timid kindness for the huge Pesaro far down the canal, his main reproach, more even than the coarseness of its forms, is its swaggering size, its want of consideration for the general picture, which the early examples so reverently respect. The Pesaro is as far out of the frame as a modern hotel, and the Coronaro close to it oversteps almost equally the modesty of art. One more thing they and their kindred do, I must add, for which, unfortunately, we can patronise them less, they make even the most elaborate material civilization of the present day seem woefully shrunken and bourgeois, for they simply, I allude to the biggest palaces, can't be lived in as they were intended to be. The modern tenant may take in all the magazines, but he bends not to the bow of Achilles, he occupies the place, but he doesn't fill it. And he has guests from the neighbouring inns with ulsters and bydeggers. We are far at the Pesaro, by the way, from our attaching window, and we take advantage of it to go in a rather melancholy mood to the end. The long straight vista from the Foscari to the Rialto, the great middle stretch of the canal, contains, as the phrase is, a hundred objects of interest, but it contains most the bright oddity of its general deluge air. In all these centuries, it has never got over its resemblance to a flooded city. For some reason or other, it is the only part of Venice in which the houses look as if the waters had overtaken them. Everywhere else, they reckon with them, have chosen them. Here alone, the lapping seaway seems to confess itself an accident. There are persons who hold this long, gay, shabby, spotty perspective, in which, with its immense field of confused reflection, the houses have infinite variety, the dullest expanse in Venice. It was not dull, we imagine, for Lord Byron, who lived in the midmost of the three Mocanigo palaces, where the writing table is still shown at which he gave the rein to his passions. For other observers, it is sufficiently enlivened by so delightful a creation as the Palazzo Loredan. Once a masterpiece, and at present, the Municipio, not to speak of a variety of other immemorial bits whose beauty still has a degree of freshness. Some of the most touching relics of early Venice, I hear, 
for it was here she precariously clustered, peeping out of a submersion more pitiless than the sea. As we approach the Rialto, indeed, the picture falls off, and a comparative commonness suffuses it. There is a wide paved walk on either side of the canal, on which the waterman, and who in Venice is not a waterman, is prone to seek repose. I speak of the summer days. It is the summer Venice that is the visible Venice. The big tarry barges are drawn up at the fondamenta, and the bare-legged boatmen, in faded blue cotton, lie asleep on the hot stones. If there were no colour anywhere else, there would be enough in their tanned personalities. Half the low doorways open into the warm interior of waterside drinking shops, and here and there on the quay, beneath the bush that overhangs the door, there are rickety tables and chairs. Where in Venice is there not the amusement of character and of detail? The tone in this part is very vivid, and it is largely that of the brown plebeian faces looking out of the patchy miscellaneous houses, the faces of fat undressed women and of other simple folk, who are not aware that they enjoy from balconies once, doubtless patrician, a view the knowing ones of the earth come thousands of miles to envy them. The effect is enhanced by the tattered clothes hung to dry in the windows, by the sun-faded rags that flutter from the polished balustrades. These are ivory smooth with time, and the whole scene profits by the general law that renders decadence and ruin in Venice more brilliant than any prosperity. Decay is in this extraordinary place golden in tint, and misery couleur de rose. The gondolas of the correct people are unmitigated sable, but the poor market boats from the islands are kaleidoscopic. The bridge of the Rialto is a name to conjure with, but honestly speaking, it is scarcely the gem of the composition. There are, of course, two ways of taking it, from the water or from the upper passage, where its small shops and booths abound in Venetian character. But it mainly counts as a feature of the canal when seen from the gondola, or even from the awful vaporetto. The great curve of its single arch is much to be commended, especially when, coming from the direction of the railway station, you see it frame, with its sharp compass line, the perfect picture, the reach of the canal on the other side. But the backs of the little shops make from the water a graceless collective hump, and the inside view is the diverting one. The big arch of the bridge, like the arches of all the bridges, is the waterman's friend in wet weather. The gondolas, when it rains, huddle beside the peopled barges, and the young ladies from the hotels, vaguely fidgeting, complain of the communication of insect life. Here, indeed, is a little of everything, and the jewellers of this celebrated precinct, they have their immemorial row, make almost as fine a show as the fruiterers. It is a universal market, and a fine place to study Venetian types. The produce of the islands is discharged there, and the fishmongers announce their presence. All one's senses, indeed, are vigorously attacked. The whole place is violently hot and bright, all odorous and noisy. The churning of the screw of the vaporetto mingles with the other sounds, not indeed that this offensive note is confined to one part of the canal, but just here. The little piers of the resented steamer are particularly near together, and it seems somehow to be always kicking up the water. As we go further down, we see it stopping exactly beneath the glorious windows of the Cardoro. It has chosen its position well, and who shall gainsay it for having put itself under the protection of the most romantic facade in Europe. The companionship of these objects is a symbol. It expresses supremely the present and the future of Venice. Perfect in its prime was the marble Cardoro 
with the noble recesses of its logier, but even then it probably never met a want like the successful Vaporetto. If, however, we are not to go into the Museo Civico, the old Museo Correa, which rears its staring renovated front far down on the left near the station, so also we must keep out of the great vexed question of steam on the Canalazzo. Just as a while since we prudently kept out of the Academia. These are expensive and complicated excursions. It is obvious that if the Vaporetti have contributed to the ruin of the gondoliers, already hard pressed by fate, and to that of the palaces, whose foundations their waves undermine, and that if they have robbed the Grand Canal of the supreme distinction of its tranquillity, so on the other hand they have placed rapid transit, in the New York phrase, in everybody's reach and enabled everybody, save indeed those who wouldn't for the world, to rush about Venice as furiously as people rush about New York. The suitability of this consummation needn't be pointed out. Even we ourselves, in the irresistible contagion, are going so fast now that we have only time to note in how clever and costly a fashion the Museo Civico, the old Fondaco dei Turchi, has been reconstructed and restored. It is a glare of white marble without, and a series of showy majestic halls within, where a thousand curious mementos and relics of old Venice are gathered and classified. Of its miscellaneous treasures, I fear, I may perhaps frivolously prefer the series of its remarkable living longies. An illustration of manners, more copious than the celebrated Carpaccio, the two ladies with their little animals and their long sticks. Wonderful indeed are the museums of Italy, where the renovations and the belle ordonnance speak of funds apparently unlimited, in spite of the fact that the numerous custodians frankly look starved. What is the pecuniary source of all this civic magnificence? It is shown in a hundred other ways. And how do the Italian cities manage to acquit themselves of expenses that will be formidable even to communities richer, and doubtless less aesthetic? Who pays the bills for the expressive statues alone? The general exuberance of sculpture, with which every piazzetta of almost every village is patriotically decorated. Let us not seek an answer to the puzzling question, but observe instead that we are passing the mouth of the populous Canareggio, next widest of the waterways, where the race of Shylock abides, and at the corner of which the big colourless church of San Jeremia stands gracefully enough on guard. The Canareggio, with its wide lateral footways and humped back bridges, makes on the Feast of St. John an admirable noisy tawdry theatre, for one of the prettiest and the most infantile of the Venetian processions. The rest of the course is a reduced magnificence in spite of interesting bits of the battered pomp of the Pesaro and of the Coronaro, of the recurrent memories of royalty and exile which cluster round the Palazzo in Ramin Carregi, once the residence of the Comte de Chambord, and still that of his half-brother, in spite, too, of the big Papadopoli gardens opposite the station, the largest private grounds in Venice, but of which Venice in general mainly gets the benefit in the usual form of irrepressible greenery climbing over the walls and nodding at the water. The Rococo Church of the Scudsi is here, all marble and malachite in a cold, hard glitter and a costly, curly ugliness. And here, too, opposite, on the top of its high steps, is San Simeone Profeta. I won't say immortalised, but unblushingly misrepresented by the perfidious Canaletto. I shall not stay to unravel the mystery of this prosaic painter's malpractices. He falsified without fancy. And as he apparently transposed at will the objects he reproduced, 
one is never sure of the particular view that may have constituted his subject. It would look exactly like such and such a place if almost everything were not different. San Simeone Profeto appears to hang there upon the wall, but it is on the wrong side of the canal, and the other elements quite fail to correspond. One's confusion is the greater because one doesn't know that everything may not really have changed, even beyond all probability, though it is only in America that churches cross the street or the river, and the mixture of the recognisable and the different makes the ambiguity maddening, all the more as the painter is almost as attaching as he is bad. Thanks, at any rate, to the white church, domed and porticoed on the top of its steps, the traveller emerging for the first time upon the terrace of the railway station seems to have a canaletto before him. He speedily discovers, indeed, even in the presence of this scene of the final accents of the canalazzo, there is a charm in the old pink warehouses on the hot fondamento, that he has something much better. He looks up and down at the gathered gondolas. He has his surprise after all, his little first Venetian thrill. And as the terrace of the station ushers in these things, we shall say no harm of it though it is not lovely, it is the beginning of his experience. But it is the end of the Grand Canal. 1892. End of section 5. Section 6 of Italian Hours by Henry James. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Venice an early impression. There will be much to say about that golden chain of historic cities which stretches from Milan to Venice, in which the very names Brescia, Verona, Mantua, Padua are an ornament to one's phrase. But I should have to draw upon recollections now three years old and to make my short story a long one. Of Verona and Venice only have I recent impressions, and even to these must I do hasty justice. I came into Venice, just as I had done before, toward the end of a summer's day, when the shadows begin to lengthen and the light to glow, and found that the attendant sensations bore repetition remarkably well. There was the same last intolerable delay at Mestre, just before your first glimpse of the lagoon confirms the already distinct sea smell, which has added speed to the precursive flight of your imagination. Then the liquid level, edged far off by its band of undiscriminated domes and spires, soon distinguished and proclaimed, however, as excited and contentious heads multiplied the windows of the train, then your long rumble on the immense white railway bridge, which in spite of the invidious contrast drawn, and very properly, by Mr. Ruskin between the old and the new approach, does truly in a manner shine across the green lap of the lagoon like a mighty causeway of marble. Then the plunge into the station, which would be exactly similar to every other plunge, save for one little fact, that the keynote of the great medley of voices borne back from the exit is not cab sir but barca signore i do not mean however to follow the traveller through every phase of his initiation at the risk of stamping poor venice beyond repair as the supreme bugbear of literature though for my own part i hold that to a fine healthy romantic appetite the subject can't be too diffusely treated. Meeting in the piazza on the evening of my arrival, a young American painter, who told me that he'd been spending the summer just where I found him, I could have assaulted him for very envy. He was painting, forsooth, the interior of St. Mark's. To be a young American painter, unperplexed by the mocking, elusive soul of things, 
and satisfied with their wholesome light-bathed surface and shape, keen of eye, fond of colour, of sea and sky and anything that may chance between them, of old lace and old brocade and old furniture, even when made to order, of time-mellowed harmonies on nameless canvases, and happy contours in cheap old engravings. To spend one's mornings in still, productive analysis of the clustered shadows of the basilica, one's afternoons anywhere in church or campo on canal or lagoon, and one's evenings in starlight gossip at Florian's, feeling the sea breeze throb languidly between the two great pillars of the piazzetta and over the low black domes of the church. This, I consider, is to be as happy as is consistent with the preservation of reason. The mere use of one's eyes in Venice is happiness enough, and generous observers find it hard to keep account of their profits in this line. Everything the attention touches holds it, keeps playing with it, thanks to some inscrutable flattery of the atmosphere. Your brown-skinned, white-shirted gondolier, twisting himself in the light, seems to you as you light contemplation beneath your awning, a perpetual symbol of Venetian effect. The light here is in fact a mighty magician, and with all respect to Titian, Veronese and Tintoret, the greatest artist of them all. You should see in places the material with which it deals, slimy brick, marble, battered and befouled, rags, dirt, decay. Sea and sky seem to meet halfway, to blend their tones into a soft iridescence, a lustrous compound of wave and cloud and a hundred nameless local reflections, and then to fling the clear tissue against every object of vision. You may see these elements at work everywhere, but to see them in their intensity, you should choose the finest day in the month and have yourself rowed far across the lagoon to Torcello. Without making this excursion, you can hardly pretend to know Venice or to sympathise with that longing for pure radiance which animated her great colourists. It is a perfect bath of light. And I couldn't get rid of a fancy that we were cleaving the upper atmosphere on some hurrying cloud skiff. At Torcello, there is nothing but the light to see, nothing at least but a sort of blooming sandbar intersected by a single narrow creek which does duty as a canal, and occupied by a meagre cluster of huts, the dwellings apparently of market gardeners and fishermen and by a ruinous church of the 11th century. It is impossible to imagine a more penetrating case of unheeded collapse. Torcello was the mother city of Venice, and she lies there now a mere mouldering vestige, like a group of weather-bleached parental bones left impiously unburied. I stopped my gondola at the mouth of the shallow inlet and walked along the grass beside the hedge, to the low-browed, crumbling cathedral. The charm of certain vacant, grassy spaces in Italy, overfrowned by masses of brickwork that are honeycombed by the suns of centuries, is something that I hereby renounce once for all the attempt to express. But you may be sure that whenever I mention such a spot, enchantment lurks in it. A delicious stillness covered the little campo at Torcello. I remember none so subtly audible save that of the Roman Campagna. There was no life but the visible tremor of the brilliant air and the cries of half a dozen young children who dogged our steps and clamoured for coppers. These children, by the way, were the handsomest little brats in the world and each was furnished with a pair of eyes that could only have signified the protest of nature against the meanness of fortune. They were very nearly as naked as savages, and the little bellies protruded like those of infant cannibals in the illustrations of books of travel. 
but as they scampered and sprawled in the soft thick grass grinning like suddenly translated cherubs and showing their hungry little teeth they suggested forcibly that the best assurance of happiness in this world is to be found in the maximum of innocence and the minimum of wealth one small urchin framed if ever a child was to be the joy of an aristocratic mamma was the most expressively beautiful creature i had ever looked upon yet a smile to make Correggio sigh in his grave and yet here he was running wild among the sea stunted bushes on the lonely margin of a decaying world in prelude to how blank or how dark a destiny verily nature is still at odds with propriety though indeed if they ever really pull together i fear nature will quite lose her distinction an infant citizen of our own republic straight-haired pale-eyed and freckled duly darned and catechized marching into a new england schoolhouse is an object often seen and soon forgotten but i think i shall always remember with infinite tender conjecture as the years roll by this little unlettered eros of the adriatic strand yet all youthful things at torcello were not cheerful for the poor lad who brought us the key of the cathedral was shaking with an ague and his melancholy presence seemed to point the moral of the forsaken nave and choir the church admirably primitive and curious reminded me of the two or three oldest churches of rome st clement and st agnes the interior is rich in grimly mystical mosaics of the twelfth century and the patchwork of precious fragments in the pavement not inferior to that of st mark's but the terribly distinct apostles arranged against their dead gold backgrounds as stiffly as grenadiers presenting arms intensely personal sentinels of a personal deity their stony stare seems to wait forever vainly for some visible revival of primitive orthodoxy and one may well wonder whether it finds much beguilement in idly gazing troops of western heretics passionless even in their heresy i had been curious to see whether in the galleries and temples of venice i should be disposed to transpose my old estimates to burn what i had adored and adore what i had burned it is a sad truth that one can stand in the ducal palace for the first time but once with the deliciously ponderous sense of that particular half hours being an era in one's mental history but i had the satisfaction of finding at least a great comfort in a short stay that none of my early memories were likely to change places and that i could take up my admirations where i had left them i still found carpaccio delightful veronese magnificent titian supremely beautiful and tintoret scarce to be appraised i repaired immediately to the little church of san cassano which contains the smaller of tintoret's two great crucifixions and when i had looked at it a while i drew a long breath and felt i could now face any other picture in venice with proper self-possession it seemed to me that i had advanced to the uttermost limit of painting that beyond this another art inspired poetry begins and that bellini veronese giorgione and titian all joining hands and straining every muscle of their genius reach forward not so far but they leave a visible space in which tintoret alone is master i well remember the exultations to which he lifted me when i first learned to know him but the glow of that comparatively youthful amazement is dead and with it i fear the confident vivacity of phrase of which in trying to utter my impressions i felt less the magniloquence than the impotence in his power there are many weak spots mysterious lapses and fitful intermissions but when the list of his faults is complete 
he still remains to me the most interesting of painters. His reputation rests chiefly on a more superficial sort of merit, his energy, his unsurpassed productivity, his being, as Théophile Gautier says, le roi des fougueux. These qualities are immense, but the great source of his impressiveness is that his indefatigable hand never drew a line that was not, as one might say, a moral line. No painter ever had such breadth and such depth, and even Titian, beside him, scarce figures as more than a great decorative artist. Mr. Ruskin, whose eloquence in dealing with the great Venetians sometimes outruns his discretion, is fond of speaking even of Veronese as a painter of deep spiritual intentions. This, it seems to me, is pushing matters too far and the author of The Rape of Europa is, pictorially speaking, no greater casuist than any other genius of supreme good taste. Titian was assuredly a mighty poet, but Tintoret, well, Tintoret was almost a prophet. Before his greatest works, you were conscious of a sudden evaporation of old doubts and dilemmas, and the eternal problem of the conflict between idealism and realism dies the most natural of deaths. In his genius, the problem is practically solved. The alternatives are so harmoniously interfused that I defy the keenest critic to say where one begins and the other ends. The homeliest prose melts into the most ethereal poetry. The literal and the imaginative fairly confound their identity. This, however, is vague praise. Tintoret's great merit, to my mind, was his unequalled distinctness of vision. When once he had conceived the germ of the scene, it defined itself to his imagination with an intensity and amplitude and individuality of expression, which makes one's observation of his pictures seem less an operation of the mind than a kind of supplementary experience of life. Veronese and Titian are content with a much looser specification, as their treatment of any subject that the author of the Crucifixion at San Casano has also treated abundantly proves. There are a few more suggestive contrasts than that between the absence of a total character at all commensurate with its scattered variety and brilliancy in Veronese's marriage of Cana at the Louvre, and the poignant, almost startling completeness of Tintoret's illustration of the theme at the Salute Church. To compare his presentation of the Virgin at the Madonna dell'Orto with Titian's at the Academy, or his Annunciation with Titian's close at hand, is to measure the essential difference between observation and imagination. One has certainly not said all that there is to say for Titian when one has called him an observer. Il y mettait du sien. And I use the term to designate roughly the artist whose apprehension infinitely deep and strong when applied to a single figure or to easily balanced groups spends itself vainly on great dramatic combinations or rather leaves them ungaged. It was the whole scene that Tintoret seemed to have beheld in a flash of inspiration, intense enough to stamp it ineffaceably on his perception. And it was the whole scene, complete, peculiar, individual, unprecedented, that he committed to canvas with all the vehemence of his talent. Compare his Last Supper at San Giorgio, its long diagonally placed table, its dusky spaciousness, its scattered lamplight and halo light, its startled gesticulating figures, its richly realistic foreground, with the customary, formal, almost mathematical rendering of the subject, in which impressiveness seems to have been sought in elimination rather than comprehension, you get from Tintoret's work the impression that he felt, pictorially, the great, beautiful, terrible spectacle of human life, very much as Shakespeare felt it poetically, with a heart 
that never ceased to beat a passionate accompaniment to every stroke of his brush. Thanks to this fact, his works are signally grave, and their almost universal and rapidly increasing decay doesn't relieve their gloom. Nothing indeed can well be sadder than the great collection of tinderets at Saint Rocco. Incurable blackness is settling fast upon all of them, and they frown at you across the sombre splendour of their great chambers like gaunt twilight phantoms of pictures. To our children's children, Tintoret, as things are going, can hardly be more than a name, and to such of them as shall miss the tragic beauty already so dimmed and stained of the great bearing of the cross in that temple of his spirit, we live and die without knowing the largest eloquence of art. If you wish to add the last touch of solemnity to the place, recall as vividly as possible while you linger at saint Rocco, the painter's singularly interesting portrait of himself at the Louvre. The old man looks out of the canvas from beneath a brow as sad as a sunless twilight, with just such a stoical hopelessness as you might fancy him to wear if he stood at your side gazing at his rotting canvases it isn't whimsical to read it as the face of a man who felt that he had given the world more than the world was likely to repay indeed before every picture of tintoret you may remember this tremendous portrait with profit on one side, the power, the passion, the illusion of his art. On another, the mortal fatigue of his spirit. The world's knowledge of him is so small that the portrait throws a doubly precious light on his personality. And when we wonder vainly what manner of man he was and what were his purpose, his faith and his method, we may find forcible assurance there that they were at any rate his life, one of the most intellectually passionate ever led. Verona, which was my last Italian stopping place, is in any conditions a delightfully interesting city, but the kindness of my own memory of it is deepened by a subsequent ten days' experience of Germany. I rose one morning at Verona, and went to bed at night at Botzen. The statement needs no comment, and the two places, though not fifty miles apart, are as painfully dissimilar as their names. I had prepared myself for your delectation with a copious tirade on German manners, German scenery, German art and the German stage, on the lights and shadows of Innsbruck, Munich, Nuremberg and Heidelberg, just as I was about to put pen to paper, I glanced into a little volume on these very topics, lately published by that famous novelist and moralist, Monsieur Ernest Fedot, the fruit of a summer's observation at Homburg. This work produced a reaction. If I chose to follow Mr. Fedot's own example when he wishes to qualify his approbation, I may call his treatise by any vile name known to the speech of man. But I content myself with pronouncing it superficial. I then reflect that my own opportunities for seeing and judging were extremely limited, and I suppress my tirade lest some more enlightened critic should come and hang me with the same rope. Its sum and substance was to have been that superficially, Germany is ugly, that Munich is a nightmare, Heidelberg a disappointment, in spite of its charming castle, and even Nuremberg, not a joy forever. But comparisons are odious. And if Munich is ugly, Verona is beautiful enough. You may laugh at my logic, but will probably assent to my meaning. I carried away from Verona a precious mental picture upon which I cast an introspective glance whenever, between Botzen and Strasbourg, the oppression of external circumstances became painful. It was a lovely August afternoon in the Roman arena, 
a ruin in which repair and restoration have been so watchfully and plausibly practised that it seems all of one harmonious antiquity. The vast stony oval rose high against the sky in a single clear continuous line, broken here and there only by strolling and reclining lounges. The mass of tears inclined in solid monotony to the central circle in which the small open-air theatre was in active operation. A small quarter of the great slope of masonry facing the stage was roped off into an auditorium in which the narrow level space between the footlights and the lower step figured as the pit. Footlights are a figure of speech, for the performance was going on in the broad glow of the afternoon, with the delightful and apparently by no means misplaced confidence in the goodwill of the spectators. What the piece was that was deemed so superbly able to shift for itself, I know not, very possibly the same drama that I remember seeing advertised during my former visit to Verona, nothing less than La Tremenda Justizia di Dio. If titles are worth anything, this product of the melodramatist's art might surely stand upon its own legs. Along the tiers above the little group of regular spectators was gathered a free list of unauthorised observers, who, although beyond earshot, must have been enabled by their generous breadth of Italian gesture to follow the tangled thread of the piece. It was all deliciously Italian. The mixture of old life and new, the mountebanks booth, it was hardly more, grafted on the antique circus, the dominant presence of a mighty architecture, the lounges and idlers beneath the kindly sky and upon the sun-warmed stones. I never felt more keenly the difference between the background to life in very old and very new civilizations. There are other things in Verona to make it a liberal education to be born there, though that it is one for the contemporary Veronese, I don't pretend to say. The tombs of the Scaligers, with their soaring pinnacles, their high poised canopies, their exquisite refinement and concentration of the Gothic idea, I can't profess even after much worshipful gazing to have fully comprehended and enjoyed. They seem to me full of deep architectural meanings, such as must drop gently into the mind one by one, after infinite tranquil contemplation. But even to the hurried and preoccupied traveller, the solemn little chapel yard and the city's heart in which they stand, girdled by their great swaying curtain of linked and twisted iron, is one of the most impressive spots in Italy. Nowhere else is such a wealth of artistic achievement crowded into so narrow a space. Nowhere else are the daily comings and goings of men blessed by the presence of manlier art. Verona is rich, furthermore, in beautiful churches, several with beautiful names, San Fermo, Santa Anastasia, San Zenone. This last is a structure of high antiquity and of the most impressive loveliness. The nave terminates in a double choir, that is, a sub-choir or crypt, into which you descend and where you wander among primitive columns whose variously grotesque capitals rise hardly higher than your head, and an upper choral plain reached by broad stairways of the bravest effect. And I shall never forget the impression of majestic chastity that I received from the great nave of the church on my former visit. I then decided to my satisfaction that every church is, from the devotional point of view, a solecism that has not something of a similar absolute felicity of proportion, for strictly formal beauty seems best to express our conception of spiritual beauty. The nobly serious character of San Zanoni is deepened by its single picture, a masterpiece of the most serious of painters, the severe and exquisite Mantegna. 1872. End of section 6.
Section 7 of Italian Hours by Henry James. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Two old houses and three young women. There are times and places that come back yet again, but that when the brooding tourist puts out his hand to them, meet it a little slowly or even seem to recede a step as if in slight fear of some liberty he may take. Surely they should know by this time that he is capable of taking none. He has his own way, and he makes it all right. It now becomes just a part of the charming solicitation that it presents precisely a problem, that of giving the particular thing as much as possible without at the same time giving it, as we say, away. There are considerations, proprieties, a necessary indirectness. He must use, in short, a little art. No necessity, however, more than this, makes him warm to his work, and thus it is that, after all, he hangs his three pictures. 1. The evening that was to give me the first of them was by no means the first occasion of my asking myself if that inveterate style of which we talk so much be absolutely conditioned in dear old venice and elsewhere on decrepitude is it the style that has brought about the decrepitude or the decrepitude that has as it were intensified and consecrated the style there is an ambiguity about it all that constantly haunts and beguiles Dear old Venice has lost her complexion, her figure, her reputation, her self-respect. Yet with it all has so puzzlingly not lost a shred of her distinction. Perhaps indeed the case is simpler than it seems, for the poetry of misfortune is familiar to us all. Whereas in spite of a stroke here and there of some happy justice that charms, we scarce find ourselves anywhere arrested by the poetry of a run of luck. The misfortune of Venice being, accordingly, at every point, what we most touch, feel, and see, we end by assuming it to be of the essence of her dignity, a consequence we become aware, by the way, sufficiently discouraging to the general application or pretension of style, and all the more that, to make the final felicity deep, the original greatness must have been something tremendous. If it be the ruins that are noble, we have known plenty that were not. And moreover, there are degrees and varieties. Certain monuments, solid survivals, hold up their heads and decline to ask for a grain of your pity. Well, one knows, of course, when to keep one's pity to oneself. Yet one clings, even in the face of the colder stare, to one's prized Venetian privilege, of making the sense of doom and decay a part of every impression. Cheerful work, it may be said, of course, and it is doubtless only in Venice that you gain more by such a trick than you lose. What was most beautiful is gone, and what was next most beautiful is, thank goodness, going. That, I think, is the monstrous description of the better part of your thought. Is it really your fault? if the place makes you want so desperately to read history into everything. You do that wherever you turn and wherever you look, and you do it, I should say, most of all, at night. It comes to you there with longer knowledge and with all deference to what flushes and shimmers that the night is the real time. It perhaps even wouldn't have taken much to make you award the palm to the nights of winter, this is certainly true for the form of progression that is most characteristic for every question of departure and arrival by gondola. The little closed cabin of this perfect vehicle, the movement, the darkness and the plash, the indistinguishable swerves and twists, all the things you don't see and all the things you do feel, each dim recognition and obscure arrest, is a possible throb of your sense of being floated to your doom. 
even when the truth is simply and sociably that you are going out to tea. Nowhere else is anything as innocent so mysterious, nor anything as mysterious so pleasantly deterrent to protest. These are the moments when you are most daringly Venetian, most content to leave cheap trippers and other aliens, the highlight of the mid lagoon and the pursuit of pink and gold the splendid day is good enough for them what is best for you is to stop at last as you are now stopping among clustered pally and softly shining poops and prows at a great flight of water steps that played their admirable part in the general effect of the great entrance the high doors stand open from them to the paved chamber of a basement tremendously tall and not vulgarly lighted from which in turn mounts the slow stone staircase that draws you further on the great point is that if you are worthy of this impression at all there isn't a single item of it of which the association isn't noble hold to it fast that there is no other such dignity of arrival as arrival by water Hold to it that to float and slacken and gently bump, to creep out of the low dark felse and make the few guided movements and find the strong crooked and offered arm and then, beneath lighted palace windows, pass up the few damp steps on the precautionary carpet. Hold to it that these things constitute a preparation of which the only defect is that it may sometimes perhaps really prepare too much it's so stately that what can come after it's so good in itself that what upstairs as we comparative vulgarians say can be better hold to it at any rate that if a lady in a special scrambles out of a carriage tumbles out of a cab flops out of a tramcar and hurdles projectile like out of a lightning elevator she alights from the venetian conveyance as cleopatra may have stepped from her barge upstairs whatever may be yet in store for her her entrance shall still advantageously enjoy the support most opposed to the momentum acquired the beauty of the matter has been in the absence of all momentum elsewhere so scientifically applied to us from behind by the terrible life of our day and in the fact that as the elements of slowness the felicities of deliberation doubtless thus all hang together the last of calculable dangers is to enter a great venetian room with a rush not the least happy note therefore of the picture i am trying to frame is that there was absolutely no rushing not only in the sense of a scramble over marble floors but by reason of something dissuasive and distributive in the very air of the place a suggestion under the fine old ceilings and among types of face and figure abounding in the unexpected that here were many things to consider perhaps the simplest rendering of a scene into the depths of which there are good grounds of discretion for not sinking, will be just this emphasis on the value of the unexpected for such occasions, with due qualification naturally of its degree. Unexpectedness, pure and simple, it is needless to say, may easily endanger any social gathering, and I hasten to add, moreover, that the figures and faces I speak of were probably not in the least unexpected to each other, the stage they occupied was a stage of variety. Venice has ever been a garden of strange social flowers. It is only as reflected in the consciousness of the visitor from afar, brooding tourist even, call him, or sharp-eyed bird on the branch, that I attempt to give you the little drama. Beginning with the felicity that most appealed to him, the visible, unmistakable fact that he was the only representative of his class the whole of the rest of the business was but what he saw and felt and fancied what he was to remember and what he was to forget through it all i may say distinctly he clung to his great venetian clue 
the explanation of everything by the historic idea. It was a high historic house, with such a quantity of recorded past twinkling in the multitudinous candles that one grasped at the idea of something waning and displaced, and might even fondly and secretly nurse the conceit that what one was having was just the very last. Wasn't it certainly, for instance, no mere illusion that there is no appreciable future left for such manners, an urbanity so comprehensive, a form so transmitted as those of such a hostess and such a host? The future is for a different conception of the graceful altogether, as far as it's for a conception of the graceful at all. Into that computation I shall not attempt to enter, but these representative products of an antique culture at least, and one of which the secret seems more likely than not to be lost, were not common. Nor indeed was anyone else in the circle to which the picture most insisted on restricting itself. Neither, on the other hand, was anyone either very beautiful or very fresh, which was again exactly a precious value on an occasion that was to shine most to the imagination by the complexity of its references. Such old, old women, with such old, old jewels, such ugly, ugly ones, with such handsome, becoming names, such battered, fatigued gentlemen, with such inscrutable decorations, such an absence of youth, for the most part in either sex, of the pink and white, of the bud of new worlds, such a general personal air in fine of being the worse for a good deal of wear in various old ones. It was not a society that was clear, in which little girls and boys set the tune. There was that about it all that might well have cast a shadow on the path of even the most successful little girl. It also, let me not be rudely inexact, it was in honour of youth and freshness that we had all been convened. The fiancé of the last, unless it were the last but one, unmarried daughter of the house had just been brought to a proper climax. The contract had been signed, the betrothal rounded off. I'm not sure that the civil marriage hadn't that day taken place. The occasion then had, in fact, the most charming of heroines and the most ingenuous of heroes, a young man, the latter, all happily suffused with a fair Austrian blush. The young lady had had, besides other more or less shining recent ancestors, a very famous paternal grandmother, who had played a great part in the political history of her time, and whose portrait in the taste and dress of 1830 was conspicuous in one of the rooms. The granddaughter of this celebrity of royal race was strikingly like her, and by a fortunate stroke had been habited, combed, curled, in a manner exactly to reproduce the portrait. These things were charming and amusing, as indeed were several other things besides. The great Venetian beauty of our period was there, and nature had equipped the great Venetian beauty for her part, with the properest sense of the suitable, or in any case with a splendid generosity, since on the ideally suitable character of so brave a human symbol, who shall have the last word? This responsible agent was at all events the beauty in the world, about whom probably most the absence of question, an absence never wholly propitious, would a little smugly and monotonously flourish. The one thing wanting to the interest she inspired was thus the possibility of ever discussing it. There were plenty of suggestive subjects round about, on the other hand, as to which the exchange of ideas would by no means necessarily have dropped. You profit to the full at such times by all the old voices, echoes, images by that element of the history of Venice which represents all Europe as having at one time and another revelled or rested, asked for pleasure or for patience there, which gives the place supremely as the refuge of endless strange secrets, broken fortunes, 
and wounded hearts. Two. There had been, on lines of further or different speculation, a young Englishman to luncheon, and the young Englishman had proved sympathetic so that when it was a question afterwards of some of the more hidden treasures, the browner depths of the old churches, the case became one for mutual guidance and gratitude, for a small afternoon tour, and the weight of a pair of friends in the warm little campy at locked doors, for which the nearest urchin had scurried off to find the keeper of the key. There are few brown depths today into which the light of the hotels doesn't shine, and few hidden treasures about which pages enough doubtless haven't already been printed. My business, accordingly, let me hasten to say, is not now with the fond renewal of any discovery, at least in the order of impressions most usual. Your discovery may be, for that matter, renewed every week. The only essential is the good luck, which a fair amount of practice has taught you to count upon of not finding for the particular occasion other discoverers in the field. Then in a quiet corner with the closed door, then in the presence of the picture and of your companion's sensible emotion, not only the original happy moment but everything else is renewed. Yet once again it can all come back. The old custode shuffling about in the dimness jerks away to make sure of his tip, the old curtain that isn't much more modern than the wonderful work itself. He does his best to create light where light can never be. But you have your practised, groping gaze, and in guiding the young eyes of your less confident associate, moreover, you feel you possess the treasure. These are the refined pleasures that Venice has still to give these odd, happy passages of communication and response. But the point of my reminiscence is that there were other communications that day, as there were certainly other responses. I have forgotten exactly what it was we were looking for, without much success, when we met the three sisters. Nothing requires more care, as a long knowledge of Venice works in, than not to lose the useful faculty of getting lost. I had so successfully done my best to preserve it that I could at that moment conscientiously profess an absence of any suspicion of where we might be. It proved enough that wherever we were, we were where the three sisters found us. This was on a little bridge near a big campo and a part of the charm of the matter was the theory that it was very much out of the way. They took us promptly in hand. They were only walking over to San Marco to match some coloured wool for the manufacture of such belated cushions as still bloom with purple and green in the long leisures of old palaces, and that mild errand could easily open a parenthesis. The obscure church we had feebly imagined we were looking for proved, if I'm not mistaken, that of the sister's parish, as to which I have but a confused recollection of a large grey void, and of admiring for the first time a fine work of art of which I have now quite lost the identity. This was the effect of the charming beneficence of the three sisters who presently were to give our adventure a turn in the emotion of which everything that had preceded it seemed as nothing. It actually strikes me even as a little dim to have been told by them as we all fared together that a certain low, wide house and a small square as to which I found myself without particular association had been in the far-off time the residence of Georges Sand. And yet this was a fact that, though I could then only feel it must be for another day, would in a different connection have set me richly reconstructing. Madame Sand's famous Phoenician year has been of late immensely in the air. A tub of soiled linen, which the muse of history, rolling her sleeves well up, has not even yet 
quite ceased energetically and publicly to wash. The house in question must have been the house to which the wonderful lady betook herself when, in 1834, after the dramatic exit of Alfred de Musset, she enjoyed that remarkable period of rest and refreshment with the so long silent but recently rediscovered, reported, extinguished Dr. Pagello. As an old sondist, not exactly indeed of the premier heure, but of the fine high noon and golden afternoon of the great career, I had been, though I confess too inactively, curious as to a few points in the topography of the eminent adventure to which I here allude, but had never got beyond the little public fact, in itself always a bit of a thrill to the sondist, that the present Hotel Danielli had been the scene of its first remarkable stages. I am not sure, indeed, that the curiosity I speak of has not at last, in my breast, yielded to another form of wonderment, truly to the rather rueful question of why we have so continued to concern ourselves, and why the fond observer of the footprints of genius is likely so to continue, with a body of discussion neither in itself and in its day, nor in its preserved and attested records, at all positively edifying. The answer to such an inquiry would doubtless reward patience, but I fear we can now glance at its possibilities only long enough to say that interesting persons, so long as they be of sufficiently approved and established interest, render in some degree interesting whatever happens to them, and give it an importance even when very little else, as in the case I refer to, may have operated to give it a dignity, which is where I leave the issue of further identifications. For the three sisters, in the kindest way in the world, had asked us if we already knew their sequestered home, and whether, in case we didn't, we should be at all amused to see it. My own acquaintance with them, though not of recent origin, had hitherto lacked this enhancement, at which we both now grasped with the full instinct, indescribable enough, of what it was likely to give. But how, for that matter, either, can I find the right expression of what was to remain with this of this episode? It is the fault of the sad-eyed old witch of Venice that she so easily puts more into things that can pass under the common names that do for them elsewhere, too much for a rough sketch was to be seen and felt in the home of the three sisters, and in the delightful and slightly pathetic deviation of their doing us so simply and freely the honours of it. What was most immediately marked was their resigned cosmopolite state, the effacement of old conventional lines by foreign contact and example by the action, too, of causes full of a special interest, but not to be emphasised, perhaps, granted, indeed, they be named at all, without a certain sadness of sympathy. If style in Venice sits among ruins, let us always lighten our tread when we pay her a visit. Our steps were, in fact, I am happy to think, almost soft enough for a death chamber, as we stood in the big, vague sala of the three sisters, spectators of their simplified state and their beautiful, blighted rooms, the memories, the portraits, the shrunken relics of nine doges. If I wanted a first chapter, it was here made to my hand. The painter of life and manners, as he glanced about, could only sigh, as he so frequently has to, over the vision of so much more truth than he can use. What on earth is the need to invent in the midst of tragedy and comedy that never cease? Why, with the subject itself all round so inimitable, condemn the picture to the silliness of trying not to be aware of it? The charming lonely girls, carrying so simply their great name and fallen fortunes, 
the despoiled degaduta house the unfailing italian grace the space so out of scale with actual needs the absence of books the presence of ennui the sense of the length of the hours and the shortness of everything else all this was a matter not only for a second chapter and a third but for a whole volume a denouement and a sequel this time unmistakably it was the last words were stately shade of that which once was great and it was almost as if our distinguished young friends had consented to pass away slowly in order to treat us to the vision ends are only ends in truth for the painter of pictures they are more or less conscious and prolonged one of the sisters had been to london when she had brought back the impression of having seen at the british museum a room exclusively filled with books and documents devoted to the commemoration of her family she must also then have encountered at the national gallery the exquisite specimen of an early venetian master in which one of her ancestors then head of state kneels with so sweet a dignity before the virgin and child she was perhaps old enough none the less to have seen this precious work taken down from the wall of the room in which we sat and on terms so far too easy carried away for ever and not too young at all events to have been present now and then when her candid elders enlightened too late as to what their sacrifice might really have done for them looked at each other with the pale hush of the irreparable we let ourselves note that these were matters to put a great deal of old, old history into sweet young Venetian faces. 3. In Italy, if we come to that, this particular appearance is far from being only in the streets, where we're apt most to observe it, in countenances caught as we pass, and in the objects marked by the guidebooks with their respective stellar allowances, it is behind the walls of the houses that old, old history is thick, and that the multiplied stars of Baedeker might often best find their application. The Feast of St. John the Baptist is the Feast of the Year in Florence, and it seemed to me on that night that I could have scattered about me a handful of these signs. I had the pleasure of spending a couple of hours on a signal high terrace that overlooks the arno as well as in the galleries that open out of it where i met more than ever the pleasant curious question of the disparity between the old conditions and the new manners make our manners we moderns as good as we can there is still no getting over it that they are not good enough for many of the great places this was one of those scenes and its greatness came out to the full in the hot Florentine evening, in which the pink and golden fires of the pyrotechnics ranged on the Ponte Caraia, the occasion of our assembly, lighted up the large issue. The quote, good people, end quote beneath, were a huge, hot, gentle, happy family. The fireworks on the bridge, kindling river as well as sky, were delicate and charming the terrace connected the two wings that give bravery to the front of the palace and the close-hung pictures in the rooms open in a long series offered to a lover of quiet perambulation an alternative hard to resist wherever he stood on the broad loggia in the cluster of company among bland ejaculations and liquefied ices or in the presence of the mixed masters that led him from wall to wall such a seeker for the spirit of each occasion could only turn it over that in the first place this was an intenser finer little florence than ever and that in the second the testimony was again wonderful to former fashions and ideas what did they do in the other time the time of so much smaller a society smaller and fewer fortunes more taste 
perhaps as to some particulars, but fewer tastes at any rate, and fewer habits and wants. What did they do, with chambers so multitudinous and so vast? Put their state at its highest, and we know of many ways in which it must have been broken down. How did they live in them, without the aid of variety? How did they, in minor communities in which everyone knew everyone, and everyone's impression and effect had been long, as we say, discounted, find representation and emulation sufficiently amusing? Much of the charm of thinking of it, however, is doubtless that we are not able to say. This leaves us with the conviction that does them most honour. The old generations built and arranged greatly for the simple reason that they liked it, and that they could bore themselves, to say nothing of each other when it came to that, better in noble conditions than in mean ones. It was not of the faraway Florentine age that I most thought, but of periods more recent, and of which the sound and beautiful house more directly spoke. If one had always been homesick for the Arno side of the 17th and 18th centuries, here was a chance, and a better one than ever, to taste again of the cup. Many of the pictures, there was a charming quarter of an hour when I had them to myself, are bad enough to have passed for good in those delightful years. Shades of grand dukes encompassed me. Dukes of the pleasant latest sort, who weren't really grand. There was still the sense of having come too late. Yet not too late, after all, for this glimpse and this dream. My business was to people the place. Its own business had never been to save us the trouble of understanding it. And then the deepest spell of all was perhaps that just here I was so supremely out of the way of the terribly actual Florentine question. This, as all the world knows, is a battleground today in many journals, with all Italy practically pulling on one side and all England, America and Germany pulling on the other. I speak, of course, of the more or less articulate opinion. The improvement, the rectification of Florence is in the air. And the problem of the particular ways in which, given such desperately delicate cases, these matters should be understood. The little treasure city is, if there ever was one, a delicate case. More delicate, perhaps, than any other in the world. Save that of our taking on ourselves to persuade the Italians that they may do as they like with their own. They so absolutely may that I profess I see no happy issue from the fight. It will take more tact than our combined tactful genius may at all probably muster to convince them that their own is, by an ingenious logic, much rather ours. It will take more subtlety still to muster for them that dazzling show of examples from which they may learn that what in general is ours appear to them, as a rule, a sacrifice to beauty, and a, a triumph of taste. The situation to the truly analytic mind offers, in short, to perfection, all the elements of despair. And I am afraid that if I hung back at the Corsini Palace to woo illusions and invoke the irrelevant, it was because I could think in the conditions of no better way to meet the acute responsibility of the critic than just to shirk it. 1899, end of section 7. Section 8 of Italian Hours by Henry James. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Casa Alvisi invited to introduce certain pages of cordial and faithful reminiscence from another hand footnote browning in venice being recollections of the late catherine de k bronson 
with a prefatory note by H. J. Cornhill Magazine, February 1902, end footnote, in which a frankly predominant presence seems to live again, I undertook that office with an interest inevitably somewhat sad. So past and gone today is so much of the life suggested. Those who fortunately knew Mrs. Bronson will read into her notes still more of it, more of her subject, more of herself too, and of many things than she gives, and some may well even feel tempted to do for her what she has done here for her distinguished friend. In Venice, during a long period for many pilgrims, Mrs. Arthur Bronson, originally of New York, was so far as society, hospitality, a charming personal welcome were concerned, almost in sole possession. She had become there with time quite the prime representative of those private amenities which the Anglo-Saxon abroad is apt to miss just in proportion as the place visited is publicly wonderful and in which he therefore finds a value twice as great as at home. Mrs. Bronson really earned in this way the gratitude of mingled generations and races. She sat for twenty years at the wide mouth, as it were, of the Grand Canal, holding out her hand with endless good nature, patience, charity, to all decently accredited petitioners. The incessant troop of those either bewilderedly making or fondly renewing acquaintance with the dazzling city. Casa Alvisi is directly opposite the high, broad-based, florid church of Santa Maria della Salute, so directly that from the balcony over the water entrance your eye, crossing the canal, seems to find the keyhole of the great door right in a line with it. And there was something in this position that for the time made all Venice lovers think of the genial padrona as thus levying in the most convenient way the toll of curiosity and sympathy. Everyone passed, everyone was seen to pass, and a few were those not seen to stop and to return. The most generous of hostesses died a year ago at Florence. Her house knows her no more. It had ceased to do so for some time before her death, and the long pleased procession, the charmed arrivals, the happy sojourns at anchor, the reluctant departures that made Car Alvisi, as was currently said, a social porta di mare, is for remembrance and regret already a possession of ghosts so that on the spot at present the attention ruefully averts itself from the dear little old faded but once familiarly bright facade overtaken at last by the comparatively vulgar uses that are doing their best to paint out in venice right and left by staring signs and other vulgarities the immemorial note of distinction the house in a city of palaces was small, but the tenant clung to her perfect, her inclusive position, the one right place that gave her a better command, as it were, than a better house obtained by a harder compromise, not being fond, moreover, of spacious halls and massive treasures, but of compact and familiar rooms, in which her remarkable accumulation of minute and delicate Venetian objects could show. She adored, in the way of the Venetian, to which all her tastes addressed itself, the small, the domestic and the exquisite, so that she would have given a tintoretto or two, I think, without difficulty, for a cabinet of tiny gilded glasses or a dinner surface of the right old silver. The general receptacle of these multiplied treasures played, at any rate through the years, the part of a friendly private box at the constant operatic show, a box at the best point of the best tier, with the cushioned ledge of its front raking the whole scene, 
and with its withdrawing rooms behind for more detached conversation for easy when not indeed slightly difficult polyglot talk artful bibete artful cigarettes too straight from the hand of the hostess who could do all that belonged to a hostess place people in relation and keep them so take up and put down the topic cause delicate tobacco and little gilded glasses to circulate without ever leaving her sofa cushions or intermitting her good nature she exercised in these conditions with never a block as we say in london in the traffic with never an admission or acceptance of the least social complication her positive genius for easy interest easy sympathy easy friendship it was as if at last she had taken the human race at large quite irrespective of geography for her neighbours with neighbourly relations as a matter of course these things on her part had at all events the greater appearance of ease from their having found to their purpose and as if the very air of venice produced them a cluster of forms so light and immediate so pre-established by picturesque custom the old bright tradition the wonderful venetian legend had appealed to her from the first closing round her house and her well-plashed water steps where the waiting gondolas were thick quite as if actually the ghost of the defunct carnival since i have spoken of ghosts still played some haunting part let me add at the same time that mrs bronson's social facility which was really her great refuge from importunity a defence with serious thought and serious feeling quietly cherished behind it had its discriminations as well as its inveteracies and that the most marked of all these perhaps was her attachment to robert browning nothing in all her beneficent life had probably made her happier than to have found herself able to minister each year with the returning autumn to his pleasure and comfort attached to carol vesey on the land side is a somewhat melancholy old section of a justiniani palace which she had annexed to her own premises mainly for the purpose of placing it in comfortable guise at the service of her friends she liked as she professed when they were the real thing to have them under her hand and here succeeded each other through the years the company of the privileged and the more closely domesticated who liked harmlessly to distinguish between themselves and outsiders among visitors partaking of this pleasant provision mr browning was of course easily first but i must leave her own pen to show him as her best years knew him the point was meanwhile that if her charity was great even for the outsider this was by reason of the inner essence of it her perfect tenderness for venice which he always recognised as a link that was the true principle of fusion the key to communication she communicated in proportion little or much measuring it as she felt people more responsive or less so and she expressed herself or in other words her full affection for the place only to those who had most of the same sentiment the rich and interesting form in which she found it in browning may well be imagined together with the quite independent quantity of the genial at large that she also found but i am not sure that his favour was not primarily based on his paid tribute of such things as two in a gondola and a toccata of galuppi he had more ineffaceably than any one recorded his initiation from of old she was thus all round supremely faithful yet it was perhaps after all with the very small folk those to the manner born that she made the easiest terms 
she loved she had from the first enthusiastically adopted the engaging venetian people whose virtues she found touching and their infirmities but such as appeal mainly to the sense of humour and the love of anecdote and she befriended and admired she studied and spoiled them there must have been a multitude of whom it would scarce be too much to say that her long residence among them was their settled golden age when i consider that they have lost her now i fairly wonder to what shifts they have been put and how long they may not have to wait for such another messenger of providence she cultivated their dialect she renewed their boats she piously relighted at the top of the tide-washed pali of traghetto or lagoon the neglected lamp of the tutelary madonetta she took cognizance of the wives the children the accidents the troubles as to which she became perceptibly the most prompt the established remedy on lines where the amusement was happily less one-sided she put together in dialect many short comedies dramatic proverbs which with one of her drawing-rooms permanently arranged as a charming diminutive theatre she caused to be performed by the young persons of her circle often when the case lent itself by the wonderful small offspring of humbler friends children of the venetian lower class whose aptitude teachability drollery were her constant delight it was certainly true that an impression of venice as humanly sweet might easily found itself on the frankness and quickness and amiability of these little people they were at least so much to the good for the philosophy of their patroness was as venetian as anything else helping her to accept experience without bitterness and to remain fresh even in the fatigue which finally overtook her for pleasant surprises and proved sincerities she was herself sincere to the last for the place of her predilection inasmuch as though she had arranged herself in the later time and largely for the love of pippa passes an alternative refuge at asolo she absented herself from venice with continuity only under coercion of illness at arcelo periodically the link with browning was more confirmed than weakened and there in old venetian territory and with the invasion of visitors comparatively checked her preferentially small house became again a setting for the pleasure of talk and the sense of italy it contained again its own small treasures all in the pleasant key of the homelier venetian spirit the plain beneath it stretched away like a purple sea from the lower cliffs of the hills and the white cabinelli of the villages as one was perpetually saying showed on the expanse like scattered sails of ships the rumbling carriage the old-time rattling red velveted carriage of provincial rural italy delightful and quaint did the office of the gondola to bassano to treviso to a high-walled castelfranco all pink and gold the home of the great giorgione here also memories cluster but it is in venice again that her banished presence is most felt for there in the real or certainly the finer the more sifted cosmopolis it falls into its place among the others evoked those of the past seekers of poetry and dispensers of romance it is a fact that almost every one interesting appealing melancholy memorable odd seems at one time or another after many days and much life to have gravitated to venice by a happy instinct settling in it and treating it cherishing it as a sort of repository of consolations all of which to-day for the conscious mind is mixed with its air and constitutes its unwritten history 
the deposed, the defeated, the disenchanted, the wounded, or even only the bored, have seemed to find there something that no other place could give. But such people came for themselves, as we seem to see them, only with the egotism of their grievances and the vanity of their hopes. Mrs. Bronson's case was beautifully different. She had come altogether for others. End of section 8「Nine of Italian Hours by Henry James. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. From Chambéry to Milan. You are truly sentimental tourist. Will never take it from any occasion that there is absolutely nothing for him. And it was at Chambéry, but four hours from Geneva, that I accepted the situation and decided there might be be mysterious delights in entering Italy by a whiz through an eight-mile tunnel, even as a bullet through the bore of a gun. I found my reward in the Savoyard landscape, which greets you betimes with the smile of anticipation. If it is not so Italian as Italy, it is at least more Italian than anything but Italy. More Italian, too, I should think, than can seem natural and proper to the swarming red-legged soldiery who so publicly proclaim it to be of the empire of Monsieur Thiers. The light and the complexion of things had to my eyes not a little of that mollified depth last loved by them rather further on. It was simply, perhaps, that the weather was hot and the mountains drowsing in that iridescent haze that I've seen nearer home than Chambéry. But the vegetation, assuredly, had all but transalpine twist and curl, and the classic wayside tangle of corn and vines left nothing to be desired in the line of careless grace. Chambéry as a town, however, constitutes no foretaste of the monumental cities. There is shabbiness and shabbiness, the fond critic of such things will tell you, and that of the ancient capital of Savoy lacks style. I found a better pastime, however, than strolling through the dark, dull streets in quest of effects that were not forthcoming. The first urchin you meet will show you the way to Les Chamettes and the Maison Jean-Jacques. A very pleasant way it becomes as soon as it leaves the town a winding, climbing by-road, bordered with such tall and sturdy hedge as to give it the air of an English lane. If you can fancy an English lane, introducing you to the haunts of a Madame de Varenne. The house that formerly sheltered this lady's singular menage stands on a hillside above the road, which a rapid path connects with a little grass-grown terrace before it. It is a small, shabby, homely dwelling, with a certain reputable solidity, however, and more of internal spaciousness than of outside promise. The place is shown by an elderly, competent dame, who points out the very few surviving objects, which you may touch with the reflection, complacent in whatsoever degree suits you, that they have known the familiarity of Rousseau's hand. It was presumably a meagerly appointed house, and I wondered that on such scanty features so much expression should linger. But the structure has an ancient ponderosity, and the dust of the 18th century seems to lie on its worm-eaten floors, to cling to the faded old papier à remage on the walls, and to lodge in the crevices of the brown wooden ceilings. Madame de Varennes's bed remains, with the narrow couch of Jean-Jacques as well, his little warped and cracked yellow spinet, and a battered turnip-shaped silver timepiece engraved with its master's name. Its primitive tick as extinct as his passionate heartbeats. It cost me, I confess, 
a somewhat pitying acceleration of my own to see this intimately personal relic of the genius loki for it had dwelt in his waistcoat pocket than which there is hardly a material point in space nearer to a man's consciousness tossed so irreverently upon the table on which you deposit your fee beside the dog-eared visitor's record or the livre de cuisine recently denounced by madame Chaux's song in fact the place generally in so far as some faint ghostly presence of its famous inmate seems to linger there is by no means exhilarating Coppe and Fernet tell, if not of pure happiness, at least of prosperity and honour, wealth and success. But Les Charmettes is haunted by ghosts unclean and forlorn. The place tells of poverty, perversity, distress. A good deal of clever modern talent in France has been employed in touching up the episode of which it was the scene and tricking it out in idyllic love knots but as i stood on the charming terrace i have mentioned a little jewel of a terrace with grassy flags and a mossy parapet and an admirable view of great swelling violet hills stood there reminded how much sweeter nature is than man the story looked rather wan and unlovely beneath these literary decorations, and I could pay it no livelier homage than is implied in perfect pity. Hero and heroine had become too much creatures of history to take up attitudes as part of any poetry, but not to moralise too sternly, for a tourist between trains, I should add that as an illustration to be inserted mentally in the text of the confessions a glimpse of la chamette is pleasant enough it completes the rare charm of good autobiography to behold with one's eyes the faded and battered background of the story and crusoe's narrative is so incomparably vivid and forcible that the sordid little house at chambray seems of a hardly deeper shade of reality than so many other passages of his projected truth if i spent an hour at la chamette fumbling thus helplessly with the past i recognised on the morrow how strongly the montseny tunnel smells of the time to come as i passed along the saint highway a couple of months since i perceived halfway up the swiss ascent a group of navvies at work in a gorge beneath the road they had laid bare a broad surface of granite and had punched in the centre of it a round black cavity of about the dimensions as it seemed to me of a soup plate this was to attain its perfect development some eight years hence the mont Cenis may therefore be held to have set a fashion which will be followed till the highest himalaya is but the ornamental apex or snow-capped gable-tip of some resounding fuliginous corridor the tunnel differs but in length from other tunnels you spend half an hour in it but you whirl out into the blessed peninsula and as you look back seem to see the mighty mass shrug its shoulders over the line the mere turn of a dreaming giant in his sleep the tunnel is certainly not a poetic object but there is no perfection without its beauty and as you measure the long rugged outline of the pyramid of which it forms the base you accept it as the perfection of a shortcut twenty-four hours from paris to turin its speed for the times speed which may content us at any rate until the expanse of berlin has succeeded in placing itself at thirty six from Milan. To enter Turin then of a lovely August afternoon was to find a city of arcades, of pink and yellow stucco, of innumerable cafes, of blue legged offices, of ladies draped in the North Italian mantilla. An old friend of Italy coming back to her finds an easy waking for dormant memories 
every object is a reminder and every reminder a thrill half an hour after my arrival as i stood at my window which overhung the great square i found the scene within and without a rough epitome of every pleasure and every impression i had formerly gathered from italy the balcony and the venetian blind the cool floor of speckled concrete the lavish delusions of frescoed wall and ceiling the broad divan framed for the noonday siesta the mass of medieval castello in mid piazza with its shabby rear and its pompous palladian front the brick campaniles beyond the milder yellower light the range of colour the suggestion of sound later beneath the arcades i found many an old acquaintance beautiful officers resplendent slow strolling contemplative of female beauty civil and peaceful dandies hardly less gorgeous with that religious faith in moustache and shirt front which distinguishes the belgeness of italy ladies with heads artfully shawled in spanish-looking lace but with too little art or too much nature at least in the region of the bodice well-conditioned young abati with neatly drawn stockings these indeed are not objects of first-rate interest and with such turin is rather meagrely furnished it has no architecture no churches no monuments no romantic street scenery it has the great votive temple of the superga which stands on a high hilltop above the city gazing across at monte rosa and lifting its own fine dome against the sky with no contemptible art but when you have seen the superga from the quay beside the po a skein of a few yellow threads in august despite its frequent habit of rising high and running wild and said to herself that in architecture position is half the battle you have nothing left to visit but the museum of pictures the turin gallery which is large and well arranged is the fortunate owner of three or four masterpieces a couple of magnificent van dykes and a couple of paul veroneses the latter a queen of sheba and a feast of the house of levi the usual splendid combination of brocades grandees and marble colonnades dividing those skies de turquoise malade to which teofio gautier is fond of alluding the veronesis are fine but with venice in prospect the traveller feels at liberty to keep his best attention in reserve if however he has the proper relish for van dyck let him linger long and fondly here for that admiration will never be more potently stirred than by the adorable group of the three little royal highnesses sons and the daughter of charles i all the purity of childhood is here and all its soft solidity of structure rounded tenderly beneath the spangled satin and contrasted charmingly with the pompous rigidity clad respectively in crimson white and blue these small scions stand up in their ruffs and farrandales in dimpled serenity squaring their infantine stomachers at the spectator with an innocence a dignity a delightful grotesqueness which make the picture a thing of close truth as well as of fine decorum you might kiss their hands but you certainly would think twice before pinching their cheeks provocative as they are of this tribute of admiration and would altogether lack presumption to lift them off the ground or the higher level of dais on which they stand so sturdily planted by right of birth there is something inimitable in the paternal gallantry with which the painter has touched off the young lady she was a princess yet she was a baby and he has contrived we let ourselves fancy to interweave an intimation that she was a creature whom in her teens the lucklessly smitten even as he was prematurely must vainly sigh for though the work is a masterpiece of execution its merits under this head 
may be emulated at a distance. The lovely modulations of colour in the three contrasted and harmonised little satin petticoats, the solidity of the little heads, in spite of their prettiness, the happy unexaggerated squareness and maturity of pose, are severally points to study, to imitate, and to reproduce with profit. But the taste of such a consummate thing is its great secret, as well as its great merit, a taste which seems one of the lost instincts of mankind. Go and enjoy this supreme expression of Van Dyck's fine sense, and admit that never was a politer production. Milan speaks to us of a burden of felt life of which Turin is innocent, but in its general aspect still lingers a northern reserve, which makes the place rather perhaps the last of the prose capitals than the first of the poetic. The long Austrian occupation perhaps did something to Germanize its physiognomy, though indeed this is an indifferent explanation when one remembers how well temperamentally speaking, Italy held her own in Venetia. Milan, at any rate, if not bristling with the aesthetic impulse, opens to us frankly enough the thick volume of her past. Of that volume the cathedral is the fairest and fullest page, a structure not supremely interesting, not logical, not even to some minds commandingly beautiful, but grandly curious and superbly rich. I hope for my own part never to grow too particular to admire it. If it had no other distinction, it would still have that of impressive immeasurable achievement. As I strolled beside its vast indented base one evening, and felt it above me rear its grey mysteries into the starlight while the restless human tide on which I floated rose no higher than the first few layers of street-soiled marble, I was tempted to believe that beauty in great architecture is almost a secondary merit, and that the main point is mass, such mass as may make it a supreme embodiment of vigorous effort. Viewed in this way, a great building is the greatest conceivable work of art. More than any other, it represents difficulties mastered, resources combined, labour, courage and patience. And there are people who tell us that art has nothing to do with morality. Little enough, doubtless, when it is concerned, even ever so little, in painting the roof of Milan Cathedral within to represent carved stonework. Of this famous roof everyone has heard, how good it is, how bad, how perfect a delusion, how transparent an artifice. It is the first thing your cicerone shows you on entering the church. The occasionally accommodating art lover may accept it philosophically, I think, for the interior, though admirably effective as a whole, has no great sublimity, nor even purity of pitch. It is splendidly vast and dim. Altar lamps twinkle afar through the incensed thickened air like fog lights at sea. And the great columns rise straight to the roof, which hardly curves to meet them with the girth and altitude of oaks of a thousand years. But there is little refinement of design. Few of those felicities of proportion which the eye caresses when it finds them, very much as the memory retains and repeats some happy lines of poetry or some haunting musical phrase. Consistently brave, nonetheless, is the result produced, and nothing braver than a certain exhibition that I privately enjoyed of the relics of St. Charles Borromeus. This holy man lies at his eternal rest in a small but gorgeous sepulchral chapel beneath the boundless pavement and before the high altar, and for the modest sum of five francs you may have his shrivelled mortality unveiled, 
and gaze at it with whatever reserves occur to you. The Catholic Church never renounces a chance of the sublime, for fear of a chance of the ridiculous, especially when the chance of the sublime may be the very excellent chance of five francs. The performance in question, of which the good San Carlo paid in the first instance the cost, was impressive, certainly, but as a monstrous matter or a grim comedy may still be. The little sacristan, having secured his audience, whipped on a white tunic over his frock, lighted a couple of extra candles, and proceeded to remove from above the altar, by means of a crank, a sort of sliding shutter, just as you may see a shop-boy do of a morning at his master's window. In this case, too, a large sheet of plate glass was uncovered, and to form an idea of the étalage, you must imagine that a jeweller, for reasons of his own, has struck up an unnatural partnership with an undertaker. The black, mummified corpse of the saint is stretched out in a glass coffin, clad in his mouldering canonicals, mitred, croziered and gloved, glittering with votive jewels. It is an extraordinary mixture of death and life, the desiccated clay, the ashen rags, the hideous little black mask and skull, and the living, glowing, twinkling splendour of diamonds, emeralds and sapphires. The collection is really fine, and many great historic names are attached to the different offerings. Whatever may be the better opinion as to the future of the church, I can't help thinking she will make a figure in the world as long as she retains this great fund of precious properties, this prodigious capital, decoratively invested and scintillating throughout Christendom at effectively scattered points. You see, I am forced to agree after all, in spite of the sliding shutter and the profane swagger of the sacristan, that a certain pastoral majesty saved the situation or at least made irony gape. Yet it was from a natural desire to breathe a sweeter air that I immediately afterwards undertook the interminable climb to the roof of the cathedral. This is another world of wonders, and one which enjoys due renown. Every square inch of wall on the winding stairways being bescribbled with a traveller's name. There is the great glare from the far-stretching slopes of marble, a confusion like the masts of a navy or the spears of an army of image-capped pinnacles biting the impalpable blue, and better than either, the goodliest view of level Lombardy sleeping in its rich transalpine light, and resembling with its white-walled dwellings and the spires on its horizon a vast green sea spotted with ships. After two months of Switzerland, the Lombard plain is a rich rest to the eye, and the yellow liquid free-flowing light, as if on favoured Italy the vessels of heaven were more widely opened, had for mine a charm which made me think of a great opaque mountain as a blasphemous invasion of the atmospheric spaces. I have mentioned the cathedral first, but the prime treasure of Milan at the present hour is the beautiful, tragical Leonardo. The cathedral is good for another thousand years, but we ask whether our children will find in the most majestic and most luckless of frescoes much more than the shadow of a shadow. Its fame has been for a century or two that, as one may say, of an illustrious invalid whom people visit to see how he lasts with leave-taking sighs and almost deathbed or tiptoe precautions. The picture needs not another scar or stain now to be the saddest work of art in the world, and battered, defaced, ruined as it is, it remains one of the greatest. We may really compare its anguish of decay to the slow, conscious ebb of life in a human organism, the production of the prodigy was a breath from the infinite, 
and the painter's conception not immeasurably less complex than the scheme say of his own mortal constitution there has been much talk lately of the irony of fate but i suspect fate was never more ironical than when she led the most scientific the most calculating of all painters to spend fifteen long years in building his goodly house upon the sand and yet after all may not the playing of that trick represent but a deeper wisdom since if the thing enjoyed the immortal health and bloom of a first-rate titian we should have lost one of the most pertinent lessons in the history of art we know it is a hearsay but here is the plain proof that there is no limit to the amount of stuff an artist may put into his work every painter ought once in his life to stand before the cenacolo and decipher its moral mix your colours and mess on your palate every particle of the very substance of your soul and this lest perchance your prepared surface shall play you a trick then and then only it will fight to the last it will resist even in death raphael was a happier genius you look at his lovely marriage of the version of the brera beautiful as some first deep smile of conscious inspiration but to feel that he foresaw no complaint against fate and that he knew the world he wanted to know and charmed it into never giving him away but i have left no space to speak of the brera nor of that paradise of bookworms with an eye for their background if such creatures exist the ambrosian library nor of the mighty basilica of st ambrose with its spacious atrium and its crudely solemn mosaics in which it is surely your own fault if you don't forget dr strauss and monsieur renan and worship as grimly as a christian of the ninth century it is part of the sordid prose of the mont Cenis road that unlike those fine old unimproved passes the saint Pont, the splugin and yet a while longer the saint gothard it denies you a glimpse of that paradise adorned by the four lakes even as that of uncommented scripture by the rivers of eden i made however an excursion to the lake of como which though brief lasted long enough to suggest to me that i too was a hero of romance with leisure for a love affair and not a hurrying tourist with a bradshaw in his pocket the lake of como has figured largely in novels of immoral tendency being commonly the spot to which inflamed young gentlemen invite the wives of other gentlemen to fly with them and ignore the restrictions of public opinion but even the lake of como has been revised and improved the fondest prejudices yield to time it gives one somehow a sense of an aspiringly high tone i shall pay a poor compliment at least to the swarming inmates of the hotels which now alternate attractively by the waterside with villas old and new were i to read the appearances more cynically but if it is lost to florid fiction it still presents its blue bosom to most other refined uses and the unsophisticated tourist the american at least may do any amount of private romancing there the pretty hotel at cadenabia offers him for instance in the most elegant and assured form the so often precarious adventure of what he calls at home summer board it is all so unreal so fictitious so elegant and idle so framed as to undermine a rigid sense of the chief end of man not being to float forever in an ornamental boat beneath an awning tasselled like a circus horse impelled by an affable giovanni or antonio from one stately stretch of lake laved villa steps to another the departure seems as harsh and unnatural as the dream dispelling note of some punctual voice at your bedside on a dusky winter morning yet i wondered for my own part 
where I had seen it all before. The pink walled villas gleaming through their shrubberies of orange and oleander. The mountain shimmering in the hazy light like so many breasts of doves. The constant presence of the melodious Italian voice. Where indeed but at the opera, when the manager has been more than usually regardless of expense. Here in the foreground was the palace of the nefarious baritone, with its banqueting hall opening as freely on the stage as a railway buffet on the platform. Beyond, the delightful back scene, with its operatic gamut of colour, and in the middle the scarlet sashed bacuioli grouped like a chorus, hat in hand, awaiting the conductor's signal. It was better even than being in a novel, this being, this fairly wallowing, in a libretto. End of section 9《Section 10 of Italian Hours by Henry James. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. The Old St. Gotthard Leaves from a Notebook. Bern, September 1873. In Bern again, some eleven weeks after having left it in July. I have never been in Switzerland so late, and I came hither innocently supposing the last cook's tourist to have paid out his last coupon and departed but i was lucky it seems to discover an empty cot in an attic and a very tight place at a table d'hote people are all flocking out of switzerland as in july they were flocking in and the main channels of egress are terribly choked i have been here several days watching them come and go it is like the march past of an army. It gives one, for an occasional change from darker thoughts, a lively impression of the numbers of people now living, and above all now moving, at extreme ease in the world. Here is little Switzerland disgorging its tens of thousands of honest folk, chiefly English, and rarely to judge by their faces and talk, children of light in any eminent degree, for whom snow peaks and glaciers and passes and lakes and chalets and sunset and a café complet, including honey, as the coupon says, have become prime necessities for six weeks every year. It's not so long ago that lords and nabobs monopolised these pleasures, but nowadays a month's tour in Switzerland is no more a jeu de prince than a Sunday excursion. To watch this huge Anglo-Saxon wave ebbing through Bern suggests, no doubt fallaciously, that the common lot of mankind isn't, after all, so very hard, and that the masses have reached a high standard of comfort. A view of the Oberland chain, as you see it from the garden of the hotel, really butters one's bread most handsomely. And here are, I don't know how many hundred cooks, tourists a day, looking at it through the smoke of their pipes. Is it really the masses, however, that I see every day at the table d'hôte? They have rather too few H's to the dozen, but their good nature is great. Some people complain that they vulgarise Switzerland. But as far as I am concerned, I freely give it up to them and offer them a personal welcome, and take a peculiar satisfaction in seeing them here. Switzerland is a show country. I am more and more struck with the bearings of that truth, and its use in the world is to reassure persons of a benevolent imagination when they begin to wish for the trudging millions a greater supply of elevating amusement. Here is amusement for a thousand years and as elevating, certainly, as mountains three miles high can make it. I expect to live to see the summit of Monte Rosa heated by steam tubes, and adorned with a hotel sitting three tub d'eau a day. I have been walking about the arcades, which used to be so a grateful shade in July, but which seem rather dusky and chilly in these shortening autumn days, I am struck with the way the English always speak of them, with shudder, 
as gloomy, as dirty, as evil-smelling, as suffocating, as freezing, as anything and everything but admirably picturesque. I take us Americans for the only people who, in travelling, judge things on the first impulse, when we do judge them at all, not from the standpoint of simple comfort. Most of us, strolling forth into these bustling basements, are, I imagine, too much amused, too much diverted with a sense of an alienable right to public ease, to be conscious of heat and cold, of thick air, or even of the universal smell of strong charcuterie. If the visible romantic were banished from the face of the earth, I am sure the idea of it would still survive in some typical American heart. Lucerne, September. Bern, I find, has been filling with tourists at the expense of Lucerne, which I have been having almost to myself. There are six people at the table d'hôte. The excellent dinner denotes on the part of the chef the easy leisure in which true artists love to work. The waiters have nothing to do but lounge about the hall and chink in their pockets the fees of the past season. The day has been lovely in itself and pervaded to my sense by the gentle glow of a natural satisfaction at finding myself again on the threshold of Italy. I am lodged en prince in a room with a balcony overhanging the lake, a balcony on which I spent a long time this morning at dawn thanking the mountain tops from the depths of a landscape lover's heart for their promise of superbly fair weather. There were a great many mountain tops to thank, for the crags and peaks and pinnacles tumbled away through the morning mist in an endless confusion of grandeur. I have been all day in better humour with Lucerne than ever before. A forecast reflection of Italian moods. If Switzerland, as I wrote the other day, is so furiously a show place, Lucerne is certainly one of the biggest booths at the fair. The little quay under the trees squeezed in between the decks of the steamboats and the doors of the hotels is a terrible medley of Saxon dialects, a jumble of pilgrims in all the phases of devotion equipped with book and staff, alpenstock and bydecker. There are so many hotels and trinket shops, so many omnibuses and steamers, so many Saint-Gothard Venterini, so many ragged urchins poking photographs, minerals and Lucianese English at you, that you feel as if the lake and mountains themselves in all their loveliness were but a part of the enterprise of landlords and peddlers, and half expect to see the Ricci and Pilatus and the fine weather vigorous items on your hotel bill between the bougie and the siphon. Nature herself assists you to this conceit. There is something so operatic and suggestive of footlights and scene shifters in the view on which Lucerne looks out. You are one of five thousand, fifty thousand accommodated spectators. You have taken your season ticket, and there is a responsible impresario somewhere behind the scenes. There is such a luxury of beauty in the prospect, such a redundancy of composition and effect, so many more peaks and pinnacles than are needed to make one heart happy, or regale the vision of one quiet observer, that you finally accept the little babel on the quay and the looming masses in the clouds as equal parts of a perfect system, and feel as if the mountains had been waiting so many ages for the hotels to come and balance the colossal group, that they show a right, after all, to have them, big and numerous. The scene shifters have been at work all day long, composing and discomposing the beautiful background of the prospect, massing the clouds and scattering the light, effacing and reviving making play with their wonderful machinery of mist and haze. The mountains rise, one behind the other, in an enchanting gradation of distances and of melting blues and greys. You think each successive tone the loveliest and haziest possible till you see another loom dimly behind it. 
I couldn't enjoy even the Swiss Times over my breakfast till I had marched forth to the office of the Saint Gotthard service of coaches and demanded the banquette for tomorrow. The one place at the disposal of the office was taken, but I might possibly m'entendre with the conductor for his own seat, the conductor being generally visible in the intervals of business at the post office. To the post office after breakfast I repaired over the fine new bridge, which now spans the Reuss and gives such a woeful air of country cousinship to the crooked old wooden structure which did sole service when I was here four years ago. The old bridge is covered with a running hood of shingles and adorned with a series of very quaint and vivid little paintings of the dance of death, quite in the Holbein manner. The new sends up a painful glare from its white limestone and is ornamented with candelabra in a meretricious imitation of platinum. As an almost professional cherisher of the quaint, I ought to have chosen to return at least by the dark and narrow way, but mark how luxury unmans us. I was already demoralised. I crossed the threshold of the timbered portal, took a few steps and retreated. It smelt badly. So I marched back, counting the lamps in their fine falsity. But the other, the crooked and covered way, smelt very badly indeed. And no good American is without a fund of accumulated sensibility to the odour of stale timber. Meantime, I had spent an hour in the great yard of the post office, waiting for my conductor to turn up, and seeing the yellow mal post pushed to and fro. At last, being told my man was at my service, I was brought to speech of a huge, jovial, bearded, delightful Italian, clad in the blue coat and waistcoat with close, round silver buttons, which are the heritage of the old postilions. No, it was not he. It was a friend of his. And finally, the friend was produced, en costume de vie, but equally jovial, and Italian enough, a brave Lucianese, who had spent half of his life between Bellinzona and Camelada. For ten francs, this worthy man's perch behind the luggage was made mine as far as Bellinzona, and we separated with reciprocal wishes for good weather on the morrow. Tomorrow was so manifestly determined to be as fine as any other 30th of September, since the weather became on this planet a topic of conversation, that I've had nothing to do but stroll about Lucerne, staring, loafing, and vaguely intent on regarding the fact that, whatever happens, my place is paid to Milan. I loafed into the immense new Hotel National and read the New York Tribune on a blue satin divan, after which I was rather surprised on coming out to find myself staring at a green Swiss lake and not at the Broadway omnibuses. The Hotel National is adorned with a perfectly appointed Broadway bar, one of the prohibited ones, seeking hospitality in foreign lands after the manner of an old-fashioned French or Italian refugee. Milan, October My journey hither was such a pleasant piece of traveller's luck that I feel a delicacy for taking it to pieces to see what it was made of. Do what we will, however, there remains in all deeply agreeable impressions a charming something we can't analyse. I found it agreeable even, given the rest of my case, to turn out of bed at Lucerne by four o'clock into the chilly autumn darkness. The thick starred sky was cloudless, and there was as yet no flush of dawn, but the lake was wrapped in a ghostly white mist which crept halfway up the mountains and made them look as if they too had been lying down for the night and were casting away the vaporous tissues of their bedclothes. Into this fantastic bog the little steamer went creaking away, and I hung about the deck with the two or three travellers who had known better than to believe it would save them francs or midnight sighs over those steps you pay with your person to go and wait for the diligence at the Poste de Pluellen, or yet at the Guillaume Tell. The dawn came sailing up over the mountain tops, flushed but unperturbed, 
and blew out the little stars and then the big ones, as a thrifty matron after a party blows out her candles and lamps. The mist went melting and wandering away into the duskier hollows and recesses of the mountains, and the summits defined their profiles against the cool, soft light. At Flewellen, before the landing, the big yellow coaches were actively making themselves bigger and piling up boxes and bags on their roofs in a way to turn nervous people's thoughts to the sharp corners of the downward twists of the great road. I climbed into my own banquet and stood eating peaches. Half a dozen women were hawking them about under the horse's legs with an air of security that might have been offensive to the people scrambling and protesting below between coupe and antérieur. They were all English, and all had false alarms about the claim of somebody else to their place, the place for which they produced their ticket, with a declaration in three or four different tongues of the inalienable right to it given them by the expenditure of British gold. They were all serenely confuted by the stout, purple-faced, many-buttoned conductors, patted on the backs, assured that their bath tubs had every advantage of position on the top, and stowed away according to their dues. When once one has fairly started on a journey and has but to go and go by the impetus received, it is surprising what entertainment one finds in very small things. We surrender to the gaping traveller's mood, which surely isn't the unwisest the heart knows. I don't envy people at any rate who have outlived or outworn the simple sweetness of feeling settled to go somewhere with a bag and umbrella. If we were settled on the top of the coach and the somewhere contains an element of the new and strange, the case is at its best. In this matter, wise people are content to become children again. We don't turn about on our knees to look out of the omnibus window, but we indulge in very much the same round-eyed contemplation of accessible objects. Responsibility is left at home, or at the worst, packed away in the valise, relegated to quite another part of the diligence with the clean shirts and the writing case. I sucked in the gladness of gaping for this occasion with the somewhat acrid juice of my indifferent peaches. It made me think them very good. This was the first of a series of kindly services it rendered me. It made me agree next, as we started, that the gentleman at the booking office at Lucerne had but played a harmless joke when he told me that the regular seat in the banquet was taken. No one appeared to claim it. So the conductor and I reversed positions, and I found him quite as conversable as the usual Anglo-Saxon. He was trolling snatches of melody and showing his great yellow teeth in a jovial grin all the way to Bellinzona, and this in face of the sombre fact that the St. Gotthard Tunnel is scraping away into the mountain, all the while under his nose and numbering the days of the many-buttoned brotherhood. But he hopes for long services' sake, to be taken into the employ of the railway. He, at least, is no cherisher of quaintness and has no romantic perversity. I found the railway coming on, however, in a manner very shocking to mine. About an hour short of Andermatt, they have pierced a huge black cavity in the mountain, around which has grown up a swarming, digging, hammering, smoke-compelling colony. There are great barracks with tall chimneys down in the gorge that bristled the other day, but with natural graces, and a wonderful increase of wine shops in the little village of Gershingen above. Along the breast of the mountain, beside the road, come wandering several miles of very handsome iron pipes of a stupendous girth, a conjured for the water power with which some of the machinery is worked. It lies at its mighty length among the rocks like an immense black serpent and serves as a mere detail to give one the measure of the central enterprise. When at the end of our long day's journey, well down in warm Italy, we came upon the other aperture of the tunnel, I could but uncap 
with a grim reverence. Truly nature is great, but she seems to me to stand in very much the shoes of my poor friend the conductor. She is being superseded at her strongest points successively, and nothing remains but for her to take humble service with her master. If she can hear herself think amid that din of blasting and hammering, she must be reckoning up the years to elapse before the cleverest of Aubert Ingenieurs decides that mountains are mere obstructive matter, and has the Jungfrau melted down and the residium carried away in balloons and dumped upon another planet. The Devil's Bridge with the same failing apparently as the good Homer, was decidedly nodding. The volume of water in the torrent was shrunken, and I missed the thunderous uproar and far-leaping spray that have kept up a miniature tempest in the neighbourhood on my other passages. It suddenly occurs to me that the fault is not in the good Homer's inspiration, but simply in the big black pipes above mentioned. They dip into the rushing stream higher up, presumably, and pervert its fine frenzy to their prosaic uses. There could hardly be a more vivid reminder of the standing quarrel between use and beauty, and of the hard time poor beauty is having. I looked wistfully as we rattled into dreary Andermatt, with the great white zigzags of the Oberalp road which climbed away to the left. Even on one's way to Italy one may spare a throb of desire for the beautiful vision of the castled Grisson. Dear to me the memory of the day's drive last summer through that long blue avenue of mountains to queer little mouldering illans visited before supper in the ghostly dusk. At Andermatt a sign over a little black doorway flanked by two dunghills seemed to me tolerably comical. Mineraux, quadruped, Oiseau, oeuf, tableau antique. We bundled in to dinner, and the American gentleman in the banquette made the acquaintance of the Irish lady in the coupe, who talked of the weather as foin, and wore a Persian scarf twisted about her head. At the other end of the table sat an Englishman out of the interieur, who bore an extraordinary resemblance to the portraits of Edward the Sixth and Mary's reigns. He was a walking, a convincing Holbein. The impression was of value to a cherisher of quaintness, and he must have wondered, not knowing me for such a character, why I stared at him. It wasn't him I was staring at, but some handsome Seymour or Dudley or Digby, with a ruff and a round cap and plume. From Andermatt, through its high, cold, sunny valley, we passed into a rugged little Ospental, and then up the last stages of the ascent. From here the road was all new to me. Among the summits of the various alpine passes there is little to choose. You wind and double slowly into keener cold and deeper stillness. You put on your overcoat and turn up the collar. You count the nestling snow patches and then you cease to count them. You pause as you trudge before the lumbering coach and listen to the last heard cowbell tinkling away below you in kindlier herbage. The sky was tremendously blue, and the little stunted bushes on the snow-streaked slopes were all dyed with autumnal purples and crimsons. It was a great display of colour. Purple and crimson, too, though not so fine, but the faces thrust darted us from the greasy little double casements of a barrack beside the road, where the horses paused before the last pull. There was one little girl in particular, beginning to lisse her hair as civilization approached, in a manner not to be described, with her poor little blue-black hands. At the summit, of the two usual grim little stone taverns, the steel-blue tarn, the snow-white peaks, the paws in the cold sunshine. Then we begin to rattle down with two horses. In five minutes we are swinging along the famous zigzags. Engineer, driver, horses. It's very handsomely done by all of them. 
the road curves and curls and twists and plunges like the tail of a kite. Sitting perched in the banquette, you see it making below you, and in mid-air, certain bold gyrations which bring you as near as possible, short of the actual experience, to the philosophy of that immortal Irishman who wished that his fall from the housetop would only last. But the zigzags last no more than Paddy's fall, and in due time we were all coming to our senses over Café au lait in the little inn at Fido. After Fido, the valley, plunging deeper, began to take thick afternoon shadows from the hills, and at Erolo we were fairly in the twilight. But the pink and yellow houses shimmered through the gentle gloom, and Italy began in broken syllables to whisper that she was at hand. For the rest of the way to Bellinzona, her voice was muffled in the grey of evening, and I was half vexed to lose the charming sight of the changing vegetation. But only half vexed, for the moon was climbing all the while nearer the edge of the crags that overshadowed us, and a thin magical light came trickling down into the winding, murmuring gorges. It was a most enchanting business. The chestnut trees loomed up with double their daylight stature. The vines began to swing their low festoons like nets to trip up the fairies. At last, the ruined towers of Balanzona stood gleaming in the moonshine, and we rattled into the great postyard. It was eleven o'clock, and I had risen at four. Moonshine apart, I wasn't sorry. All that was very well. But the drive next day from Bellinzona to Como is, to my mind, what gives its supreme beauty to this great pass. One can't describe the beauty of the Italian lakes, nor would one try if one could. The floweriest rhetoric can recall it only as a picture on a fireboard recalls a cloud. But it lay spread before me for a whole perfect day. In the long gleam of the major, from whose head the diligence swerves away and begins to climb the bosky hills that divide it from Lugano, in the shimmering, melting azure of the southern slopes and masses, in the luxurious tangle of nature and the familiar amenity of man, in the lawn-like inclinations where the great group chestnuts make so cool a shadow and so warm a light, in the rusty vineyards, the littered cornfields, and the tawdry wayside shrines. But most of all, it's the deep yellow light that enchants you and tells you where you are. See it come filtering down through a vine-covered trellis on the red handkerchief with which a ragged contadina has bound her hair, and all the magic of Italy to the eye makes an aureole about the poor girl's head. Look at the brown-breasted reaper eating his chunk of black bread under a spreading chestnut. Nowhere is shadow so charming. Nowhere is colour so charged. Nowhere has accident such grace. The whole drive to Lugano was one long loveliness, and the town itself is admirably Italian. There was a great unlading of the coach, during which I wandered under certain brown old arcades and bought for six sous from a young woman in a gold necklace a hat full of peaches and figs. When I came back, I found the young man holding open the door of the second diligence, which had lately come up, and beckoning to me with a despairing smile. The young man, I must note, was the most amiable of Ticinese. Though he wore no buttons, he was attached to the diligence in some amorish capacity at had an eye to the mail-bags and other valuables in the boot. I grumbled at Byrne over the want of soft curves in the Swiss temperament, but the children of the tangled Tessin are cast in the Italian mould. My friend had as many quips and cranks as a Neapolitan. We walked together for an hour under the chestnuts while the coach was plodding up from Bellinzona, and he never stopped singing till we reached a little wine-house where he got his mouth full of bread and cheese. I looked into his open door, a la stern, 
and saw the young woman sitting rigid and grim, staring over his head with a great pile of bread and butter in her lap. He had only informed her most politely that she was to be transferred to another diligence and must do him the favour to descend. But she evidently knew of but one way for a respectable young insulary of her sex to receive the politeness of a foreign adventurer, guilty of an eye betraying latent pleasantry. Heaven only knew what he was saying. I told her, and she gathered up her parcels and emerged. A part of the day's great pleasure, perhaps, was my grave sense of being an instrument in the hands of the powers toward the safe consignment of this young woman and her boxes. When once you have really bent to the helpless, you are caught. There is no such steel trap, and it holds you fast. My rather grim Abigail was a neophyte in foreign travel, though doubtless cunning enough at her trade, which I inferred to be that of making up those prodigious chignons worn mainly by English ladies. Her mistress had gone on a mule over the mountains to Cardenabia, and she herself was coming up with the wardrobe, two big boxes and a bathtub. I had played my part under the powers of Balanzona, and had interposed between the poor girl's frightened English and the dreadful Ticinese French of the functionaries in the postyard. At the custom house on the Italian frontier I was of peculiar service. There was a kind of fateful fascination in it. The wardrobe was voluminous. I exchanged a paternal glance with my charge as a douanier plunged his brown fists into it. Who was the lady at Caranabia? What was she to me or I to her? She wouldn't know when she rustled down to dinner next day that it was I who had guided the frail skiff of her public basis of vanity to port. So unseen, but not unfelt, do we cross each other's orbits? The skiff, however, may have foundered that evening in sight of land. I disengaged the young woman from among her fellow travellers and placed her boxes on a handcart in the picturesque streets of Como, within a stone's throw of that lovely, striped and toned cathedral, which has the facade of cameo medallions. I could only make the facchino swear to take her to the steamboat. He, too, was a jovial dog, but I hope he was polite with precautions. 1873. End of section 10. Section 11 of Italian Hours by Henry James. This is a LibriVox recording, or LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Italy Revisited, Part 1. I waited in Paris until after the elections for the new chamber. They took place on the 14th of October. As only after one has learned that the famous attempt of Marshal Mamahorn and his ministers to drive the French nation to the poles like a flock of huddling sheep, each with the white ticket of an official candidate round his neck, had not achieved the success which the energy of the process might have promised. Only then it was possible to draw a long breath and deprived the Republican Party of such support as might have been conveyed in one's sympathetic presence. Seriously speaking, too, the weather had been enchanting. There were Italian fancies to be gathered without leaving the banks of the Seine. Day after day the air was filled with golden light, and even those chalkish vistas of the Parisian Bocatier assumed the iridescent tints of autumn, Autumn weather in Europe is often such a very sorry affair that a fair-minded American will have it on his conscience to call attention to a rainless and radiant October. The echoes of the electoral strife kept me company for a while after starting upon that abbreviated journey to Turin, which, as you leave Paris at night, in a train unprovided with encouragements to slumber, is a singular mixture of the odious and the charming. The charming, indeed, I think, prevails, for the dark half of the journey is the least interesting. The morning light ushers you into the romantic gorges of the Jura, 
and after a big bowl of café au lait at Kulos, you may compose yourself comfortably for the climax of your spectacle. The day before leaving Paris, I met a French friend who had just returned from a visit to a Tuscan country seat where he had been watching the vintage. Italy, he said, is more lovely than words can tell, and France, steeped in this electoral turmoil, seems no better than a bear garden. The part of the bear garden through which you travel as you approach the Mont Cenis seemed to me that day very beautiful. The autumn colouring, thanks to the absence of rain, had been vivid and crisp, and the vines that swung their low garlands between the mulberries round about Chambéry looked like long festoons of coral and amber. The frontier station at Mordun, on the further side of the Mont Cenis tunnel, is a very ill-regulated place, but even the most irritable of tourists meeting it on his way southward will be disposed to consider it good-naturedly. There is far too much bustling and scrambling, and the facilities afforded to you for the obligatory process of ripping open your luggage before the offices of the Italian Custom House are much scantier than should be. But for myself, there is something that deprecates irritation in the shabby green and grey uniforms of all the Italian officials who stand loafing about and watching the northern invaders scramble back into marching order. Wearing an administrative uniform doesn't necessarily spoil a man's temper, as in France one is sometimes led to believe, for these excellent underpaid Italians carry theirs as lightly as possible, and their answers to your inquiries don't in the least bristle with rapiers, buttons and cockades. After leaving Mordan, you slide straight downhill into the Italy of your desire, from which point the road edges after the grand manor along those great precipices that stand shoulder to shoulder in a prodigious perpendicular file till they finally admit you to a distant glimpse of the ancient capital of Piedmont. Turin is no city of a name to conjure with, and I pay an extravagant tribute to subjective emotion in speaking of it as ancient. But if the place is less bravely peninsular than Florence and Rome, at least it is more in the scenic tradition than New York and Paris. And while I paced the great arcades and looked at the fourth-rate shop windows, I didn't scruple to cultivate a shameless optimism. Relatively speaking, Durin touches a chord, but there is, after all, no reason in a large collection of shabbily stuccoed houses, disposed in a rigidly rectangular manner, for passing a day of deep, still gaiety. The only reason, I am afraid, is the old superstition of Italy. That property in the very look of the written word, the evocation of myriad images that makes any lover of the arts take Italian satisfactions on easier terms than any others. The written word stands for something that eternally tricks us. We juggle to our credulity even with such inferior apparatus as is offered to our hand at Turin. I roamed all the morning under the tall porticos, thinking it sufficient joy to take note of the soft warm air, of that local colour of things, that is at once so broken and so harmonious, and of the comings and goings, the physiognomy and manners of the excellent Turanese. I had opened the old book again. The old charm was in the style. I was in a more delightful world. I saw nothing surpassingly beautiful or curious, but your true taste of the most seasoned of dishes finds well nigh the whole mixture in any mouthful. Above all, on the threshold of Italy, he knows again the solid and perfectly definable pleasure of finding himself among the traditions of the grand style in architecture. It must be said that we have still to go there to recover the sense of the domiciliary mass. 
In northern cities there are beautiful houses, picturesque and curious houses, sculptured gables that hang over the street, charming bay windows, hooded doorways, elegant proportions and a profusion of delicate ornament. But a good specimen of an old Italian palazzo has a nobleness that is all its own. We laugh at Italian palaces, at their peeling paint, their nudity, their dreariness, but they have the great palatial quality, elevation and extent. And they make of smaller things the apparent abode of pygmies. They round their great arches and interspace their huge windows with a proud indifference to the cost of materials. These grand proportions, the colossal basements, the doorways that seem meant for cathedrals, the faraway cornices, in part by contrast to humble and bourgeois expression to interiors founded on the sacrifice of the whole to the part, and in which the air of grandeur depends largely on the help of the upholsterer. At Turin, my first feeling was really one of renewed shame for our meaner architectural manners. If the Italians at bottom despise the rest of mankind and regard them as barbarians, disinherited of the tradition of form, the idea proceeds largely, no doubt, from our living in comparative molehills. They alone were ready to build their civilization. An impression which, on coming back to Italy, I find even stronger than when it was first received, is that of the contrast between the fecundity of the great artistic period and the vulgarity there of the genius of today. The first few hours spent on Italian soil are sufficient to renew it, and the question I allude to is, historically speaking, one of the oddest. That the people who but three hundred years ago had the best taste in the world should now have the worst. That having produced the noblest, loveliest, costliest works, they should now be given up to the manufacture of objects at once ugly and paltry that the race of which Michelangelo and Raphael, Leonardo and Titian were characteristic, should have no other title to distinction than third-rate genre pictures and catchpenny statues. All this is a frequent perplexity to the observer of actual Italian life. The flower of great art in these latter years ceased to bloom very powerfully anywhere, but nowhere does it seem so drooping and withered as in the shadow of the immortal embodiments of the old Italian genius. You go into a church or a gallery and feast your fancy upon a splendid picture or an exquisite piece of sculpture, and on issuing from the door that has submitted you to the beautiful past, are confronted with something that has the effect of a very bad joke. The aspect of your lodging, the carpets, the curtains, the upholstery in general, with the crude and violent colouring and their vulgar material, the trumpery things in the shops, the extreme bad taste of the dress of the women, the cheapness and baseness of every attempt at decoration in the cafes and railway stations, the hopeless frivolity of everything that pretends to be a work of art, all this modern crudity runs riot over the relics of the great period. We can do a thing for the first time but once. It is but once for all that we can have a pleasure in its freshness. This is a law not on the whole, I think, to be regretted, for we sometimes learn to know things better by not enjoying them too much. It is certain, however, at the same time, that a visitor who has worked off the immediate ferment for this inexhaustibly interesting country has by no means entirely drained the cup not to thinking of Italy as historical and artistic, it will do him no great harm to think of her for a while as panting both for a future and for a balance at the bank. Aspirations supposedly much at variance with the Byronic, the Ruskinian, the artistic, poetic, aesthetic manner of considering our eternally attaching peninsula. He may grant... I don't say it is absolutely necessary, that its actual aspects and economics are ugly, prosaic, 
provoking me out of relation to the diary and the album. It is nevertheless true that at the point things have come to, modern Italy in a manner imposes herself. I hadn't been many hours in the country before that truth assailed me, and I may add that the first irritation passed, I found myself able to accept it. For if we think, nothing is more easy to understand than an honest ire on the part of the young Italy of today had been looked at by all the world as a kind of soluble pigment. Young Italy, preoccupied with its economical and political future, must be heartily tired of being admired for its eyelashes and its pose. In one of Thackeray's novels occurs a mention of a young artist who sent to the Royal Academy a picture representing a contadino dancing with a trastevarina at the door of a locanda to the music of a piferaro. It is this attitude and with these conventional accessories that the world has hitherto seen fit to represent young Italy. And one doesn't wonder that if the youth has any spirit, he should at last begin to resent our insufferable aesthetic patronage. He has established a line of tram cars in Rome, from the Porta del Popolo to the Ponte Molle, and it is one of these democratic vehicles that I seem to see him taking his triumphant course down the vista of the future. I won't pretend to rejoice with him any more than I really do, I won't pretend, as the sentimental tourists say about it all, as if it were the setting of an Italia or the border of a Roman scarf, to like it. Like it or not, as we may, it is evidently destined to be. I see a new Italy in the future which in many important respects will equal, if not surpass, the most enterprising sections of our native land. Perhaps by that time, Chicago and San Francisco will have acquired a pose, and their sons and daughters will dance at the doors of the Locande. However this may be, the accomplished schism between the old order and the new is the promptest moral of a fresh visit to this ever-suggested part of the world. The old has become more and more a museum, preserved and perpetuated in the midst of the new, but without any further relation to it, it must be admitted, indeed, that such a relation is considerable, than that of the stock on his shelves to the shopkeeper, or of the siren of the south to the showman who stands before his booth. More than once, as we move about nowadays in the Italian cities, there seems to pass before our eyes a vision of the coming years. It represents to our satisfaction an Italy united and prosperous, but altogether scientific and commercial. The Italy, indeed, that we sentimentalise and romance about was an ardently mercantile country. Though I suppose it loved not its ledgers less, but its frescoes and altarpieces more. Scattered through this paradise regained of trade, this country of a thousand ports, we see a large number of beautiful buildings in which the endless series of Dusky pictures are darkening, dampening, fading, failing through the years. By the doors of the beautiful buildings are little turnstiles at which there sit a great many uniformed men to whom the visitor pays a tenpenny fee. Inside, in the vaulted and frescoed chambers, the art of Italy lies buried as in a thousand mausoleums. It is well taken care of. It is constantly copied. Sometimes it is restored, as in the case of that beautiful boy figure of Andrea del Sarto at Florence, which may be seen at the gallery of the Uffizi with its honourable duskiness quite peeled off, and heaven knows what raw, bleeding cuticle laid bare. One evening lately, near the same Florence, in the soft twilight, I took a stroll among those encircling hills on which the mass of villas are mingled with the vaporous olives, Presently, I arrived where three roads met at a wayside shrine, in which before some pious daub of an old-time Madonna, a little votive lamp glimmered through the evening air. The hour, the atmosphere, the place, the twinkling taper, the sentiment of the observer, the thought that 
someone had been rescued here from an assassin or from some other peril and had set up a little grateful altar in consequence against the yellow plaster ball of a tangled podere all this led me to approach the shrine with a reverent and emotional step i drew near it but after a few steps i paused i became aware of an incongruous odour it seemed to me that the evening air was charged with a perfume which though to a certain extent familiar had not hitherto associated itself with rustic frescoes and wayside altars i wondered i gently sniffed and the question so put left me no doubt the odour was that of petroleum the boat of taper was nourished with the essence of pennsylvania i confess that i burst out laughing and a picturesque contadino wending his way homeward in the dusk stared at me as if i were an iconoclast he noticed the petroleum only i imagined to snuff it fondly up but to me the thing served as a symbol of the italy of the future there is a horse car from the porta del popolo to the ponte molle and the tuscan shrines are fed with kerosene two if it is very well meanwhile to come to turin first it is better still to go to genoa afterwards genoa is the tightest topographic tangle in the world which even a second visit helps you little to straighten out in the wonderful crooked twisting climbing soaring burrowing genoese alleys the traveller is really up to his neck in the old italian sketchability the pride of the place i believe is a port of great capacity and the bequest of the late duke of galliera who left four million of dollars for the purpose of improving and enlarging it will doubtless do much towards converting it into one of the great commercial stations of europe but as after leaving my hotel the afternoon i arrived i wandered for a long time at hazard through the tortuous byways of the city i said to myself not without an accent of private triumph that here at last was something it would be almost impossible to modernize i had found my hotel in the first place extremely entertaining the croce di malta as it is called established in a gigantic palace on the edge of the swarming and not over clean harbour it was the biggest house i had ever entered the basement alone would have contained a dozen american caravanserais i met an american gentleman in the vestibule who as he had indeed a perfect right to be was annoyed by its troublesome dimensions one was a quarter of an hour ascending out of the basement and desired to know if it were a fair sample of the genoese inns it appeared an excellent specimen of genoese architecture generally so far as i observed there were few houses perceptibly smaller than this titanic tavern i lunched in a dusky ballroom whose ceiling was vaulted frescoed and gilded with the fatal facility of a couple of centuries ago and which looked out upon another ancient house front equally huge and equally battered separated from it only by a little wedge of dusky space one of the principal streets i believe of genoa whence out of dim abysses the population sent up to the windows i had to crane out very far to see it a perpetual clattering shuffling chaffering sound issuing forth presently into this crevice of a street i found myself up to my neck in that element of the rich and strange as to the visible and reproducible effect i mean for the love of which one revisits italy it offered itself indeed in a variety of colours some of which were not remarkable for their freshness or purity but their combined charm was not to be resisted and the picture glowed with the rankly human side of southern low life genoa as i have hinted is the crookedest and most incoherent of cities tossed about on the sides and crests of a dozen hills it is seamed with gullies and ravines that bristle with those innumerable palaces for which 
we have heard from our earliest years that the place is celebrated. These great structures, with their mottled and faded complexions, lift their big ornamental cornices to a tremendous height in the air, where, in a certain indescribably forlorn and desolate fashion overtopping each other, they seem to reflect the twinkle and glitter of the warm Mediterranean. Down in the basements, in the close crepuscular alleys, the people are forever moving to and fro, or standing in their cavernous doorways in their dusky crowded shops, calling, chattering, laughing, lamenting, living their lives in the conversational Italian fashion. I had for a long time had no such vision of possible social pressure. I hadn't for a long time seen people elbowing each other so closely or swarming so thickly out of populous hives. A traveller is often moved to ask himself whether it has been worth while to leave his home, whatever his home may have been, only to encounter new forms of human suffering, only to be reminded that toil and privation, hunger and sorrow and sordid effort are the portion of the mass of mankind. To travel is, as it were, to go to the play, to attend a spectacle. And there is something heartless in stepping forth into foreign streets to feast on character, when character consists simply of the slightly different costume in which labour and want present themselves. These reflections were forced upon me as I strolled as through a twilight patched with colour and charged with stale smells, but after a time they ceased to bear me company. The reason of this, I think, is because, at least to foreign eyes, the sum of Italian misery is on the whole less than the sum of the Italian knowledge of life. That people should thank you with a smile of striking sweetness for the gift of tuppence is a proof certainly of extreme and constant destitution, but keeping in mind the sweetness it also attests to an enviable ability not to be depressed by circumstances. I know that this may possibly be great nonsense, that half the time we are reclaiming the fine quality of the Italian smile, the creature so constituted for physiognomic radiance may be in a sullen frenzy of impatience and pain. Our observation in any foreign land is extremely superficial, and our remarks are happily not addressed to the inhabitants themselves, who will be sure to exclaim upon the impudence of the fancy picture. The other day I visited a very picturesque old city upon a mountain top, where in the course of my wanderings I arrived at an old disused gate in the ancient town wall. The gate hadn't been absolutely forfeited, but the recent completion of a modern road down the mountain led most vehicles away to another egress. The grass-grown pavement, which wound into the plain by a hundred graceful twists and plunges, was now given up to the ragged contadini and their donkeys, and to such wayfarers as were not alarmed at the disrepair into which it had fallen. I stood in the shadow of the tall old gateway admiring the scene, looking to right and left at the wonderful walls of the little town, perched on the edge of a shaggy precipice, at the circling mountains over against them, at the road dipping downward among the chestnuts and olives. There was no one within sight but a young man who slowly trudged upward with his coat slung over his shoulder and his hat upon his ear in the manner of a cavalier in an opera. Like the operatic performer, too, he sang as he came. The spectacle generally was operatic. And as his vocal flourishes reached my ear, I said to myself that in Italy, accident was always romantic, and that such a figure had been exactly what was wanted to set off the landscape. It suggested in a high degree that knowledge of life for which I had just now commended the Italians. I was turning back under the old gateway when the young man overtook me and, suspending his song, asked me if I could favour him with a match to light the hoarded remnant of a cigar. This request led, as I took my way again to the inn, to my falling into talk with him. 
he was a native of the ancient city and answered freely all my inquiries as to its manners and customs and its note of public opinion but the point of my anecdote is that he presently acknowledged himself a brooding young radical and communist filled with hatred of the present Italian government, raging with discontent and crude political passion, professing a ridiculous hope that Italy would soon have as France had had her 89, and declaring that he for his part would willingly lend a hand to chop off the heads of the king and the royal family. He was an unhappy, underfed, unemployed young man, who took a hard, grim view of everything and was operatic only quite in spite of himself. This made it very absurd of me to have looked at him simply as a graceful ornament to the prospect, an harmonious little figure in the middle distance. Damn the prospect, damn the middle distance, would have been all his philosophy. Yet, but for the accident of my having gossiped with him, I should have made him do service in memory as an example of sensuous optimism. I am bound to say, however, that I believe a great deal of the sensuous optimism observable in the Genoese alleys and beneath the low crowded arcades along the port was very real. Here everyone was magnificently sunburnt, and there were plenty of those queer types, mahogany-coloured, bare-chested mariners with earrings and crimson girdles, that seemed to people a southern seaport with the chorus of Massaniello. But it is not fair to speak as if at Genoa there were nothing but low life to be seen, for the place is the residence of some of the grandest people in the world. Nor are all the palaces ranged upon dusky alleys. The handsomest and most impressive form a splendid series on each side of a couple of very proper streets, in which there is plenty of room for a coach and four to approach the big doorways. Many of these doorways are open, revealing great marble staircases with couchant lions for balustrades and ceremonious courts surrounded by walls of sun-softened yellow. One of the great piles in the array is coloured a goodly red and contains in particular the grand people I just now spoke of. They live indeed on the third floor, but here they have suites of wonderful painted and gilded chambers, in which foreshortened frescoes also cover the vaulted ceilings and florid mouldings emboss the ample walls. These distinguished tenants bear the name of Van Dyck, though they are members of the noble family of Brignole Sale, one of whose children, the Duchess of Galliera, has lately given proof of nobleness in presenting the gallery of the Red Palace to the city of Genoa. End of section 11. Section 12 of Italian Hours by Henry James. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Italy Revisited, Part 2. 3. On leaving Genoa, I repaired to Spezia chiefly with the view of accomplishing a sentimental pilgrimage, which I in fact achieved in the most agreeable conditions. The Gulf of Spezia is now the headquarters of the Italian fleet, and there were several big iron-plated frigates riding at anchor in front of the town. The streets were filled with lads in blue flannel who were receiving instruction at a school ship in the harbour, and in the evening there was a brilliant moon, the little breakwater which stretched out into the Mediterranean offered a scene of recreation to innumerable such persons. But this fact is, from the point of view of the cherisher of quaintness, of little account. For since it has become prosperous, Spezia has grown ugly. The place is filled with long, dull stretches of dead wall and great raw expanses of artificial land. It wears that look of monstrous, of more than far western newness, which distinguishes all the creations of the young Italian state. Nor did I find any great compensation in an immense inn of recent birth, 
an establishment seated on the edge of the sea in anticipation of a passeggiata, which is to come that way some five years hence, the region being in the meantime of the most primitive formation. The inn was filled with grave English people who looked respectable and bored. And there was, of course, a Church of England service in the gaudily frescoed parlour. Neither was it the drive to Porto Venere that chiefly pleased me. A drive among vines and olives over the hills and beside the Mediterranean to a queer little crumbling village on a headland, as sweetly desolate and superannuated as the name it bears. There is a ruined church near the village, which occupies the site, according to tradition, of an ancient temple of Venus. And if Venus ever revisits her desecrated shrines, she must sometimes pause a moment in that sunny stillness and listen to the murmur of the tideless sea at the base of the narrow promontory. If Venus sometimes comes there, Apollo surely does as much, for close to the temple is a gateway, surmounted by an inscription in Italian and English, which admits you to a curious, and it must be confessed rather cocknified, cave among the rocks. It was here, says the inscription, that the great Byron, swimmer and poet, quote, defied the waves of the Ligurian Sea, unquote. The fact is interesting, though not supremely so, for Byron was always defying something, and if a slab had been put up wherever this performance came off, these commemorative tablets would be in many parts of Europe as thick as milestones. No, the great merit of Spezia to my eye is that I engaged a boat there of a lovely October afternoon and had myself rowed across the gulf. It took about an hour and a half to the little bay of Lerici, which opens out of it. This bay of Lerici is charming. The bosky grey-green hills close it in, and on either side of the entrance, perched on a bold headland, a wonderful old crumbling castle keeps ineffectual guard. The place is classic to all English travellers, for in the middle of the curving shore is the now desolate little villa in which Shelley spent the last months of his short life. He was living at Lerici when he started on that short southern cruise from which he never returned. The house he occupied is strangely shabby, and as sad as you may choose to find it. It stands directly upon the beach, with scarred and battered walls and a lodger of several arches opening to a little terrace with a rugged parapet, which, when the wind blows, must be drenched with the salt spray. The place is very lonely, all over wearied with sun and breeze and brine, very close to nature as it was Shelley's passion to be. I can fancy a great lyric poet sitting on the terrace of a warm evening and feeling very far from England in the early years of the century. In that place, and with his genius, he would, as a matter of course, have heard in the voice of nature a sweetness which only the lyric movement could translate. It is a place where an English-speaking pilgrim himself may very honestly think thoughts and feel moved to lyric utterance, but I must content myself with saying in halting prose that I remember few episodes of Italian travel more sympathetic, as they have it here, than that perfect autumn afternoon. The half-hour station on the little battered terrace of the villa the climb to the singularly felicitous old castle that hangs above Lerici the meditative lounge in the fading light on the vine-decked platform that looked out toward the sunset and the darkening mountains and, far below, upon the quiet sea, beyond which the pale-faced tragic villas stared up at the brightening moon. 4. I had never known Florence more herself or in other words, more attaching than I found to her for a week in that brilliant October. 
She sat in the sunshine beside her yellow river like the little treasure city she has always seemed, without commerce, without other industry than the manufacture of mosaic paperweights and alabaster cupids, without actuality or energy or earnestness or any of those rugged virtues which in most cases are deemed indispensable for civic cohesion with nothing but the little unaugmented stock of her medieval memories her tender coloured mountains her churches and palaces pictures and statues there were very few strangers one's detested fellow pilgrim was infrequent the native population itself seemed scanty the sound of wheels in the streets was but occasional by eight o'clock at night apparently everyone had gone to bed and the musing wanderer still wandering and still musing had the place to himself had the thick shadow masses of the great palaces and the shafts of moonlight striking the polygonal paving stones and the empty bridges and the silvered yellow of the arno and the stillness broken only by a homeward step a step accompanied by a snatch of song from a warm italian voice my room at the inn looked out on the river and was flooded all day with sunshine there was an absurd orange-coloured paper on the walls the arno of a hue not altogether different flowed beneath and on the other side of it rose a line of sallow houses of extreme antiquity crumbling and mouldering bulging and protruding over the stream i seemed to speak of their fronts but what i saw was their shabby backs which were exposed to the cheerful flicker of the river while the fronts stood forever in the deep damp shadow of a narrow medieval street all this brightness and yellowness was a perpetual delight it was a part of that indefinably charming colour which florence always seems to wear as you look up and down at it from the river and from the bridges and quays this is a kind of grave radiance a harmony of high tints which i scarce know how to describe there are yellow walls and green blinds and red roofs there are intervals of brilliant brown and natural looking blue but the picture is not spotty nor gaudy thanks to the distribution of the colours in large and comfortable masses and to the washing over of the scene by some happy softness of sunshine the river front of florence is in short a delightful composition part of its charm comes of course from the generous aspect of those high-based tuscan palaces which a renewal of acquaintance with them has again commended to me as the most dignified dwellings in the world nothing can be finer than that look of giving up the whole immense ground floor to simple purposes of vestibule and staircase of court and high arched entrance as if this were all but a massive pedestal for the real habitation and people weren't properly housed unless to begin with they should be lifted fifty feet above the pavement the great blocks of the basement the great intervals horizontally and vertically from window to window telling of the height and breadth of the rooms within the armorial shield hung forward at one of the angles the wide brimmed roof overshadowing the narrow street the rich old browns and yellows of the walls these definite elements put themselves together with admirable art take a tuscan pile of this type out of its oblique situation in the town call it no longer a palace but a villa set it down by a terrace on one of the hills that encircle florence place a row of high-waisted cypresses beside it give it a grassy courtyard and a view of the florentine towers and the valley of the arno and you will think it perhaps even more worthy of your esteem it was a sunday noon and brilliantly warm when i again arrived and after i had looked from my windows a while at that quietly basking river front i have spoken of i took my way across one of the bridges and then out of one of the gates that immensely tall roman gate in which the space from the top of the arch to the cornice 
except that there is scarcely a cornice, it is all a plain, massive piece of wall, is as great, or seems to be, as that from the ground to the former point. Then I climbed a steep and winding way, much of it a little dull if one likes, being bounded by mottled, mossy garden walls, to a villa on a hilltop, where I found various things that touched me with almost too fine a point. Seeing them again, often for a week, both by sunlight and moonshine, I never quite learned not to covet them, not to feel that not being a part of them was somehow to miss an exquisite chance. What a tranquil, contented life it seemed, with romantic beauty as part of its daily texture, the sunny terrace with its tangled pottery beneath it, the bright grey olives against the bright blue sky, the long, serene, horizontal lines of other villas, flanked by their upward cypresses disposed upon the neighbouring hills, the richest little city in the world in a softly scooped hollow at one's feet, and beyond it the most appealing of views, the most majestic, yet the most familiar. Within the villa was a great love of art, and a painting room full of felicitous work, so that if human life there confessed to quietness, the quietness was mostly but that of the intent act. Beautiful occupation in that beautiful position. What could possibly be better? That is what I spoke just now of envying, a way of life that doesn't wince at such refinements of peace and ease. When labour, self-charmed, presents itself in a dull or ugly place, we esteem it, we admire it, but we scarce feel it to be the ideal of good fortune. When, however, its votaries move as figures in an ancient noble landscape, and their walks and contemplations are like a turning of the leaves of history, we seem to have before us an admirable case of virtue made easy, meaning here by virtue contentment and concentration, a real appreciation of the rare, the exquisite though composite medium of life. You needn't want a rush or a crush when the scene itself, the mere scene, shares with you such a wealth of consciousness. It is true indeed that I might, after a certain time, grow weary of a regular afternoon stroll among the Florentine lanes, of sitting on low parapets in intervals of flower-topped wall and looking across at Fiesole or down the rich-hued valley of the Arno, of pausing at the open gates of villas and wandering at the height of cypresses and the depth of loggias, of walking home in the fading light and noting on a dozen westward-looking surfaces the glow of the opposite sunset. But for a week or so, all this was delightful. The villas are innumerable, and if you are an aching alien, half the talk is about villas. This one has a story, that one has another. They all look as though they had stories, none, in truth, predominantly gay. Most of them are offered to rent, many of them for sale at prices unnaturally low. You may have a tower and a garden, a chapel and an expanse of thirty windows for five hundred dollars a year. In imagination, you hire three or four. You take possession and settle and stay. Your sense of the fineness of the finest is something very grave and stately. Your sense of the bravery of two or three of the best, something quite tragic and sinister. From what does this latter impression come? You gather it as you stand there in the early dusk, with your eyes on the long pale brown facade, the enormous windows, the iron cages fastened to the lower ones. Part of the brooding expression of these great houses comes, even when they have not fallen into decay, from their look of having outlived their original use. Their extraordinary largeness and massiveness are a satire on their present fate. They weren't built with such a thickness of wall and depth of embrasure, such a solidity of staircase and superfluity of stone, 
simply to afford an economical winter residence to English and American families. I don't know whether it was the appearance of these stony old villas which seemed so dumbly conscious of a change of manners that threw a tinge of melancholy over the general prospect. Certain it is that having always found this note as of a myriad old sadnesses and solution in the view of Florence, it seemed to me now particularly strong. Lovely, lovely, but it makes me blue. The sensitive stranger couldn't but murmur to himself, as in the late afternoon he looked at the landscape from over one of the low parapets, and then, with his hands in his pockets, turned away indoors to candles and dinner. End of section 12section thirteen of italian hours by henry james this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain italy revisited part three five below in the city through all frequentations of streets and churches and museums it was impossible not to have a good deal of the same feeling but here the impression was more easy to analyse. It came from a sense of the perfect separateness of all the great productions of the Renaissance from the present and the future of the place, from the actual life and manners, the native ideal. I have already spoken of the way in which the vast aggregation of beautiful works of art in the Italian cities strikes the visitor nowadays, so far as present Italy is concerned, as the mere stock-in-trade of an impecunious but thrifty people. It is this spiritual solitude, this conscious disconnection of the great works of architecture and sculpture that deposits a certain weight upon the heart. When we see a great tradition broken, we feel something of the pain with which we hear a stifled cry. But regret is one thing, and resentment is another. Seeing one morning in a shop window the series of Mornings in Florence, published a few years since by Mr. Ruskin, I made haste to enter and purchase these amusing little books, some passages of which I remembered formerly to have read. I couldn't turn over many pages without observing that the separateness of the new and old which I just mentioned had produced in their author the liveliest irritation. With the more acute phases of this condition it was difficult to sympathise, for the simple reason, it seems to me, that it savours of arrogance to demand of any people as a right of one's own that they shall be artistic. Be artistic yourselves, is the very natural reply that young Italy has at hand for English critics and censors. When a people produces beautiful statues and pictures, it gives us something more than is set down in the bond, and we must thank it for its generosity. And when it stops producing them or caring for them, we may cease thanking. But we can hardly have a right to begin and rail. The wreck of Florence, says Mr. Ruskin, quote, is now too ghastly and heartbreaking to any human soul that remembers the days of old. End quote. And these desperate words are an allusion to the fact that the little square in front of the cathedral, at the foot of Giotto's tower, with the grand baptistry on the other side, is now the resort of a number of hackney coaches and omnibuses. This fact is doubtless lamentable, and it would be a hundred times more agreeable to see among people who have been made the heirs of so priceless a work of art as the sublime Campanile, some such feeling about it as would keep it free even from the danger of defilement. A cab stand is a very ugly and dirty thing, and Giotto's tower should have nothing in common with such conveniences. But there is more than one way of taking such things, and the sensitive stranger who has been walking about for a week 
with his mind full of the sweetness and suggestiveness of a hundred Florentine places, may feel at last, in looking into Mr. Ruskin's little tracts, that discord for discord, there isn't much to choose between the importunity of the author's personal ill-humour and the incongruity of horse-pails and bundles of hay. And one may say this without being at all a partisan of the doctrine of the inevitableness of new desecrations. For my own part, I believe there are few things in this line that the new Italian spirit isn't capable of, and not many indeed that we aren't destined to see. Pictures and buildings won't be completely destroyed, because in that case the forestieri, scatterers of cash, would cease to arrive and the turnstiles at the doors of the old palaces and convents, with the little patented slit for absorbing your half franc, would grow quite rusty, would stiffen with disuse. But it's safe to say that the new Italy growing into an old Italy again will continue to take her elbow room wherever she may find it. I am almost ashamed to say what I did with Mr. Ruskin's little books. I put them into my pocket and betook myself to Santa Maria Novella. There I sat down and after I'd looked about for a while at the beautiful church, drew them forth one by one and read the greater part of them. Occupying oneself with light literature in a great religious edifice, is perhaps as bad a piece of profanation as any of those rude dealings which Mr. Ruskin justly deplores, but a traveller has to make the most of odd moments. And I was waiting for a friend, in whose company I was going to look at Giotto's beautiful frescoes in the cloister of the church. My friend was a long time coming, so that I had an hour with Mr. Ruskin, whom I called just now a light litterateur, because in these little mornings in Florence, he is forever making his readers laugh. I remembered, of course, where I was, and in spite of my latent hilarity, felt I had rarely got such a snubbing. I had really been enjoying the good old city of Florence, but I now learned from Mr. Ruskin that this was a scandalous waste of charity. I should have gone about with an imprecation on my lips. I should have worn a face three yards long. I had taken great pleasure in certain frescoes by Gil and Dio in the choir at that very church. But it appeared from one of these little books that these frescoes were as naught. I had much admired Santa Croce and had thought the Duomo a very noble affair but I had now the most positive assurance that I knew nothing about them. After a while, if it was only ill humour that was needed for doing honour to the city of the Medici, I felt I had risen to a proper level. Only now it was Mr. Ruskin himself I had lost patience with, not with the stupid Brunelleschi, not the vulgar Ghirlandaio, Indeed, I lost patience altogether, and asked myself by what right this informal votary of form pretended to run right through a poor, charmed Flano's quiet contemplations, his attachment to the noblest of pleasures, his enjoyment of the loveliest of cities. The little book seemed invidious and insane, and it was only when I remembered that I had been under no obligation to buy them that I checked myself in repenting of having done so. Then at last my friend arrived, and we passed together out of the church and through the first cloister beside it into a smaller enclosure where we stood a while to look at the tomb of La Marchesa Strozzi Ridolfi, upon which the great Giotto has painted four superb little pictures. It was easy to see the pictures were superb, but I drew forth one of my little books again, for I had observed that Mr. Ruskin spoke of them. Hereupon I recovered my tolerance, for what could be better in this case, I asked myself, than Mr. Ruskin's remarks? 
they are in fact excellent and charming full of appreciation of the deep and simple beauty of the great painter's work i read them aloud to my companion but my companion was rather as the phrase is put off by them one of the frescoes is a picture of the birth of the virgin it contains a figure coming through a door a ornament i quote there is only the entirely simple outline of the vase which the servant carries of colour two or three masses of sober red and pure white with brown and grey that is all mr ruskin continues and if you are pleased with this you can see florence but if not by all means amuse yourself there if you find it amusing as long as you like you can never see it End quote. you can never see it this seemed to my friend insufferable and i had to shuffle away the book again so that we might look at the fresco with the unruffled geniality it deserves we agreed afterwards when in a more convenient place i read aloud a good many more passages from the precious tracts that there are a great many ways of seeing florence as there are of seeing most beautiful and interesting things and that it is very dry and pedantic to say that the happy vision depends upon our squaring our toes with a certain particular chalk mark we see florence wherever and whenever we enjoy it and for enjoying it we find a great many more pretexts than mr ruskin seems inclined to allow my friend and i convinced ourselves also however that the little books were an excellent purchase on account of the great charm and felicity of much of their incidental criticism to say nothing as i hinted just now of their being extremely amusing nothing in fact is more comical than the familiar asperity of the author's style and the pedagogic fashion in which he pushes and pulls his unhappy pupils about jerking their heads toward this rapping their knuckles for that sending them to stand in corners and giving them scripture texts to copy but it is neither the felicities nor the aberrations of detail in mr ruskin's writings that are the main affair for most readers it is the general tone that as i have said puts them off or draws them on for many persons he will never bear the test of being read in this rich old italy where art so long as it really lived at all was spontaneous joyous irresponsible if the reader is in daily contact with those beautiful florentine works which do still in a way force themselves into notice through the vulgarity and cruelty of modern profanation it will seem to him that this commentator's comment is pitched in the strangest falsetto key one may read a hundred pages of this sort of thing said my friend without ever dreaming that he is talking about art you can say nothing worse about him than that which is perfectly true art is the one corner of human life in which we may take our ease to justify our presence there the only thing demanded of us is that we should have felt the representational impulse in other connections our impulses are conditioned and embarrassed we're allowed to have only so many as are consistent with those of our neighbours with their convenience and well-being with their convictions and prejudices their rules and regulations art means an escape from all this wherever her shining standard floats the need for apology and compromise is over there it is enough simply that we please or are pleased where the tree is judged only by its fruits if these are sweet the tree is justified and not less so the consumer one may read a great many pages of mr ruskin without getting a hint of this delightful truth a hint of the not unimportant fact that art after all is made for us not we for art this idea 
that the value of a work is in the amount of illusion it yields is conspicuous by its absence and as for mr ruskin's world being a place his world of art where we may take life easily woe to the luckless mortal who enters it with any such disposition instead of a garden of delight he finds a sort of assize court in perpetual session instead of a place in which human responsibilities are lightened and suspended he finds a region governed by a kind of draconic legislation. His responsibilities are indeed tenfold increased. The gulf between truth and error is forever yawning at his feet. The pains and penalties of this same error are advertised in apocalyptic terminology upon a thousand signposts. And the rash intruder soon begins to look back with infinite longing to the lost paradise of the artless there can be no greater want of tact in dealing with those things with which men attempt to ornament life than to be perpetually talking about error a truce to all rigidities is the law of the place the only thing absolute there is that some force and some charm have worked the grim old bearer of the scales excuses herself. She feels this not to be her province. Differences here are not iniquity and righteousness. They are simply variations of temperament, kinds of curiosity. We are not under theological government. 6. It was very charming in the bright warm days to wander from one corner of Florence to another, paying one's respects again to remembered masterpieces. It was pleasant also to find that memory had played no tricks, and that the rarest things of an earlier year were as rare as ever. To enumerate these felicities would take a great deal of space, for I never had been more struck with the mere quantity of brilliant Florentine work. Even giving up the Duomo and Santa Croce to Mr. Ruskin as, quote, very ill-arranged edifices, end quote, the list of Florentine treasures is almost inexhaustible. Those long outer galleries of the Uffizi had never beguiled me more. Sometimes there were not more than two or three figures standing there by decker in hand to break the charming perspective one side of this upstairs portico it will be remembered is entirely composed of glass the continuity of old-fashioned windows draped with white curtains of rather primitive fashion which hang there till they acquire a perceptible tone the light passing through them is softly filtered and diffused it rests mildly upon the old marbles chiefly antique roman busts which stand in the narrow intervals of the casements it is projected upon the numerous pictures that cover the opposite wall and that are not by any means as a general thing the gems of the great collection it imparts a faded brightness to the old ornamental arabesques upon the painted wooden ceiling and it makes a great soft shining upon the marble floor in which, as you look up and down, you see the strolling tourists and the motionless copyists almost reflected. I don't know why I should find all this very pleasant, but in fact I have seldom gone into the Uffizi without walking the length of this third-story cloister between the, for the most part, third-rate canvases and panels and the faded cotton curtains. Why is it that in Italy we see a charm in things in regard to which, in other countries, we always take vulgarity for granted? If in the city of New York a great museum of the arts were to be provided by way of decoration with a species of veranda, enclosed on one side by a series of small paned windows draped in dirty linen and furnished on the other with an array of pictorial feebleness, the place being surmounted by a thinly painted wooden roof, strongly suggestive of summer heat, of winter cold, of frequent leakage, those amateurs who had had the advantage of foreign travel 
will be at small pains to conceal their contempt. Contemptible or respectable to the judicial mind, this quaint old lodger of the Uffizi admitted me into twenty chambers, where I found as great a number of ancient favourites. I don't know that I had a warmer greeting for any old friend than for Andrea del Sarto, that most touching of painters who was not one of the first. But it was on the other side of the Arno that I found him in force, in those dusky drawing rooms of the Pitti Palace, to which you take your way along the tortuous tunnel that wanders through the houses of Florence, and is supported by the little goldsmith's booths on the Ponte Vecchio. In the rich, insufficient light of these beautiful rooms, where, to look at the pictures, you sit in damask chairs and rest your elbows on tables of malachite, the elegant Andrea becomes deeply effective. Before long, he has drawn you close. But the great pleasure, after all, was to revisit the earlier masters in those specimens of them chiefly that bloom so unfadingly on the big plain walls of the academy. Fra Angelico and Filippo Lippi, Botticelli and Lorenzo di Credi are the clearest, the sweetest and best of all painters. As I sat for an hour in their company, in the cold great hall of the institution I have mentioned, there are shabby rafters above and an immense expanse of brick tiles below and many bad pictures as well as good. It seemed to me more than ever that if one really had to choose, one couldn't do better than choose here. You may rest at your ease at the academy in this big first room, at the upper and especially on the left, because more than many other places it savours of old Florence. More, for instance, in reality than the Bargello, though the Bargello makes great pretensions. Beautiful and masterful though the Bargello is, it smells too strongly of restoration, and much of old Italy as still lurks in its furbished and renovated chambers. It speaks even more distinctly of the ill-mannered young kingdom that has, as unavoidably as you please, lifted down a hundred delicate works of sculpture from the convent walls where their pious authors place them. If the early Tuscan painters are exquisite, I can think of no praise pure enough for the sculptors of the same period. Donatello and Luca della Robbia, Matteo Civitale and Mina da Fiesole, who, as I refreshed my memory of them, seemed to me to leave absolutely nothing to be desired in the way of straightness of inspiration and grace of invention. The Baguero is full of early Etruscan sculpture, most of the pieces of which have come from suppressed religious houses, and even if the visitor be an ardent liberal, he is uncomfortably conscious of the rather brutal process by which it has been collected. We can hardly envy young Italy the number of odious things she has had to do. The railway journey from Florence to Rome has been altered both for the better and for the worse. For the better in that it has been shortened by a couple of hours. For the worse inasmuch as when about half the distance has been traversed, the train deflects to the west and leaves the beautiful old cities of Assisi, Perugia, Terni, Narni unvisited. Of old, it was possible to call at these places, in a manner, from the window of the train. Even if you didn't stop us, you probably couldn't, every time you passed, the immensely interesting way in which, like a loosened belt on an aged and shrunken person, their ample walls held them easily together was something well worth noting. Now, however, for compensation, the express train to Rome stops at Ovieto, and in consequence, in consequence of what? What is the result of a stop of an express train at Ovieto? As I glibly wrote that sentence, I suddenly paused, aware of the queer stuff I was uttering. 
that an express train should graze the base of the horrid purple mountain from the apex of which this dark old catholic city uplifts the glittering front of its cathedral that might have been foretold by a keen observer of contemporary manners but that it would really have the grossness to hang about is a fact over which as he records it an inveterate perverse cherisher of the sense of the past order the order still largely prevailing at the time of his first visit to italy may well make what is vulgarly called an ado the train does stop at orvieto not very long it is true but long enough to let you out this same phenomenon takes place on the following day when having visited the city you get in again i availed myself without scruple of both of these occasions having formerly neglected to drive to the place in a post-chaise but frankly the railway station being in the plain and the town on the summit of the extraordinary hill you have time to forget the puffing indiscretion while you wind upwards to the city gate the position of Ovieto is superb worthy of the middle distance of an eighteenth century landscape but as everyone knows the splendid cathedral is the proper attraction of the spot which indeed say for this fine monument and for its craggy and crumbling ramparts is a meanly arranged and as italian cities go not particularly impressive little town i spent a beautiful sunday there and took in the charming church i gave it my best attention though on the whole i fear i found it inferior to its fame a high concert of colour however is the densely carved front richly covered with radiant mosaics the old white marble of the sculptured portions is as softly yellow as ancient ivory the large exceedingly bright pictures above them flashed and twinkled in the glorious weather very striking and interesting the theological frescoes of Luca Signorelli, though I have seen compositions of this general order that appealed to me more. Characteristically fresh, finally, the clear-faced saints and seraphs in robes of pink and azure, whom Fra Angelico had painted upon the ceiling of the great chapel, along with a noble sitting figure more expressive of movement than most of the creations of this pictorial peacemaker of christ in judgment yet the interest of the cathedral of Oviedo is mainly not the visible result but the historical process that lies behind it those three hundred years of the applied devotion of a people of which an american scholar has written an admirable account Footnote charles elliot norton notes of travel and study in italy eighteen seventy seven end of section thirteen section fourteen of italian hours by henry james this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain a roman holiday part one it is certainly sweet to be merry at the right moment but the right moment hardly seems to me the ten days of the roman carnival it was my rather cynical suspicion perhaps that they wouldn't keep to my imagination the brilliant promise of legend but i have been justified by the event and have been decidedly less conscious of the festal influences of the season than of the inalienable gravity of the place there was a time when the carnival was a serious matter that is a heartily joyous one but thanks to the seven league boots the kingdom of italy has lately donned for the march of progress in quite other directions the fashion of public revelry has fallen woefully out of step the state of mind and manners under which the carnival was kept in generous good faith i doubt if an american can exactly conceive he can only say to himself that for a month in the year there must have been things things considerably of humiliation it was comfortable to forget 
but now that Italy is made, the carnival is unmade. And we are not especially tempted to envy the attitude of a population who have lost their relish for play, and not yet acquired to any striking extent an enthusiasm for work. The spectacle on the Corso had seemed to me on the whole an illustration of that great breach with the past, of which Catholic Christendom felt the somewhat muffled shock in September 1870. A traveller acquainted with the fully papal Rome, coming back any time during the past winter, must have immediately noticed that something momentous had happened, something hostile to the elements of picture and colour and style. My first warning was that ten minutes after my arrival, I found myself face to face with a newspaper stand. The impossibility in the other days of having anything in the journalistic line of the Osservatore Romano and the Voce della Verità used to seem to me much connected with the extraordinary leisure of thought and stillness of mind to which the place admitted you. But now the slender piping of the voice of truth is stifled by the raucous note of eventide vendors of the Capitale, the Libertà, and the Fampula. And Rome, reading unexpurgated news, is another Rome indeed. For every subscriber to the Libertà, they may well be an antique masker and reveller less. A striking a sign of the new regime is the extraordinary increase of population. The Corso was always a well-filled street, but now it is a perpetual crush. I never cease to wonder where the newcomers are lodged, and how such spotless flowers of fashion as the gentlemen who stare at the carriages can bloom in the atmosphere of those camere mobilate of which I've had glimpses. This, however, is their own question, and bravely enough they meet it. They proclaimed somehow, to the first freshness of my wonder, as I say, that by force of numbers, Rome had been secularised. An Italian dandy is a figure visually to reckon with, but these goodly throngs of them scarce offered compensation for the absent Monsignori treading the streets in their purple stockings and followed by the solemn servants who returned on their behalf the bars of the meaner sort for the morning gear of the cardinal's coaches that formerly glittered with scarlet and swung with the weight of the footmen clinging behind. For the certainty that you'll not, by the best of travellers' luck, meet the Pope sitting deep in the shadow of his great chariot with uplifted fingers, like some inaccessible idol in his shrine. You may meet the king, indeed, who is ugly, as imposingly ugly as some idols, though not so inaccessible. The other day, as I passed the Quirinal, he drove up in a low carriage with a single attendant, and a group of men and women who had been waiting near the gate rushed at him with a number of folded papers. The carriage slackened pace, and he pocketed their offerings with a business-like air, that of a good-natured man accepting handbills at a street corner. He was a monarch at his palace gate, receiving petitions from his subjects, being abjured to right their wrongs. The scene ought to have thrilled me, but somehow it had no more intensity than a woodcut in an illustrated newspaper. Homely, I should call it at most, admirably so certainly, for there were lately few sovereigns standing, I believe, with whom their people enjoyed these filial hand-to-hand relations. The king this year, however, has had as little to do with the carnival as the pope, and the innkeepers and Americans have marked it for their own. It was advertised to begin at half-past two o'clock of a certain Saturday, and punctually at the stroke of the hour, from my room across a wide court, I heard a sudden multiplication of sounds and confusion of tongues in the corso. I was writing to a friend for whom I cared more than for any mere romp, but as the minutes elapsed and the hubbub deepened, 
curiosity got the better of affection, and I remembered that I was really within eyeshot of an affair the fame of which had ministered to the daydreams of my infancy. I used to have a scrapbook with a coloured print of the starting of the bedizened wild horses, and the use of a library rich in keepsakes and annuals with a frontispiece commonly of a masked lady in a balcony, the heroine of a delightful tale further on. Agitated by these tender memories, I descended into the street. But I confess I looked in vain for a masked lady who might serve as a frontispiece, in vain for any object whatever that might adorn a tale. Masked and muffled ladies there were in abundance, but their masks were of ugly wire, perfectly resembling the little covers placed upon strong cheese in German hotels, and their drapery was a shabby waterproof with a hood pulled over their chignons. They were armed with great tin scoops or funnels, with which they solemnly shoveled lime and flour out of bushel baskets and down on the heads of the people in the street. They were packed into balconies all the way along the straight vista of the Corso, in which their calcareous shower maintained a dense, gritty, unpalatable fog. The crowd was compact in the street, and the Americans in it were tossing back confetti out of great satchels hung round their necks. It was quite the you're another sort of repartee, and less seasoned than I had hoped with the airy mockery tradition hangs about this festival. The scene was striking, in a word, but somehow not as I had dreamed of its being. I stood regardful, I suppose, but with a peculiarly tempting blankness of visage, for in a moment I received half a bushel of flour on my too philosophic head. Decidedly, it was an ignoble form of humour. I shook my ears like an emergent diver, and had a sudden vision of how still and sunny and solemn, how peculiarly and undisturbedly themselves, how secure from any intrusion less sympathetic than one's own, certain outlying parts of Rome must just then be. The carnival had received its death blow in my imagination, and it has been ever since but a thin and a dusky ghost of pleasure that has flitted at intervals in and out of my consciousness. I turned my back accordingly on the Corso, and wandered away to the grass-grown quarters delightfully free, even from the possibility of a fellow countryman. And so, having set myself an example, I have been keeping carnival by strolling perversely along the silent circumference of Rome. I have doubtless lost a great deal. The Princess Margaret has occupied a balcony opposite the open space which leads into Via Condotti, and I believe, like the discreet princess she is, has dealt in no missiles but bonbons, bouquets, and white doves. I would have waited half an hour any day to see the Princess Margaret hold a dove on her forefinger, but I never chanced to notice any preparation for that effect. And yet, do what you will, you can't really elude the carnival. As the days elapse, it filters down into the manners of the common people, and before the week is over, the very beggars at the church doors seem to have gone to the expense of a domino. When you meet these specimens of dingy drollery capering about in dusky back streets at all hours of the day and night, meet them flitting out of black doorways between greasy groups that cluster about Roman thresholds, you feel that a love of pranks, the more vivid the better, must from far back have been implanted in the Roman temperament with a strong hand. An unsophisticated American is wonderstruck at the number of persons of every age and various conditions whom it costs nothing in the nature of an ingenuous blush to walk up and down the streets in the costume of a theatrical supernumerary. Fathers of families do it at the head of an admiring progenitor. Uncles and aunts, 
and grandmothers do it. Well, the family does it with varying splendour, but with the same good conscience. A pack of babies, the doubtless too self-conscious alien pronounces it for its pains, and tries to imagine himself strutting along Broadway in a battered tin helmet and a pair of yellow tights. Our vices are certainly different. It takes those of the innocent sort to be so ridiculous. A self-consciousness lapsing so easily in fine strikes me as so near a relation to amenity, urbanity and general gracefulness that for myself I should be sorry to lay a tax on it lest these other commodities should also cease to come to market. I was rewarded, when I had turned away with my ears full of flour, by a glimpse of an intenser life than the dingy foolery of the Corso. I wandered down by the back streets to the steps mounting to the Capitol, that long inclined plain, rather, broken at every two paces, which is the unfailing disappointment, I believe, of tourists primed for retrospective raptures. Certainly the capital seen from this side isn't commanding. The hill is so low, the ascent so narrow, Michelangelo's architecture in the quadrangle at the top so meagre, the whole place somehow so much more of a molehill than a mountain, that for the first ten minutes of your standing there, Roman history seems suddenly to have sunk through a trapdoor. It emerges, however, on the other side in the forum. And here, meanwhile, if you get no sense of the sublime, you get gradually a sense of exquisite composition. Nowhere in Rome is more colour, more charm, more sport for the eye. The mild incline during the winter months is always covered with lounging sun-seekers, and especially with those more constantly obvious members of the Roman population, beggars, soldiers, monks and tourists. The beggars and peasants lie kicking their heels along that grandest of loafing places, the great steps of the Araceni. The dwarfish look of the capital is intensified, I think, by the neighbourhood of this huge blank staircase, mouldering away in disuse, the weeds thick in its crevices, and climbing to the rudely solemn façade of the church. The sunshine glares on the great unfinished wall, only to light up its featureless disrepair, its expression of conscious, irremediable incompleteness. Sometimes, massing its rusty screen against the deep blue sky, with the little cross and the sculptured porch casting a clear-cut shadow on the bricks, it seems to have even more than a Roman desolation. It confusedly suggests Spain and Africa, lands with no latent risorgimenti, with absolutely nothing but a fatal past. The legendary wolf of Rome has lately been accommodated with a little artificial grotto among the cacti and the palms in the fantastic triangular garden squeezed between the steps of the church and the ascent to the Capitol, where she holds a perpetual levy and draws apparently as powerfully as the Pope himself. Above, in the piazzetta before the stuccoed palace, which rises so jauntily on a basement of thrice its magnitude, are more loungers and knitters in the sun, seated round the massively inscribed base of the statue of Marcus Aurelius. Hawthorne has perfectly expressed the attitude of this admirable figure in saying that it extends its arm with, quote, a command which is in itself a benediction, end quote. I doubt if any statue of king or captain in the public places of the world has more to commend it to the general heart. Irrecoverable simplicity, residing so in irrecoverable style, has no sturdier representative. Here is an impression that the sculptors of the last three hundred years have been laboriously trying to reproduce. 
but contrasted with this mild old monarch their prancing horsemen suggest a succession of riding masters taking out young ladies schools the admirably human character of the figure survives the rusty decomposition of the bronze and the slight debasement of the art and one may call it singular that in the capital of christendom the portrait most suggestive of a christian conscience is that of a pagan emperor you recover in some degree your stifled hopes of sublimity as you pass beyond the palace and take your choice of either curving slope to descend into the forum then you see that the little stuccoed edifice is but a modern excrescence on the mighty cliff of a primitive construction whose great squares of porous tufa as they underlie each other seem to resolve themselves back into the colossal cohesion of unhewn rock there are prodigious strangenesses in the union of this airy and comparatively fresh-faced superstructure and these deep plunging hoary foundations and few things in rome are more entertaining to the eye than to measure the long plumb line which drops from the inhabited windows of the palace with their little over-peeping balconies their muslin curtains and their bird cages down to the rugged constructional work of the Republic. In the forum proper, the sublime is eclipsed again, though the late extension of the excavations gives a chance for it. Nothing in Rome helps your fancy to a more vigorous backward flight than to lounge on a sunny day over the railing which guards the great central researches. It says more things to you than you can repeat to see the past, the ancient world, as you stand there, bodily turned up with the spade and transformed from an immaterial, inaccessible fact of time into a matter of soils and surfaces. The pleasure is the same in kind as what you enjoy at Pompeii and the pain the same. It wasn't here, however, that I found my compensation for forfeiting the spectacle on the Corso, but in a little church at the end of the narrow byway which diverges up the Palatine from just beside the Arch of Titus. This byway leads you between high walls, then takes a bend and introduces you to a long row of rusty, dusty little pictures of the Stations of the Cross. Beyond these stands a small church with a front so modest that you hardly recognise it till you see the leather curtain. I never see a leather curtain without lifting it. It is sure to cover a constituted scene of some sort, good, bad or indifferent. The scene this time was meagre. Whitewash and tarnished candlesticks and mouldy muslin flowers being its principal features. I shouldn't have remained if I hadn't been struck with the attitude of the single worshipper. A young priest, kneeling before one of the side altars, who, as I entered, lifted his head and gave me a sidelong look so charged with the languor of devotion that he immediately became an object of interest. He was visiting each of the altars in turn and kissing the balustrade beneath them. He was alone in the church, and indeed in the whole region. There were no beggars even at the door. They were plying their trade on the skirts of the carnival. In the entirely deserted place, he alone knelt for religion. And as I sat respectfully by, it seemed to me I could hear in the perfect silence the faraway uproar of the maskers. It was my late impression of these frivolous people, I suppose, joined with the extraordinary gravity of the young priest's face, his pious fatigue, his droning prayer and his isolation, that gave me just then and there a supreme vision of the religious passion, its privations and resignations and exhaustions, and its terribly small share of amusement. He was young and strong, and evidently of not too refined a fibre to enjoy the carnival, 
but planted therewith his face pale with fasting and his knees stiff with praying he seemed so stern a satire on it and on the crazy thousands who were preferring it to his way that i half expected to see some heavenly portent out of a monastic legend come down and confirm his choice yet i confess that though i wasn't enamoured of the carnival myself his seemed a grim preference and this for swearing of the world a terrible game a gaining one only if your zeal never falters a hard fight when it does in such an hour to a stout young fellow like the hero of my anecdote the smell of incense must seem horribly stale and the muslin flowers and gilt candlesticks to figure no great bribe and it wouldn't have helped him much to think that not so very far away just beyond the forum in the corso there was sport for the million and for nothing i doubt on the other hand whether my young priest had thought of this he had made himself a temple out of the very elements of his innocence and his prayers followed each other too fast for the tempter to slip in a whisper and so as i say i found a solider fact of human nature than the love of coriandoli one of course never passes the Colosseum without paying its one's respects without going in under one of the hundred portals and crossing the long oval and sitting down a while generally at the foot of the cross in the centre i always feel as i do so as if i was seated in the depths of some alpine valley the upper portions of the side toward the escaline look as remote and lonely as an alpine ridge and you raise your eyes to their rugged skyline drinking in the sun and silvered by the blue air with much the same feeling with which you would take in a grey cliff on which an eagle might lodge this roughly mountainous quality of the great ruin is its chief interest beauty of detail has pretty well vanished especially since the high growing wild flowers have been plucked away by the new government whose functionaries surely at certain points of their task must have felt as if they shared the dreadful trade of those who gather sampire even if you are on your way to the lateran you won't grudge the twenty minutes it will take you on leaving the Colosseum to turn away under the arch of constantine whose noble battered bas-reliefs with the chain of tragic statues fettered drooping barbarians round its summit i assume you to have profoundly admired toward the piazzetta of the church of san giovanni e paolo on the slope of the Cilian. no spot in rome can show a cluster of more charming accidents the ancient brick apse of the church peeps down into the trees of the little wooded walk before the neighbouring church of san gregorio intensely venerable beneath its excessive modernisation and a series of heavy brick buttresses flying across to an opposite wall overarches the short steep paved passage which leads into the small square this is flanked on one side by the long medieval portico of the church of the two saints sustained by the eight time blackened columns of granite and marble on another rise the great scarce windowed walls of a passionist convent and on the third the portals of a grand villa whose tall porter with his cockade and silver top staff standing sublime behind his grating seems a kind of mundane st peter i suppose to the beggars who sit at the church door or lie in the sun along the farther slope which leads to the gate of the convent the place always seems to me the perfection of an out-of-the-way corner a place you would think twice before telling people about lest you should find them there the next time you are to go it is such a group of objects singly and in their happy combination as one must come to rome to find at one's house door 
but what makes it peculiarly a picture is the beautiful dark red campanile of the church which stands embedded in the mass of the convent it begins as so many things in rome begin with a stout foundation of antique traverton and rises high in delicately quaint medieval brickwork little tiers and apertures sustained on miniature columns and adorned with small cracked slabs of green and yellow marble inserted almost at random when there are three or four brown-breasted contadini sleeping in the sun before the convent doors and a departing monk leading his shadow down over them i think you will not find anything in rome more sketchable End of section 14section 15 of italian hours by henry james this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain a roman holiday part two if you stop however to observe everything worthy of your watercolours you will never reach st john lateran my business was much less with the interior of that vast and empty that cold clean temple which i have never found peculiarly interesting than with certain charming features of its surrounding precinct the crooked old court beside it which admits you to the baptistry and to a delightful rear view of the queer architectural odds and ends that may in rome compose a florid ecclesiastical facade there are more of these a stranger jumble of chance detail of lurking recesses and wanton projections and inexplicable windows than i have memory or phrase for but the gem of the collection is the oddly perched peak turret with its yellow traverton welded upon the rusty brickwork which was not meant to be suspected and the brickwork retreating beneath and leaving it in the odd position of a tower under which you may see the sky as to the great front of the church overlooking the porta san giovanni you are not admitted behind the scenes the term is quite in keeping for the architecture has a vastly theatrical air it is extremely imposing that of st peter's alone is more so and when from far off on the campagna you see the colossal images of the mitred saints along the top standing distinct against the sky you forget their coarse construction and their inflated draperies the view from the great space which stretches from the church steps to the city wall is the very prince of views just beside you beyond the great alcove of mosaic is the scala santa the marble staircase which says the legend christ descended under the weight of pilate's judgment and which all christians must forever ascend on their knees before you is the city gate which opens upon the via appia nuova the long gaunt file of arches of the claudian aqueduct their jagged ridge stretching away like the vertebral column of some monstrous mouldering skeleton and upon the blooming brown and purple flats and dells of the campagna and the glowing blue of the alban mountains spotted with their white high nestling towns while to your left is the great grassy space lined with dwarfish mulberry trees which stretches across to the damp little sister basilica of Santa Croce in Gerusalemme. During a former visit to Rome, I lost my heart to this idle tract. Footnote Utterly overbuilt and gone. 1909. End footnote. And wasted much time in sitting on the steps of the church and watching certain white cowled friars who were sure to be passing there for the delight of my eyes there are fewer friars now and there are a great many of the king's recruits who inhabit the ex-conventual barracks adjoining santa croce and are led forward to practise their goose-step on the sunny turf 
here too the poor old cardinals who were no longer to be seen on the pincho descend from their mourning coaches and relax their venerable knees these members alone still testify to the traditional splendour of the princes of the church for as they advance the lifted black petticoat reveals a flash of scarlet stockings and makes you groan at the victory of civilization over colour if st john lateran disappoints you internally you have an easy compensation in pacing the long lane which connects it with santa maria maggiore and entering the singularly perfect nave of that most delightful of churches the first day of my stay in rome under the old dispensation i spent in wandering at random through the city with accident for my valet de place it served me to perfection and introduced me to the best things among others to an immediate happy relation with santa maria maggiore first impressions memorable impressions are generally irrecoverable they often leave one the wiser but they rarely return in the same form i remember of my coming uninformed and unprepared into the place of worship and of curiosity that i have named only that i sat for half an hour on the edge of the base of one of the marble columns of the beautiful nave and enjoyed a perfect revel of what should i call it taste intelligence fancy perceptive emotion the place proved so endlessly suggestive that perception became a throbbing confusion of images and i departed with a sense of knowing a good deal that is not set down in murray i have seated myself more than once again at the base of the same column but you live your life only once and parts as well as the whole the obvious charm of the church is the elegant grandeur of the nave its perfect shapeliness and its rich simplicity its long double row of white marble columns and its high flat roof embossed with intricate gildings and mouldings it opens into a choir of an extraordinary splendour of effect which i recommend you to look out for of a fine afternoon at such a time the glowing western light entering the high windows of the tribune kindles the scattered masses of colour into a sombre brightness scintillates on the great solemn mosaic of the vault touches the porphyry columns of the superb baldacchino with ruby lights and buries its shining shafts in the deep toned shadows that hang about frescoes and sculptures and mouldings the deeper charm even than in such things however is the social or historic note or tone or atmosphere of the church i fumble you see for the right expression the sense it gives you in common with most of the roman churches and more than any of them of having been prayed in for several centuries by an endlessly curious and complex society it takes no great attention to let it come to you that the authority of italian catholicism has lapsed not a little in these days not less also perhaps than to feel that as they stand these deserted temples were the fruit of a society leavened through and through by ecclesiastical manners and that they formed for ages the constant background of the human drama they are as one may say the churchiest churches in europe the fullest of gathered memories of the experience of their office there's not a figure one has read of in old world annals that isn't to be imagined on proper occasion kneeling before the lamp deck confession beneath the altar of santa maria maggiore one sees after all however even among the most palpable realities very much what the play of one's imagination projects there and I present my remarks simply as a reminder that one's constant excursions into these places are not the least interesting episodes of one's walks in Rome.
I had meant to give a simple illustration of the church habit, so to speak, but I have given it at such a length as leaves scant space to touch on the innumerable topics brushed by the pen that begins to take Roman notes. It is by the aimless flânerie which leaves you free to follow capriciously every hint of entertainment that you get to know Rome. The greater part of the life about you goes on in the streets, and for an observer fresh from a country in which town scenery is at the least monotonous, incident and character and picture seem to abound. I become conscious, with compunction, let me hasten to add, that I have launched myself thus on the subject of Roman churches and Roman walks without so much as a preliminary allusion to St. Peter's. One is apt to proceed thither on rainy days with intentions of exercise, to put the case only at that, and to carry these out body and mind. Taken as a walk, not less than a church, St. Peter's, of course, reigns alone. Even for the profane constitutional, it serves where the boulevards, where Piccadilly and Broadway, fall short. And if it didn't offer to our use the grandest area in the world, it would still offer the most diverting. Few great works of art last longer to the curiosity, to the perpetually transcended attention. You think you have taken the whole thing in, but it expands, it rises sublime again, and leaves your measure itself poor. You never let the ponderous leather curtain bang down behind you, your weak lift of a scant edge of whose padded vastness resembles the liberty taken in folding back the parchment corner of some mighty folio page, without feeling all former visits to have been but missed attempts at apprehension, and the actual to achieve your first real possession. The conventional question is ever as to whether one hasn't been disappointed in the size. But a few honest folk here and there, I hope, will never cease to say no. The place struck me from the first as the hugest thing conceivable, a real exaltation of one's idea of space, so that one's entrance, even from the great empty square, which either glares beneath the deep blue sky or makes of the cool, far-cast shadow of the immense front something that resembles a big slate-coloured country on a map, seems not so much a going in somewhere as a going out. The mere man of pleasure in quest of new sensations might well not know where to better his encounter there of the sublime shock that brings him within the threshold to an immediate gasping pause. There are days when the vast nave looks mysteriously vaster than on others, and the gorgeous baldacchino a longer journey beyond the far-spreading tessellated plain of the pavement, and when the light has yet a quality which lets things loom their largest, while the scattered figures, I mean the human, for there are plenty of others, mark happily the scale of items and parts. Then, you have only to stroll and stroll and gaze and gaze. To watch the glorious altar canopy lift its bronze architecture, its colossal embroidered contortions like a temple within a temple, and feel yourself at the bottom of the abysmal shaft of the dome dwindle to a crawling dot. Much of the constituted beauty resides in the fact that it is all general beauty, that you are appealed to by no specific details, or that these at least practically never importunate are as taken for granted as the lieutenants and captains are taken for granted in a great standing army, among whom indeed individual aspects may figure here the rather shifting range of decorative dignity in which details when observed often prove poor, though never not massive and substantially precious, and sometimes prove ridiculous. 
the sculptures with the sole exception of michelangelo's ineffable pieta which lurks obscurely in a side chapel this indeed to my sense the rarest artistic combination of the greatest things the hand of man has produced are either bad or indifferent and the universal incrustation of marble though sumptuous enough has a less brilliant effect than the much later work of the same sort that for instance of st paul's without the walls the supreme beauty is a splendidly sustained simplicity of the whole the thing represents a prodigious imagination extraordinarily strained yet strained at its happiest pitch without breaking its happiest pitch i say because this is the only creation of its strenuous author in presence of which you are in presence of serenity you may invoke the idea of ease at st peter's without a sense of sacrilege which you can hardly do if you are at all spiritually nervous in westminster abbey or notre dame the vast enclosed clearness has much to do with the idea there are no shadows to speak of no marked effects of shade only effects of light innumerably points at which this element seems to mass itself in airy density and scatter itself in enchanting gradations and cadences it performs the office of gloom or of mystery in gothic churches hangs like a rolling mist along the gilded vault of the nave melts into bright interfusion the mosaic scintillations of the dome clings and clusters and lingers animates the whole huge and otherwise empty shell a good catholic i suppose is the same catholic anywhere before the grandest as well as the humblest altars but to a visitor not formally enrolled st peter's speaks less of aspiration than a full and convenient assurance the soul infinitely expands there if one will but all on its quite human level it marvels at the reach of our dreams and the immensity of our resources to be so impressed and put in our place we say is to be sufficiently saved we can't be more than the heaven itself and what specifically celestial beauty such a show or such a substitute may lack it makes up for in certainty and tangibility and yet if one's hours on the scene are not actually spent in praying the spirit seeks it again as for the finer comfort for the blessing exactly of its example its protection and its exclusion when you are weary of the swarming democracy of your fellow tourists of the unremunerative aspects of human nature on corso and pincho of the oppressively frequent combination of coronets on carriage panels and stupid faces in carriages of addled brains and lacquered boots of ruin and dirt and decay of priests and beggars and takers of advantage of the myriad tokens of a halting civilization the image of the great temple depresses the balance of your doubts seems to rise above even the highest tide of vulgarity and make you still believe in the heroic will and the heroic act it's a relief in other words to feel that there's nothing but a cab fare between your pessimism and one of the greatest of human achievements this might serve as a lenten peroration to these remarks of mine which have strayed so woefully from the jovial text save that i ought fairly to confess that my last impression of the carnival was altogether carnivalesque the merry making of shrove tuesday had life and felicity the dead letter of tradition broke out into nature and grace i pocketed my scepticism and spent a long afternoon on the corso almost every one was a masker but you had no need to conform the pelting rain of confetti effectually disguised you 
I can't say that I found it all very exhilarating, but here and there I noticed a brighter episode. A capering clown inflamed with contagious jollity. Some finer humorist forming a circle every thirty yards to crow at his indefatigable sallies. One clever performer so especially pleased me that I should have been glad to catch a glimpse of the natural man. You imagined for him that he was taking a prodigious intellectual holiday, and that his gaiety was an inverse ratio to his daily mood. Dressed as a needy scholar in an ancient evening coat and a rusty black hat and gloves fantastically patched, he carried a little volume carefully under his arm. His humours were in excellent taste, his whole manner the perfection of genteel comedy. The crowd seemed to relish him vastly, and he at once commanded a gleefully attentive audience. Many of his sallies I lost, those I caught were excellent. His trick was often to begin by taking someone urbanely and caressingly by the chin and complimenting him on the intelligenza della sua physiognomia. I kept near him as long as I could, for he struck me as a real ironic artist, cherishing a disinterested and at the same time a motivated and a moral passion for the grotesque. I should have liked, however, if indeed I shouldn't have feared, to see him the next morning, or when he was unmasked that night, over his hard-earned supper in a smoky trattoria. As the evening went on, the crowd thickened and became a motley press of shouting, pushing, scrambling, everything but squabbling, revellers. The rain of missiles ceased at dusk, but the universal deposits of chalk and flour was trampled into a cloud made lurid, by flaring pyramids of the gas lamps that replaced for the occasion the stingy Roman luminaries. Early in the evening came off the classic exhibition of the Moccoletti, which I but half saw, like a languid reporter resigned beforehand to be cashiered for want of enterprise. From the mouth of a side street over a thousand heads, I caught a huge, slow-moving, illuminated car from which blue lights and rockets and Roman candles were in course of discharge, meeting all in a dim, voluginous glare far above the housetops. It was like a glimpse of some public orgy in ancient Babylon. In the small hours of the morning, walking homeward from a private entertainment, I found Ash Wednesday still kept at bay. The corso, flaring with light, smelt like a circus. Everyone was taking friendly liberties with everyone else, and using up the dregs of his festive energy in convulsive hootings and gymnastics. Here and there certain indefatigable spirits, clad all in red, after the manner of devils, and leaping furiously about with torches, were supposed to affright you. But they shared the universal geniality, and bequeathed me no midnight fears as a pretext for keeping Lent. The Carnevale dei Preti, as I read in that profanely radical sheet, the Capitale. Of this, too, I have been having glimpses. Going lately into Santa Francesca Romana, the picturesque church near the Temple of Peace, I found a feast for the eyes. A dim, crimson-toned light through curtained windows. A great festoon of tapers round the altar. A bulging girdle of lamps before the sunken shrine beneath. And a dozen white-robed Dominicans scattered in the happiest composition on the pavement. It was better than the Moccoletti. 1873 End of section 15. Section 16 of Italian Hours by Henry James. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 1873. Roman Rides, Part 1. I shall always remember the first I took out of the Porta del Popolo 
to where the Ponte Molle, whose single arch sustains a weight of historic tradition, compels the Sallow Tiber to flow between its four great-mannered ecclesiastical statues over the crest of the hill and along the old posting road to Florence. It was mild midwinter, the season peculiarly of colour on the Roman Campagna, and the light was full of that mellow purple glow, that tempered intensity which haunts the after-visions of those who have known Rome, like the memory of some supremely irresponsible pleasure. An hour away I pulled up, and at the edge of a meadow gazed away for some time into remoter distances. Then and there it seemed to me I measured the deep delight of knowing the Campagna. But I saw more things in it than I can easily tell. The country rolled away around me into the slopes and dells of long-drawn grace, chequered with purple and blue and blooming brown. The lights and shadows were at play on the Sabine Mountains, an alternation of tones so exquisite as to be conveyed only by some fantastic comparison to sapphire and amber. In the foreground, a contadino in his cloak and peaked hat jogged solitary on his ass. And here and there in the distance, among blue undulations, some white village, some grey tower, helped deliciously to make the picture the typical Italian landscape of old-fashioned art. It was so bright, and yet so sad, so still, and yet so charged to the super-sensuous ear with the murmur of an extinguished life that you could only say it was intensely and adorably strange. You could only impute to the whole overarched scene an unsurpassed secret for bringing tears of appreciation to no matter how ignorant, archaeologically ignorant, eyes. To ride once in these conditions is, of course, to ride again, and to allot to the Campania a generous share of the time one spends in Rome. It is a pleasure that doubles one's horizon, and one can scarcely say whether it enlarges or limits one's impression of the city proper. It certainly makes St. Peter's seem a trifle smaller, and blunts the edge of one's curiosity in the forum. It must be the effect of the experience at all extended that when you think of Rome afterwards, you will think still respectfully and regretfully enough of the Vatican and the Pincho, the streets and the picture-making street life, but will even more wonder with an irrepressible contraction of the heart when again you shall feel yourself bounding over the flower-smothered turf or pass from one framed picture to another beside the open arches of the crumbling aqueducts. You look back at the city so often from some grassy hilltop, hugely compact within its walls, with St. Peter's overtopping all things, and yet seeming small, and the vast girdle of marsh and meadow receding on all sides to the mountains and the sea, that you come to remember it at last, as hardly more than a respectable parenthesis in a great sweep of generalisation. Within the walls, on the other hand, you think of your intended ride as the most romantic of all your possibilities of the Campania generally as an illimitable experience. One's rides certainly give Rome an inordinate scope for the reflective, by which I suppose I mean, after all, the aesthetic and the esoteric life. To dwell in a city which, much as you grumble at it, is, after all, very fairly a modern city, with crowds and shops and theatres and cafes and balls and receptions and dinner parties and all the modern confusion of social pleasures and pains. To have at your door the good and evil of it all, and yet 
to be able in half an hour to gallop away and leave it a hundred miles a hundred years behind and to look at the tufted broom glowing on a lonely tower top in the still blue air and the pale pink asphodels trembling none the less for the stillness and the shaggy-legged shepherds leaning on their sticks emotionless brotherhood with the heaps of ruin and the scrambling goats and staggering little kids treading out wild desert smells from the top of hollow-sounding mounds and then to come back through one of the great gates and a couple of hours later find yourself in the world dressed introduced entertained inquiring talking about middlemarch to a young english lady or listening to neapolitan songs from a gentleman in a very low-cut shirt all this is to lead in a manner a double life and to gather from the hurrying hours more impressions than a mind of modest capacity quite knows how to dispose of i touched lately upon this theme with a friend who i fancied would understand me and who immediately assured me that he had just spent a day that this mingled diversity of sensation made to the days one spends elsewhere what an uncommonly good novel may be to the daily paper there was an air of idleness about it if you will he said and it was certainly pleasant enough to have been wrong perhaps being after all unused to long stretches of dissipation this was why i had a half feeling that i was reading an odd chapter in the history of a person very much more of a héros de roman than myself then he proceeded to relate how he had taken a long ride with a lady whom he extremely admired we turned off from the tor di quinto road to that castellated farmhouse you know of once a ghibelline fortress with the claude lorrain used to come to paint pictures of which the surrounding landscape is still so artistically so compositionally suggestive we went into the inner court a cloister almost with the carven capitals of its loggia columns and looked at a handsome child swinging shyly against the half-open door of a room whose impenetrable shadow behind her made her as it were a sketch in bituminous watercolours we talked with the farmer a handsome pale fever-tainted fellow with a well-to-do air that didn't in the least deter his affability from a turn compatible with the acceptance of a small coin and then we galloped away and away over the meadows which stretch with hardly a break to vey the day was strangely delicious with a cool grey sky and just a touch of moisture in the air stirred by our rapid motion the campagna in the colourless even light was more solemn and romantic than ever and a ragged shepherd driving a meagre straggling flock whom we stopped to ask our way of was a perfect type of pastoral weather-beaten misery he was precisely the shepherd of the foreground of a scratchy etching there were faint odours of spring in the air and the grass here and there was streaked with great patches of daisies but it was spring with a foreknowledge of autumn a day to be enjoyed with a substrain of sadness the foreboding of regret a day somehow to make one feel as if one had seen and felt a great deal quite as i say like a héros de roman touching such characters it was the illustrious poem i think who on being asked if he rode replied that he left those violent exercises to the ladies but under such a sky and such an air over acres of daisied turf a long long gallop is certainly a super subtle joy the elastic bound of your horse is the poetry of motion and if you are so happy as to add to it not only the prose of companionship 
riding comes almost to affect you as a spiritual exercise. My gallop, at any rate, said my friend, threw me into a mood which gave an extraordinary zest to the rest of the day. He was to go to a dinner party at a villa on the edge of Rome, and Madame X, who was also going, called for him in her carriage. It was a long drive, he went on through the Forum, past the Colosseum. She told me a long story about a most interesting person. Towards the end, my eyes caught through the carriage window a slab of rugged sculptures. We were passing under the arch of Constantine. In the hall pavement of the villa is a rare antique mosaic, one of the largest and most perfect. The ladies on their way to the drawing-room trail over it the flounces of worth. We drove home late, and there's my day. On your exit from most of the gates of Rome, you have generally half an hour's progress through winding lanes, many of which are hardly less charming than the open meadows. On foot, the walls and high hedges would vex you and spoil your walk. But in the saddle, you generally overtop them to an endless peopling of the minor vision. Yet a Roman wall in the springtime is, for that matter, almost as interesting as anything it conceals. Crumbling grain by grain, coloured and mottled to a hundred tones by sun and storm, with its rugged structure of brick extruding through its coarse complexion of peeling stucco, its creeping lacework of wandering ivy starred with miniature violets, and its wild fringe of starter flowers against the sky, it is as little as possible a blank partition. It is practically a luxury of landscape. At the moment at which I write, in mid-April, all the ledges and cornices are wreathed with flaming poppies, nodding here and there as if they knew so well that faded greys and yellows are an offset to their scarlet. But the best point in a dilapidated enclosing surface of vineyard or villa is, of course, the gateway, lifting its great arch of cheap rococo scrollwork its balls and shields and mossy dish-covers, as they always perversely figure to me, and flanked with its dusky cypresses, I never pass one without taking up my mental sketch-book and jotting it down as a vignette in the insubstantial record of my ride. They are as sad and dreary as if they led to the moated grange where Mariano waited in desperation for something to happen. And it's easy to take the usual inscription over the porch as a recommendation to those who enter to renounce all hope of anything but a glass of more or less agreeably acrid vino romano. For what you chiefly see over the walls and at the end of the straight short avenue of rusty cypresses are the appurtenances of a vigna, a couple of acres of little upright sticks blackening in the sun, and a vast, sallow-faced, scantily-windowed mansion whose expression denotes little of the life of the mind, beyond what goes to the driving of a hard bargain over the tasted hogsheads. If Mariana is there, she certainly has no pile of old magazines to beguile her leisure, the life of the mind, if the term be in any application here not ridiculous, appears to any asker of curious questions as he wanders about Rome, the very thinnest deposit of the past. Within the Rococo gateway, which itself has a vaguely aesthetic self-consciousness at the end of the Cypress Walk, you will probably see a mythological group in rusty marble, a Cupid and a Psyche, a Venus and Paris, an Apollo and Daphne. The relic of an age when a Roman proprietor thought it fine to patronise the arts. But I imagine you are safe in supposing it to constitute the only 
illusion savouring of culture that has been made on the premises for three or four generations. There is a franker cheerfulness, though certainly a proper amount of that forlornness which lurks about every object to which the Campania forms a background in the primitive little taverns where, on the homeward stretch in the waning light, you are often glad to rein up and demand a bottle of their best. Their best and their worst are indeed the same, though with the shifting price, and plain vino bianco or vino rosso, rarely both, is the sole article of refreshment in which they deal. There is a ragged bush over the door, and within, under a dusky bolt, on crooked cobblestones, sit half a dozen contadini in their indigo jackets and goatskin breeches, and with their elbows on the table. There is generally a rabble of infantile beggars at the door, pretty enough in their dusty rags with their fine eyes and intense Italian smile, to make you forget your private vow of doing your individual best to make these people whom you like so much unlearn their old vices. Was Porta Pia bombarded three years ago that Peppino should still grow up to wine for a copper? But the Italian shells had no direct message for Peppino's stomach, and you are going to a dinner party at a villa. So Peppino points an instant for the copper in the dust, and grows up a Roman beggar. The whole little place represents the most primitive form of hostelry, but along any of the roads leading out of the city you may find establishments of a higher type, with Garibaldi superbly mounted and foreshortened, painted on the wall, or a lady in a low-necked dress opening a fictive lattice with irresistible hospitality, and a yard with the classic vine-wreathed arbour casting thin shadows upon benches and tables, draped and cushioned with the white dust from which the highways from the gates borrow most of their local colour. Nonetheless, I say, you avoid the high roads, and if you are a person of taste, don't grumble at the occasional need of following the walls of the city. City walls, to a properly constituted American, can never be an object of indifference. And it is emphatically no end of a sensation to pace in the shadow of this massive cincture of Rome. I have found myself, as I skirted its base, talking of trivial things, but never without a sudden reflection on the deplorable impermanence of first impressions. A twelve month ago, the raw plank fences of a Boston suburb, inscribed with the virtues of healing drugs, bristled along my horizon. Now I glance with idle eyes at a compacted antiquity in which a more learned sense may read portentous dates and signs. Servius, Aurelius, Honorius. But even to idle eyes, the prodigious, the continuous thing bristles with eloquent passages. In some places where the huge brickwork is black with time and certain strange square towers look down at you with still blue eyes, the Roman sky peering through lidless loopholes, and there is nothing but white dust in the road and solitude in the air, I might take myself for a wandering Tartar touching on the confines of the celestial empire. The wall of China must have very much such a gaunt robustness. The colour of the Roman ramparts is everywhere fine, and their rugged patchwork has been subdued by time and weather into a mellow harmony that the brush only asks to catch up. On the northern side of the city, behind the Vatican, St. Peter's and the Trastevere, I have seen them glowing in the late afternoon with the tones of ancient bronze and rusty gold. Here, at various points, they are embossed with the papal insignia, the tiara with its flying bands and crossed keys, to the high style of which the grace that attaches to almost any lost cause 
even if not quite the tender grace of a day that is dead, considerably adds a style. With the dome of St. Peter's resting on their corners, and the hugely clustered architecture of the Vatican rising from them as from a terrace, they seem indeed the ballad bulwark of an ecclesiastical city. Vain bulwark, alas, sighs the sentimental tourist, fresh from the meagre entertainments of this latter Holy Week. But he may find monumental consolation in this neighbourhood at a source where, as I pass, I never fail to apply for it. At half an hour's walk beyond Porta San Pancrazio, beneath the wall of the Villa Doria, is a delightfully pompous ecclesiastical gateway of the 17th century, erected by Paul V to commemorate his restoration of the aqueducts through which the stream bearing his name flows towards the fine florid portico protecting its clear sheeted outgush on the crest of the geniculum. It arches across the road in the most ornamental manner of the period, and one can hardly pause before it without seeming to assist at a ten minutes revival of old Italy, without feeling as if one were in a cocked hat and sword, and were coming up to Rome in another mood than Luther's, with a letter of recommendation to the mistress of a cardinal. End of section 16